A Christmas Miracle for the Hopeless Rancher Written by Etta Foster and published by Starfall Publications Book from Historical Western Romance Series Save more with our ebook and audiobook bundles on our website starfallpublicationsbooks.com Subscribe for more audiobooks. Enjoy. Chapter 1 She closed her eyes to listen carefully. Pressed with her back against the wall, Louise quieted her breathing and tried to concentrate. Time was running out. Her parents' bedroom door was still closed down the hall. It was early in the morning, so no one was out of bed yet except for herself and the newspaper boys. Her heart skipped a beat as she heard the thud of paper hitting the front door. She was opening it a second later to pull the newspaper inside. A thrill ran up her spine, making her hands shake as she knelt on the floor after closing the front door and unfolded the newspaper. Her eyes poured over the fresh ink, inhaling the sweet scent. Louise desperately grabbed at the opportunity to read the news. It wouldn't last long. Any minute her family would be waking up. The newspaper had arrived three minutes later than expected. That meant less than three minutes for her to have with the newspaper to read it. She glanced up and down the hall just to make sure she was still alone. No one else was up yet. Louise beamed down at the paper and began to scan the articles. She didn't have time to read everything, of course, so she had to see what might interest her. It was hard to choose a particular article, however. With so much happening out in the world, there were horse races and strikes about horse races. Then there was politics and garden parties and wedding announcements. Her eyes scanned the pages hungrily, soaking it all in. The world was so big outside her house and she wanted to know everything. She studied the recent events, considered the ads, and was about to move on when one caught her eye, an ad for a mail-order bride. It wasn't something she was very familiar with. Before she could start diving into the details, however, she heard a sneeze. Not just any type of sneeze, either. It was her father, the man had the loudest sneeze on the East Coast. Though the family couldn't prove it, the neighbors agreed. No matter who had the loudest sneeze, the sound meant that her father was awake and on his feet. Her heart jumped in her throat. There wasn't enough time to read through the rest of the page. Fumbling with the paper, an idea came to mind. She didn't have time to second guess as she pulled the page completely free from the newspaper. A handle fumbled with the doorknob from down the hall. Louise held her breath as she hurriedly folded the paper back up, as though it had never been touched. It was a little wrinkled from her handling of it, but it couldn't be helped. She scrunched her nose and stood up, tucking the page she had stolen quietly under her skirts. Louise? She hiccuped as she looked up. Her father was rubbing his shoulder as he eyed her blearily. Taking a step back, she hoped he didn't notice how close she stood by the newspaper. Morning, father, she managed. No other words came to mind. She worried that if she opened her mouth again that she would confess to her actions. After all, she had never been a good liar. His sleepy eyes roamed over her face and the door from down the hall. Her heartbeat began to slow down in the hopes that he hadn't noticed anything. But then his gaze dropped down onto the newspaper, and she held her breath. It was just the newspaper, an innocent folded paper. What are you doing awake this early? he asked with a frown. I was... Just looking, I was at the door. I thought I heard, she stammered anxiously, rubbing her hands together. Only just, you see, I, the door. He dropped his hands, along with the sleepy haze across his brow. You mean you were just waiting at the door to look at the newspaper, again? 
His voice grew harder with every word. Louise blinked. Oh, I don't, I... Taking a step forward, he glared at her. Louise, if I told you once, then I told you a hundred times. He continued walking toward her. Louise hurried back against the wall as he grabbed the paper by her feet. Then he swung it in her face, making her flinch. This isn't for you. The news is not important to a woman. Girls shouldn't concern themselves in the affairs of the world. It doesn't matter, you understand. But I'm in the world. Louise mustered up the little strength she had as her voice quivered. I can read, Father. I should know. His glare stopped her short. I'm your father, and I know what's best for you. As long as you're under my roof, this isn't for you. Now get back to your room, would you? You grab the newspaper one more time, and I'll give you the tanning of your life. Louise hiccuped and swallowed. Yes, f father. When he didn't move, she realized he was waiting for her to do something. She licked her lips anxiously, knowing there was still a piece of paper tucked haphazardly in her skirts. If she moved the wrong way, then it might fall out. Sucking in a deep breath, she tried to stiffen her body and skirted around her father one step at a time. She kept her eyes down, trying not to make him more upset. Carefully and quietly, she backed up into the kitchen and around the corner to her bedroom. Almost free, she told herself. She was almost free. She just needed to get alone and set the paper down. What are you doing? Louise jumped, whirling around to see her younger sister sitting up in her bed. Lorelei's soft brown hair was up and down and all over her face, both curly and straight. It was a mess and only one of the girl's eyes was cracked open. Sorry, Louise offered a sheepish smile. I didn't mean to wake you. Go back to sleep. It's still early. The girl didn't need another invitation. She fell back into her pillows and tugged the blanket over her head. Louise stood there at the door, one hand still on the doorknob, as she waited for the familiar sound of her sister's soft snore to escape the blankets. After another deep breath, she heard it. Silence. She was alone. It took Louise another minute to find the courage to move again. Her father was a good man, though he had old ideas she didn't believe in, but it was his home and his family. She had to obey him, somewhat. But he wasn't in her room now. She took another deep breath and then scampered over to her bed. Only once she was under the covers did Louise dare tug at her skirts and find the paper she'd hidden away. It was a little wrinkled, and a corner was ripped, but it was still readable. A smile slipped into her face, and she couldn't help it. Words were her favorite treat. She would steal away as much of them as she could. After all, her father would want nothing to do with the ads. Louise wasn't certain she wanted them either. She scanned the words hungrily before turning back down to the section that had caught her attention earlier. Bride, bride, bride. She hiccuped when she found the section. Louise clamped a hand over her mouth as she looked it over. Wiggling deeper under the covers, she wrinkled her nose and concentrated on the words. There was a man a man looking for a wife to join him on his ranch in Oklahoma, out west where there weren't many people or much to do, but a wide-open land to build a life in. His wife didn't need a lot of talents or skills being there, beyond the basics. The main thing was that he wanted an educated wife in the hopes of having something in common. She didn't know why, but Louise couldn't stop staring at the ad. Her heart pounded in her chest. It felt like music in her ears, in a way that she couldn't dream of putting into words, like the words were dancing off the pages to a tune only she understood. It distracted her all morning, 
even when Lorelei woke up for good and their mother beckoned them to prepare their morning meal. The paper was left beneath her pillow as she cooked, ate, cleaned, and swept the house. All throughout her morning chores, Louise considered the ad and what she could do with it. By nightfall, the anticipation was too much. The idea of escaping into a new world sounded too good to be true, but there was a burning sensation in her heart that told her she had to try. Louise found a paper scrap folded in the family Bible, unused, and a pencil on her father's desk. It took her all day to find time alone. After supper, she finally made it back to her bed, curled up under her blankets, and breathlessly pulled out her paper and pencil. To Richard Hansen, she scribbled out slowly, your ad for a bride caught my eye. I hope you don't mind my forwardness in writing to you. While I have never been on a ranch or to Oklahoma, my life in Boston has taught me many skills, including cooking, cleaning, hosting, and reading. I would like to consider myself educated, but that is an ability I am not certain I could ever mark complete. There is always something new to learn. There was a knock at the door and she froze. Yes? Another soft knock. Louise? Her mother's voice drifted into the room. What are you doing in there? Are you all right? We were going to take our evening stroll. It was a good thing she had pulled the covers up over her head. Louise inhaled deeply with her eyes closed. And then she opened her eyes. I'm just... I'm only... I'm... No, I... I don't feel well. Her mouth turned dry as she tried to lie. I think I'll stay in bed for the night. The door creaked open. A mother never likes to hear that, dear. What's wrong? Is it your stomach? Uh-huh. Louise clasped her mouth shut. So a hiccup couldn't escape her. She swallowed hard and stared at the pencil. My, um, stomach. That's all. I'll, you know, could get to sleep now. She held her breath anxiously, hoping her mother would believe her. There was rustling by the door. Louise made a face, hearing footsteps crawl closer to her bed. Her body stiffened when a familiar hand touched her ankle. I know your father can be harsh, her mother whispered softly, but he means well. Remember that, dear. Remember there is always a tomorrow. Louise didn't move until she heard the swish of her mother's skirts sweep through the doorway and a door closed. She gasped as she tugged the blanket off from over her head and looked behind her to confirm that she was alone in her room. Her mother had known it was a lie, she realized, but not why she had said the lie. Glancing at the paper, Louise inhaled deeply as she turned back to the door. She could feel her heart thudding loudly in her chest. An inkling of guilt settled into her shoulders. She had lied to her mother, and for what? She turned back to the letter she was writing, a letter to a stranger whom she had never met in a faraway land. It was an odd idea, and if she ever told her parents, she knew they wouldn't approve. A knot formed in her stomach. For a minute, Louise was prepared to set the paper aside. She could go out and join her family for their Thursday evening walk down the street. Forget this ever happened. Burn the paper letter and the ad, put the pencil back, and pretend things were normal. Louise glanced down at the paper, brushing her fingers through her hair. Who is to say this Richard will even respond? She sighed but she still held the pencil in her fingers. She stared at it for a minute before she decided to take it as a sign. She had to finish this letter. It had to be sent. And even if that didn't end up going anywhere, then at least she could say she had tried. Something was telling her to get this done. She could feel it inside her heart. Let's finish this, Mr. Hanson. Louise smiled to herself and went back to writing the letter. 
Chapter 2 There was nothing quite like the fresh air on the plains of Oklahoma. It was tender with fragrant earth, the scent of cattle on the wind. While they didn't make for the sweetest smell, Richard knew, they made for a rich one, in more ways than one. He fixed his hat's brim as he looked down into the open valley. There was something about seeing all that land ahead of him that filled his heart to the brim. It was a world on its own. While he understood that he owned the property, that his family owned it, there was something wild to the land that no one could put a bridle on. It was wild and untamed. Richard didn't want to make it his own. There was no such thing. He knew that. He just wanted to live in it, thrive beside it. The wilderness called to him, and he wanted to listen. His eyes skirted the valley, watching the change in colors. The green was dying out as the harvest had arrived in full swing. In the far-off distance, there were mountain tops covered in snow. The winds were growing colder every day. October had arrived, and though he loved the turn of the year, there was something that sat uncomfortably on his shoulders. Another set of holidays were around the corner. It would just be him and Jacob, his brother again. Their parents had passed away a few years ago, and they didn't have any other family. For a while, that hadn't bothered him. Years had passed, and they'd worked well together. They had farm hands for a couple of months every year when the going got tough, but they'd just sold most of their herd to Nebraska, so they had a light load for the winter. That meant less work on his hands, fewer distractions. Richard could feel himself growing antsy again. It kept bothering him. Shaking his head, he took a step back towards the path, and another, then another. He turned back to the house with too many thoughts in his head. He had just stepped through the back door when his brother glanced up from where he'd been cutting potatoes. Jacob nodded to him, swinging his long dark hair out of his face. Where have you been? his brother asked. Richard shrugged, pulling out a glass for water. Walking, our cattle are looking a little lazy. We should probably drive them to the other side of the river before the first snow. Nodding slowly, Jacob agreed. Sounds good to me. We can take care of that tomorrow. Saturday, Richard shook his head. I'm going into town tomorrow. Why? His brother asked him with a shrug. Is there another barn raising? I told the Toulsons they should have put theirs up months ago. The man muttered something under his breath. The cold weather did nothing for his brother's mood. Richard drained his glass while rolling his eyes, but he decided not to say anything about that grumpy nature. I'm looking for some mail, and I'm hoping the post office will have it. Jacob straightened up, his gray eyes narrowing on him. Mail, huh? Looking for some more letters from ladies answering your ads? Heat started to climb up his neck. It was hard enough to accept his actions and the motivation that had driven him to commit such an uncomfortable act. But he hadn't yet thought of anything to explain any of this to his brother. The two of them were close, though they didn't see eye to eye on everything like they had when they were young boys. Richard glanced at his brother and bit his lip. How did you know? That question made Jacob scoff. How could I not, he said. Don't be ridiculous. It's just the two of us here in this big old house of yours. Gesturing with the knife, he shrugged. There aren't any secrets here. No house is big enough for that. Oh, Richard scratched his head and turned to the sink setting his glass there. Well, I was waiting to tell you when someone, when there was someone, I didn't want to rush anything. Jacob just shook his head and tossed another potato into the bowl. The man didn't care for a lot of things anymore. He didn't care for church, for a lot of talk, 
or for fine meals. Though Richard had tried to speak to him on a few things, nothing had worked yet, which was why Richard hadn't said anything about his ad. Whatever you want, Jacob grumbled, it's your life. But I'm going to tell you now, the only woman wanting to get married through ads is going to be old and ugly and desperate. With a sigh, Richard decided it was time he fed the goats. Thanks, Jacob. And he walked back outside. Life had been hard for them for a long time. Oklahoma was a beautiful wilderness, but she demanded time and attention, especially when both their father and their mother passed away nearly 10 years ago. The epidemic had killed half the folks in their town. He had just turned 17 the day he and his brother buried their parents under the apple tree they had loved so much. The West made for a hard life, and the ranch made for a busy one. Months could pass them by before they ever made it to town, and then they were running busy for years before he remembered how nice it would be to settle down with a pretty woman. He had looked around town, and even the surrounding counties during his business trips. But there were few women his age who weren't married by that point, and he couldn't even remember how to talk to them. However, he had made a discovery after a conversation with a pastor in town who had told him about the recent evolution of mail-order brides. The newspapers and magazines helped people to communicate from far-off towns and regions. This included women in cities looking for another way to live and men who lived in the middle of nowhere with limited connections. He would take what he could get. It had taken him a week to gather the courage to write something out, and then he made it into town. A month had passed since his short ad had been placed, a month in which he had been traveling five miles to town every couple of days in the hope of receiving a reply. Richard couldn't remember ever being so antsy in his entire life. The following morning, he fixed a broken stake in the goat's yard and then prepared his horse before heading out. Jacob had tended to the cows in their barn, or so he assumed. They didn't pass each other all morning. Sometimes Richard wondered if that was on purpose, but there was no reason for it, he reminded himself. He shook his head. He was thinking too much into their relationship. Come on, Richard nudged his horse with his knees. Let's get to town, shall we? He fixed the hat on his head before gripping the reins tightly. Right this way, boy. Richard made his rounds to the general store and haberdashery for supplies, biding his time before gathering the courage to visit the postmaster in his office. Mr. Darnell was a nice man, certainly, but Richard was nervous about any news the man might give him. He wasn't sure if he would prefer no letters or one letter or several letters. That made him more nervous. He didn't want a lot of letters. All he needed was one woman, one good woman he could carry a conversation with. That's it. As the sun started its descent, he knew he couldn't keep wasting daylight. There were still his duties to finish on the farm, and he didn't want to be out working in the twilight when he could be settled down by the fire sharpening his knife or reading a good book. Let's get this over with. Richard patted his horse's rump and made his way down the street. He nodded to a few familiar faces. There was Mrs. Price and her two daughters, married off to the blacksmith and the mayor's son. She was a widow much too old for him, but the three of them used to bring him and his brother meals on occasion after they lost their parents. For Mr. Price had passed away as well, Coming out of the post office was Mrs. O'Leary, the mayor's wife. She winked at him as he went in. The woman was only a few years older than himself, having married the mayor after her family passed away, and the mayor had lost his wife. The epidemic had hurt too many families. He nodded and stepped through to find Mr. Darnell shuffling several papers along the back wall. 
Mr. Darnell glanced over his shoulder and waved him inside. I was wondering if I would be seeing you again. Today or tomorrow, I told myself. And I was right. Shaking his head, Richard rubbed his hands together. It's good to see you too, Mr. Darnell. I'm glad I didn't disappoint you. He inhaled sharply. You wouldn't happen to have any letters for me, would you? The older gentleman was already making his way across the room to a row of boxed holes against the wall. He had a filing system that he and his wife had created when they first set up the office. From what Richard knew, that had been nearly 50 years ago. I knew you would be asking me that, the old man chuckled good-heartedly, as though he knew a secret. Richard couldn't help but grin as he trailed after him. Mr. Darnell pulled two letters out of a hole in the wall and wrapped his knuckles twice on the wall before walking forward and handing them over. They both had his name written neatly across the top. Richard swallowed as he accepted them. Offering the older gentleman a smile, he nodded. Thank you. I appreciate it. He was about to leave when he couldn't help but ask, How are you these days, Mr. Darnell? And your wife? Mr. Darnell beamed. Oh, she's still a dear. Her heart is slowing her down, so she's only up and going in the mornings. But my rose is just fine. We both are. And yourself, Richard? How are you and Jacob holding up alone on that ranch of yours? It's the family ranch. Richard corrected him kindly as he fiddled with the documents in his hands. They weren't thick at all, but he could feel them beginning to weigh him down. Jacob and I are good. I should probably get back now, Richard added reluctantly. The man nodded and then said, Don't be a stranger, Richard. Even if you're not waiting on a letter, you're welcome to stop by. Richard tipped his hat to the man and made his way out. He glanced at the two letters and pondered where they might have come from. The idea that one of them, or even both of them, could be from a lady made his stomach tighten. He made himself wait, not wanting to be rude and read out in the middle of the street. Richard mounted his horse and headed on home, whistling as they went. Jacob was bringing a broom back to the house from the barn and raised his eyebrow. You got yourself a letter then? He shook his head with a laugh. I'm telling you, Rich, if she never sends you a likeness, I'm telling you, she's an old, ugly woman. You had best get her to send you a lock of her hair to make sure it's not gray. His hands were too busy opening the letters to make any retort to his brother. Richard found one letter from the Nurlands, who thanked them for the herd that they'd just purchased from them, and then the other letter was addressed to him. It made him nervous, but only when he saw his name. The nerves didn't last long. Before he finished the first line, he was smiling. There was something about the writing that attracted him, and there was a woman's name at the bottom of the letter, confirming his earlier hope. Jacob called to him, but Richard wandered off in search of a pen and paper. His heart warmed at the idea of this sweet woman writing to him, and he could hardly wait to send her a response. Chapter 3 Her forehead pressed gently against the door as she carefully closed it, not wanting to make a sound. It was early afternoon, and she had just started to prepare supper. It was her duty, and there was a lot to get accomplished. But she couldn't wait a minute longer. Louise had bided her time all morning with the newest letter burning a hole in her skirts. She'd had only a moment to jump in the thrill of another letter before having to tuck it away. She set the rest of the family mail on the table in the hall. Then there had been the house to sweep, a rug to mend, and now supper. In the Moreau family home, there was always more work to be done. Though Louise didn't mind the work, she craved the opportunities where there was no work to be done, so she could spend a minute or two reading in the sun. 
that pleasurable hobby of hers was difficult to manage in a busy and distracted home like hers, especially having to hide the books, magazines, and the letters from her father. Louise had grown used to having to wait until nightfall when her sisters were asleep in bed to pull out the newest letter and read it by moonlight. Candlelight, if she was lucky, but it was rare. Except she couldn't wait any longer now. Biting her lip, Louise could hardly pin back the grin as she fumbled through her clothes eagerly to find the letter hidden away in her pocket. It felt like a thin one, which made her nervous. But he did that sometimes, her Mr. Richard Hansen. Neither of them was experienced in the way of writing letters. But over the last couple of weeks, they had become much more accustomed to the practice. Enough that Louise couldn't wait any longer to see what he had written to her. Louise found the letter and hurried towards her bed to sit down and read it. Ow! She paused, not having realized she was so close to her bedpost and had stubbed her toe. Then, as she realized she had yelped out loud, she clapped a hand over her mouth and turned back towards the door. She paused to listen and see if anyone had heard her. But after a moment, she couldn't hear any voices or footsteps. With a loud sigh of relief, Louise giggled despite herself and collapsed onto her bed. It was her favorite place to read, a comfortable little spot that was just below a window so it was always warm and cozy. And then she carefully opened the envelope, not wanting to ruin it with a rip. She stared hard in concentration, inch by inch, until it was open. Louise beamed at her success as she eagerly pulled the letter out. The envelope was set aside on her pillow for safekeeping for the moment. Though she knew she was talking to him about a potential marriage-type relationship, Louise didn't yet see these letters as a courtship. The very idea had made her quite anxious when she started writing to the man. Instead, she felt at the very least that they had become very good friends, and not in the way that she was friends with her sisters, but in the way that he saw her as a person and enjoyed learning about her, just like she loved hearing what he had to say about himself and his ranch. A ranch. An Oklahoma ranch. Louise could picture it perfectly from his descriptions. He talked about the sun rising and falling, about the wheat waving in the fields, the large trees waving lightly in the wind, and the cattle as they made their morning trek to the creek for water. She could almost taste it. She bit her lip as she saw her name scribbled across the top left corner of the page. Then she followed his words taking each of them in with a hunger and fascination that left her hoping for more. Then she found it, something that was beyond satisfactory that caught her so off guard that her mouth opened slightly in surprise. Her heart pounded in disbelief. Louise wondered if it was a joke. She bit her lip again and reread the letter from the beginning wondering if she was imagining things, wondering if his question would disappear if she came back to it. As I have said several times before, it's been a pleasure talking to you through these letters. I would like to have a conversation with you in real life more than anything. Would you feel the same? Christmas is coming, and I was wondering if you might like to spend it here. We can have some time together. You can see the ranch, and we can decide if we want to move forward with this courtship. A flush crept up her cheeks. Perhaps it was a courtship. Or a friendship. Louise hadn't had many of either of those relationships. But whatever she had with Richard Hansen, she was dearly enjoying it. But to visit him? Louise asked the question out loud as she finished reading his letter. She sat up and stared out the window. Her eyes were focused on the view ahead, but her mind was running in another direction. 
The idea of traveling to meet a stranger out west, even for a week, sounded both terrible and exciting. But it would be Richard Hansen, the man who had been writing her all those lovely letters. Louise finally blinked as she glanced down at the paper. She would like to meet him very much. Except how would she tell her family? No one knew she was talking to him. It was hard to imagine her father granting approval for her to do such a thing. Shaking her head, Louise set the letter down and stretched over her bed, lying on her stomach to reach under the bed. Her head hung upside down as she stretched to reach the box. It was a soft blue hat box, used for a hat that no longer fit her head. But it was the perfect size to put other items into it, like her favorite notes and scraps of writing, especially her letters. I'll just put this away, she reasoned to herself in the silence, needing to hear a sensible voice, and think on it. He doesn't need a reply immediately. It's a very serious question he's asking me. A voice piped up from the door. Who's asking you a serious question? Louise was so startled that she dropped the box. Her hair fell in her face and paper spilled everywhere on her lap as she scrambled to pull herself upright. Pushing her hair away, Louise turned to the door where her younger sister was standing. What? Louise tried to play dumb, inwardly panicking, as she tried to think of some way to keep her secret hidden. But Lorelai was a clever girl, even if she was hardly 16. The girl grinned, skipping over to grab the closest piece of paper on the edge of the bed. Louise grabbed three, but she missed that one. Her heart thudded as she realized it was the letter she had set down only moments ago, the newest note from Richard Hansen. That's mine, Louise pointed out as her mouth turned dry. Can, can you please not read it? Her sister ignored her as she hopped onto the bed. Frowning, Louise tugged a letter out from under the girl. You have a boy writing to you? It's a fine name, Richard Hansen, Lorelai commented mildly. He sounds handsome. Louise flushed. That's not yours to read. Give it back, Lorelai. Thank you for watching. Before we continue into the story, do us a favor. Like this video and hit the subscribe button because it helps very much with YouTube's algorithm. Thank you again. Now back to our story. As she reached out, her sister put out a hand as well, right in her face. Louise opened her mouth to shriek, but realized she didn't want more attention. She didn't want their older sister, Luann, to hear, and she especially didn't want her parents to hear. No one was supposed to know about Richard Hansen. Not yet, anyways. Lorelai, give it back, Louise hissed, muffled by her sister's hand. Still clutching letters, she waved an arm in a last-ditch desperate attempt. But from the sound of her sister giggling, it was too late. Then a moment later, Lorelai turned and handed over the letter as she dropped her hand. Louise caught herself on her elbow awkwardly, both sitting and lying down on the bed. She glared at her sister, who beamed back at her. Well, it was a big smile much larger than Louise had expected. It made her heart drop. Don't tell anyone, please, she whispered, as she frantically tried to think of an excuse or a lie. But she wasn't good at telling them, and worse at coming up with them. Louise swallowed. I didn't, it's just, it's not like I'm going anywhere, so it wouldn't hurt to not say anything, and... Lorelai gasped and scooted closer on the bed. Grabbing the spilled letters, Louise gathered them and tried shoving them back into the box as Lorelai stared questioningly at her. You're not going, but he invited you. Why not? Realizing that the pile of letters must be out of order, Louise anxiously pulled them back out and tried to look through them again. Her nerves were frayed. Not only did her sister now know her secret, 
but that meant anyone else could come in through the door and learn it as well. It wasn't safe anymore, and since someone else knew now, it somehow changed the relationship she had been cultivating. Louise couldn't explain it, but it felt different. Richard Hansen felt different. He felt real in a way she couldn't ignore nor deny him. Her cheeks grew redder, and she bit her lip to try and keep it from wobbling. Of course not, Lorelei. I, I only, I know I could never. Tossing her a furrowed brow and pouty lips, Lorelei interrupted. Never what? Never be happy? Never find someone who wants to spend his life with you? You started this, whatever this is, you should follow it through. Lorelei was a practical girl with a dreamy mind. Things never worked out as simply as that, Louise knew, especially in their house. Keeping her eyes focused on the letters, tracking the dates and putting them in order, Louise swallowed the lump in her throat. Then she shook her head. We've only been corresponding for a couple of weeks. I, I found him in an ad. You won't, you won't tell father, will you? The girl scooted closer watching the movement of the letters with avid fascination. Why would I ruin all the fun? Besides, I won't tell anyone if you tell me everything. Then she offered her most cheerful smile. It was also the type of smile that always got her into trouble. And now Louise could sense it would get them both into trouble, but it was too late. She bit her lip and found herself slowly explaining how she had been stealing pages from the newspaper to read them. After her father had caught her sneaking his books into her room at night, she was forbidden from even dusting the man's study room anymore. So she stole the newspapers one page at a time, and she read them, savoring the words, until one voice in the words caught her eye. Richard Hansen owned a ranch in Oklahoma with his brother, Jacob. Richard was friendly, hardworking, lighthearted, and looking for someone to join him in the wilderness. And he had picked her. A flutter ran through her heart every time she said his name out loud. By the time she finished telling her story, Louise was biting her lip again to hold back the sheepish grin. Lorelei clasped her hands up to her chin. That's darling. Shh, Louise winced at her sister's loud voice. I told you, no one else should know. But that hardly convinced Lorelei. The younger girl hopped off the bed and intertwined her fingers again. She was the romantic of their family. Why ever not? Just think of it, Louise. It's the perfect adventure that you've been waiting for all your life. You always wanted something more. That's why you read, isn't it? There's a world out there, and now you have a chance, a chance at something real. Louise clapped the hat box shut, finally containing all the letters. It was supposed to contain her secret, but now her sister owned that as well. She could hardly believe it. For so long, she had been careful. Lorelei wasn't the type of girl to just let things go, and this could mean trouble. Nonsense, Louise said, as she slid the box farther under her bed. You don't understand. This was, it was only a dalliance, Lorelei. I don't think he would really want me there anyway. Me, little Louise Moreau? Before she could reach the door, her sister had the knob. Lorelei was known for her high spirits, but she could also throw a dark look very well. Their parents had taught their daughters well. Louise swallowed, glancing away from her sister's furrowed brow. Don't you say that about yourself, Lorelei charged. You've had your nose in books long enough now. It's time you experience the fairy tale for real. You have your head in the clouds, Louise argued in return. Life isn't a fairy tale. The doorknob turned. She opened her mouth again quickly to beg that her secret remain hidden. 
just as her sister had one more thing to say. You won't know, Lorelei pointed out, if you never seek it out. Write a letter of acceptance and see how you feel. At least try that before you toss him away. Promise me. Louise groaned. Or I'll tell Luann, her sister threatened. Fine. Louise shook her head as she pinched her sister's arm. But don't say anything yet, especially not to our parents. I'll see to the letter and only send it out if I change my mind. I promise she added, when her younger sister gave her the stern look once more. Her words were enough to pacify the feisty girl. Lorelei gave her a wink and scampered off. At last, Louise was alone. She touched the door frame, knowing she needed to follow down the hall to return to preparing supper for that evening. But her eyes turned back towards her bed where the letters lay hidden and she wondered if her sister could be right. Chapter 4 Don't forget the squash, Richard called with a grin. His brother glanced over his shoulder with a scowl, not appreciating the joke. They had been attempting to grow yellow squash for the last four years with no luck. From testing different seasons and locations, to dirt, feed, protection, and everything else they could think of, nothing worked. Nothing, that is, until they'd had three skinny little yellow squash begin to grow in the corner of their little garden. The three vegetables were nearly ready to pluck when Jacob had forgotten to tie his horse to the stake before stepping inside for a quick drink. His animal had promptly trodden over to the garden and eaten the squash. All three of them and nothing else. Richard didn't harbor ill will towards the animal, nor his brother. Incidents were prone to happen, seeing as no human was perfect. He knew Jacob hadn't meant to let his horse wander, and he knew the horse hadn't deliberately gone after those squash to ruin their hopes of enjoying their homegrown vegetables. Life was a happy accident. That's how their parents used to put it. Yet Jacob had been in a bad mood all that day, and apparently jokes were not going to improve the man's mindset. Richard shrugged it off as Jacob turned around without another word and headed down the lane. They didn't take too many trips to town together lately. It was comforting though they didn't say it out loud, to have someone always at home watching over their property. Both of them had been raised as independent young men when their parents were alive. As he finished tying his horse to the post before him, Richard could still hear his father's voice reminding him that someday he'd have to make hard decisions and be in charge of his own life. It had happened a little sooner than anyone had expected, he knew. There were things his parents hadn't had time to teach him or his brother. Small things like fixing a wagon wheel and growing squash and how to talk to pretty ladies. But they had figured those tasks out. More or less, Richard chuckled to himself about that. It was one of the earliest lessons he could remember learning, back when he was helping his father teach Jacob how to first ride a horse. He couldn't have been more than five, for they had started many things young. When Jacob fell over from fiddling with the stirrup, Richard had giggled. His little brother had climbed up angrily with his hands and fists and his chubby cheeks all red and dusty before chasing after him to make him stop. Their father had grabbed the two of them in his arms. Life does some crazy things to us the man had reminded them gravely. We all get some hard moments and some happy accidents. They can be the same thing if we let them. It had taken Richard a few years to understand what their father had meant. But he had learned that when he ran a nail through his side after falling off a ladder at 10, and he learned that when he bought his first horse, who wasn't as broken in as he'd been informed. Life was made of happy little accidents, 
and he was just fine with it. Jacob, on the other hand, struggled. But there was only so much Richard could do about his brother's attitude, though he supposed he could probably tease the young man a little less. He was still grinning to himself, rubbing his hands together as he walked down the road to the post office. Mr. Darnell beamed when he walked through the door. You have impeccable timing, young man. Richard's heart skipped a beat. I have a letter? The man chuckled as he invited him over with a nod. You certainly do. Come in here for a moment, Richard. The wind is picking up out there. Nodding, he tugged off his hat and noticed it was damp from the earlier rain. I can smell the moisture in the air. We'll have snow within days, I'm thinking. Are you and your wife going to fare all right this winter? Mr. Darnell waved a hand in the air. Rose and I will be just fine. You know how we old folks can be. That's why I asked, Richard chuckled. He watched the man carefully as he reached the counter, frowning slightly as he noticed a limp. Is your knee acting up again? The man gave him a fatherly frown as he grabbed an envelope from off a shelf. It's acting up, sure, but that doesn't mean a thing. My knee always buckles in the cold. I've lived a long time, and I'll live a little longer with it. You had better, Richard nodded in concern. But that's not going to stop me from talking to a few friends, to make sure you two are safe during any bad weather. Anything could happen, he added before the man could protest. I just want to make sure the two of you keep safe and warm. Do you have enough firewood? I do, Mr. Darnell assured him. We haven't even touched the bundle you brought over last month. But thank you for your concern. Now, do you want your letter or do you want to keep parenting me? The man's small huff made Richard grin. It took all his strength not to at least chuckle. There were a few older folks in town who had settled the land before he had ever been born, and they were all the same, proud, headstrong, and too stubborn to believe they would ever be any weaker than they were in their prime. Not that he would call any one of them weak. They had some of the biggest hearts and souls he had ever known. Yet it didn't keep him from worrying about their limps and aches and pains. There was only so much that he could do for them, and he wanted to make sure he did all he could. So he put on the humble expression Mr. Darnell was looking for and nodded. He stretched out his hand and said, Yes, sir, I would very much like that letter of mine. Good, Mr. Darnell gave a hard nod. No need to worry about us here. We're just fine. Now enjoy that letter of yours, and I expect to see you again soon to send your response. Richard winked before opening the door to leave. Thank you, Mr. Darnell. Stay warm. He was still smiling as he made his way back to his horse, grinning at the older man's stubborn ways. It made him wonder for a moment if he would ever act like that. Old age still felt a lifetime away but he was getting older every day. His thirties weren't far away and out west. Every year was a milestone. It wasn't an easy place to live. And he heard from people who traveled in and out of Oklahoma. They spoke of lands with gold and lands with all sorts of wild animals. They talked about oceans and mountains there was a world all around them just waiting to be explored. The world was certainly a glorious place. No matter where one went, there was a lot to see and embrace. And Richard liked that, especially his own yard. That ranch was a world of its own. His parents had worked their hardest to build it up, having bought it as newlyweds off a couple who had nothing else and needed to move back east for their health. His father had talked about that story a lot, how they had an obligation not just to themselves, but to that couple as well to make the ranch succeed. And for future generations as well, Richard thought. 
Richard's stomach clenched as he slowed down his stroll to glance down at the letter he carried in both hands. It always brought such a rush to see his name scrawled out like that. After spending weeks of writing to the woman, he could recognize Miss Louise Moreau's handwriting in a heartbeat. Not wanting to be discourteous, he had hardly glanced at it while speaking to the postmaster. Then he didn't want to ruin the joy of reading a letter while he walked, so he wanted to make it back to his horse before opening it. Besides, he was much more nervous about this particular letter than all the rest. He could feel it in his arms, a tingle in his fingers. It danced on his head and spine to a jig as he worked up the courage to open it. Maybe she said no, maybe she said yes. Though Richard tried to tell himself that it didn't matter whatever she had decided to do, he already knew what he was hoping for. He just worried that he wasn't going to be that lucky. He took a deep breath and paced around the horse and the wagon for a couple of minutes as he thought about it. In the letter wrapped safely inside the envelope, Louise was telling him whether or not she would meet him, if she was willing to come out to visit and see him. She would see him, his face and his hands and his clothes. She would see the ranch, the garden, and the horses. She would see the large house that hadn't had a woman's touch in years. And she would see planes that went on for days outside the house windows. There was a lot she would see but Richard didn't know if she would like any of it. Realizing he was only driving himself crazy, Richard grunted and pulled out the letter. He couldn't keep tossing out his thoughts, at least not until he knew what she had decided. Another letter? Jacob came up to him and tossed two bags of oats into the cart. How long are you planning to write the old woman? Richard's eyes ran over the page again in disbelief. It was one of her shorter letters, but he didn't mind. It was the content written in ink that mattered most to him, not the amount of it. He inhaled deeply, stunned at her reply. She wanted to come. Louise had agreed to come visit him. Just one more, Richard turned to his brother with a grin. She's coming out here to see me. She's really coming, Jacob. Have you got any change? His brother took a step back. I do. Why do you want the money? Richard put out a hand. I told her I'd pay for her travels here. Hand it over, would you? I only need a couple of dollars. But Jacob scoffed. Shaking his head, Jacob fiddled with the wallet in disbelief. Dollars? Why would you pay for her passage? Why is she even coming out here? Don't be a fool about this, Rich. I'm not. I know what I'm doing. Do you? You're a fool sending money to someone you've never met. Mark my words, she isn't going to come out here. She'll just take your money and move on to someone else. Maybe she's not a fat, ugly old woman, but she has got to be a thief. Frowning, Richard took a step toward his brother. Something stiffened in his shoulders, not liking that tone. A small wall of tension gathered around them. That kind of language wasn't necessary. He put out his hand again. I'm not asking for your opinion. Now hand it over. You're being a fool, Jacob groaned, but he tossed the wallet over. Running a hand through his hair, he continued. You're going to regret this. Richard caught the wallet in the air, tucking it away before Jacob could change his mind. Then he smiled and reached out, nudging his brother. The best way to get rid of tension, after all, was simply to make it go away. Thank you for your opinion. He tried to soften the atmosphere with a light-hearted tone. But you need to have a little more faith. She'll come. Trust me. Richard glanced around. I'll only take a minute to send my letter out. If there are more bags, then I'll come back and help. His brother sighed loudly as though in annoyance. Fine. But he didn't really mean the attitude. Richard knew he couldn't. He offered a wink and turned around back to see the postmaster. 
Jacob would most likely be in a better mood when they got back on the road and were headed home. They didn't usually travel this late in the day. Perhaps they wouldn't do that again. But it had been perfect timing, and Richard couldn't deny that. He found himself whistling on his stroll as he carried the letter in one hand and the wallet in the other. Good things were coming to them. He could feel it in the cold, crisp air. Chapter 5 A week after Louise had gathered the courage to send her letter of acceptance, Richard Hansen had sent his final letter. The letter contained funds for a train ride out to Oklahoma. That next afternoon, Louise had gone out on errands for the family, and she had dropped by the station to purchase herself a ticket. Glancing across the supper table, she caught her younger sister Lorelei raising an eyebrow. After making sure neither of her parents was paying attention, she gave a short nod of confirmation and turned back to her green beans. She had purchased a ticket to go west. The very idea sent a shiver down her spine. She could hardly believe it. December had reached the family before she knew what had happened, and she was about to spend the week before Christmas with the man she had been writing to for a few months now. It nearly felt scandalous. Her cheeks blushed at the very idea of meeting him. He sounded so hopeful, so curious, so eager for life that it took all her restraint not to write ten-page letters every time. There was so much she wanted to ask him, so much that she wanted to say. Any hesitation she had earlier about meeting him had faded away with the soaring hope of having a real conversation with him. Even in her prayers, she felt a spark of hope. She prayed nightly for Richard and his health, and a warmth would settle over her shoulders. It didn't matter what he looked like, she had decided long ago, for she knew his heart. That was what mattered. Silver clattering onto the table caught her attention. It caught everyone's attention. Everyone turned to Lorelei, who sat on one side of the table by herself. She smiled innocently at everyone, picked up her fork, and returned to her carrots. But then Lorelei gave Louise a pointed look before brushing a strand of dark hair from her face. It took Louise a moment to understand the raised eyebrow. The girl was wondering when she was leaving. She shifted in her seat uncomfortably and glanced around to make sure no one was paying attention. Biting her lip, she glanced down at her crowded plate. There was so much going on inside her mind now that she could hardly make herself eat. Three days, she mouthed silently before pausing to take a sip of water. The conversation had been silent so far, an easily manageable skill between the girls since their childhood. Supper was usually run quietly in the Moreau household unless they spoke of the Sunday sermon or had other important news to share. But after Louise mouthed the timetable, her sister couldn't help herself. You're leaving in three days? Lorelei's green eyes widened as she gasped aloud. Their older sister and mother jumped at the loud tone. Louise's heart clutched as she froze, her cup just before her lips, as she shot a glance at her father. He paused, in the midst of chewing his beef for a moment, only a moment, and then continued eating. But his posture had stiffened as he straightened up and glanced between the two girls tension built around the table as they waited for the inevitable. Louise glared at her younger sister, but by then it was too late, and everyone else had their eyes on her. Where are you going in three days? Her father asked her. I, I don't know what, what she's talking about, Louise stammered anxiously. Her mind moved as quickly as a train as she tried to think. While she knew she would have to tell her parents and announce her choice, she was still working on how she wanted to present the news. 
It would be accomplished best in the evening when everyone was settled and her parents were relaxed. Not in the middle of supper like this, ransacking her brain to remember her proposal and argument in defense of her actions, Louise felt panic clutch her throat. She couldn't recall a single word. Why was she going to meet a stranger in Oklahoma? Why did she think that was a good idea? Louise set the cup down, her cheeks turning pale. Mr. Moreau, head of the family, slowly put his fork down. That was never a good sign. Lorelei winced in the corner of Louise's eye, but it was too late to take it back. Three days away is Monday, he said as he pulled out his napkin to wipe his hands. Where are you going, Louise? She swallowed and licked her lips. I, I'm only, Oklahoma, she's going to Oklahoma. Lorelei, Louise whipped her head around and glared at the girl. Stop it but her sister gave her a hopeful smile and nod, like she thought she was helping. As the youngest, Lorelai was able to charm her parents into almost anything, but that didn't provide any guarantees, and especially not for Louise. A lump formed in her throat as she chanced a panicked glance at her mother, who probably wouldn't say anything, and then turned back to her father. The man was staring at her. It made her glad she was sitting, otherwise her knees would be knocking. He wasn't going to be happy that she was making choices on her own like this. She knew that. She had just hoped to find a way to work around it. Why do you think you're going to Oklahoma? And pray tell, how did you expect to travel there? She's visiting Mr. Hanson, Lorelai supplied helpfully. He's a very kind man. Louise threw her sister a stern look, but the girl couldn't seem to understand. As her parents started at that announcement, Louise knew the jig was up. No more secrets. Her heart hammered loudly now in her chest as she tried to find the right words. A man? Her older sister Luann butted in with a scoff. You're not courting anyone. Trying to catch her breath, Louise fiddled with her fork and plate. I, I am, I mean almost. Well, sort of, he's a good man. Richard, he owns a ranch in Oklahoma and he's invited me to visit him. Where did you meet him? Her mother asked her incredulously. When did this happen? But her father cut over her loudly. That won't be happening. Turning between her parents, who sat on either side of the table, Louise desperately tried to rein in the conversation before it got out of hand, even though it already felt like she was losing. No, I mean, yes, I am. She tried to say it bravely. I have a ticket. I've started to pack. It's only for a week or so. We've been writing for a long time, and, and it's what I want. That doesn't matter. Mr. Moreau said dismissively, you're not going. Her tongue felt heavy as she desperately looked around the table for support. Louise caught her mother's gaze as the woman hesitated, glancing between her husband and middle daughter. I don't know, her mother started slowly. I think it might be good for her to get out of the house. It's the holidays and she's been doing so well. It could be a treat for her. Her support for the idea shocked everyone at the table. Louise could feel herself glowing in delight. But before she could thank her mother, hands slapped on the table as the head of the family stood up and glared at them. The man was furious. He scowled as his face turned red. We don't know who this man is. And when have you been writing to this man? I never said that you could do such a thing. I don't need your permission for everything, Louise found herself saying before she could help herself. And I told you, he's a good man. He paid for my ticket and I won't waste his money. If we get along well, then we will be getting married. I, I'm telling you, and I'm not asking. She didn't know where the courage had come from to say such a thing, but it surprised everyone. They stared at her in amazement. 
Her father shook his head. Married? You're just a child. Louise, you don't know what you're talking about. I married at her age, her mother reminded them, in a soft voice, nearly a whisper. But she sounded assured and kept her head up. Timothy, think about this. In the uncomfortable silence, Luann dropped her silverware forcefully on the table as she crossed her arms. Are you seriously considering this? Louise can't do this. I'm the eldest, and I'm still not married. I should be first. Why would Louise get to do anything before myself? You didn't write him, Lorelai pointed out. Louise found him in the ads looking for a mail-order bride. Thank you, Lorelai, Louise said through gritted teeth. But you're not exactly helping me here. She turned to her father and tried to smile hopefully. Father, please, you know how careful I am. Wouldn't it be good to have me out of the house for a few days? Think about it. I'm of marriageable age. Two of my school friends already have children. I needed to meet a man somehow, her older sister groaned. But what about me? I should be first. Age doesn't necessitate much their mother pointed out carefully, and then gave her husband a pointed look. Age doesn't imply wisdom nor goodness in every influenced decision. Timothy, I think this could be an excellent idea. We've talked about this. He snapped before she could finish the words. Not like this. Of course we will get our daughters married off. But when the time is right and, and in the manner that we choose, it's a changing world, Louise begged them. It's not like it was for you. There's the entire West to consider. Father, I want to go. Even if I don't end up marrying him, it would be good for me, and you know it. She didn't know such a thing, but she hoped it would do the trick. For a moment, it appeared to work. The man grunted angrily as he dropped his gaze to the table he was still leaning on. He wasn't happy about it, and everyone could see that. Louise felt her heart beating furiously in her chest as she held her breath and waited for his next words. Everything depended on his approval, after all. He led their family. He had to know then, she told herself, that she had to do this. She'll go no matter what you say, Lorelai added softly. Louise closed her eyes for a moment before giving the girl yet another look. Her words weren't helping no matter what she said. Though she loved her family, her sisters could both be exasperating. Giving their father an ultimatum was never a smart choice. She sent up another quick prayer, begging the Lord that he might see reason. He kept talking about how the home was too crowded with his growing girls. It really was time they were all married. Surely, he had to understand how important this was to her and how good it could be for her. He had to see reason. They all listened as the only man in the room inhaled deeply and then slowly let it out. Then he straightened up and gave them all a serious look. His brow furrowed and his mustache only made his frown deeper. Fine, you may go, but Luann will go with you as a chaperone. Louise's heart began to soar at his first statement, unable to believe he would agree. Her mouth turned dry as she opened her lips to thank him, and then she realized what else he had said and turned to her sister in horror. Luann wore the same look, the two girls stared at each other, unable to believe what had just happened. Louise scrambled around her brain for ideas and protests, but she couldn't find one. She already knew her father would have a defense for anything she tried to say. Once he made a decision, it was final. And she had already made her decision. She was determined to find her way to Oklahoma to meet Richard Hansen once and for all. No one was going to stop her, not even if she had to drag her older sister with her. It wasn't what she had hoped, Louise knew, 
and there would be frustration and misery between her and her sister. One way or another, she was going to meet Richard Hansen in Oklahoma. Chapter 6 Hello, Mr. Hansen. Louise Moreau had the sweetest accent Richard had ever heard. Southern Louisiana had brought him a nightingale. She offered him a shy smile and put her hand out. Richard cleared his throat and kissed her knuckles lightly, proud to see a light blush spread across her cheeks. Her eyes never left his as he slowly let go of her hand. It's a pleasure to finally meet you, Richard announced. And please, call me Richard. Then you must call me Louise. Grinning, he could feel the thumping in his heart as he studied the young lady, though she had mentioned her looks so that he would know whom he was picking up, there was much she hadn't said. The dimples, for example. There were two big ones on either side of her face. She had a small smattering of freckles across her nose and blue eyes with some green in them. Her eyelashes were long and dark, though her hair was a few shades lighter. The young woman had a heart-shaped face and couldn't be much prettier than she already was. Then someone cleared their throat, pulling him from his thoughts. Both of them glanced over to where someone else stood. A young woman with blonde hair put her hands on her hips as she tossed him a stern look. No, he realized, it wasn't to him. It was to Louise. Louise Moreau turned back to him. I must apologize for this last-minute arrangement. I hope you don't mind, but my family thought it best that I not travel alone. My older sister, Luann, accompanied me as my chaperone. It was strange enough news that Richard took a small step back in surprise, but he forced himself to quickly adjust. That made sense. He and his brother had a housekeeper, but that was all. If anyone thought false thoughts, then her reputation could be compromised. Of course, she shouldn't have come alone. He felt sheepish for having expected that in the first place. He nodded. Right, yes, she is more than welcome. Luann, you said. When she murmured an affirmative, he followed after her to the young lady. As he drew closer, Richard could see the similarities. Luann's hair was a lighter yellow and her nose was sharper, with a thinner figure that reminded him slightly of a hawk. With the two women standing side by side, they could be nothing less than sisters. Louise looked softer while she stood by her sister. She wore a faint smile, though her brows were creased like she was still apologizing for the unexpected arrival. Either way, Richard resolved, they would enjoy their festivities. It was winter, and Oklahoma was beautiful with the snow. He wanted to make their time together as joyful as possible. Putting on a grin, he waved. Luann, it's a pleasure to meet you. I'm Richard Hansen. Welcome to Oklahoma. The young woman attempted a smile, but it looked sourer than anything. As she wrapped her jacket around herself, she glanced around. Is it always this cold? He shrugged, fiddling with his gloves. I suppose it is in the winter. I've lived here all my life, so I'm afraid I don't know what it's like elsewhere. I have some blankets in the wagon. Are you two ready to go? Louise nodded, throwing her sister a glance. We certainly are. Before they could grab their bags, Richard took them right this way. As he led them, he was warm to find Louise, keeping in step with him and not behind him. They smiled at each other before turning back to the path. It was a busy lane in town, so most of the snow had melted. That made their walk easier as they reached his wagon and climbed in. Louise burrowed her hands under the blanket as she sat beside him on the driver's bench. There was a second blanket but he had immediately handed that over to Luann, who sat in the back with their bags. Do you want this blanket? 
Louise frowned in concern. The wind is chilly. With both hands on the reins, he glanced over. Thank you, he smiled again. But I want you to be warm. I'll be fine. It doesn't grow this cold in Louisiana. She shook her head. I don't think so, especially with this wind. You know, I can't have you growing ill now that I've come here for some time. Louise pointed this out as she unfurled the blanket and spread part of it across his lap. There, she announced with a proud smile. We'll both keep warm. His heart certainly couldn't feel any warmer. Richard grinned back. Thank you. Are we nearly to the house? Luann hollered, breaking his concentration. Louise glanced back and turned to him. When he shook his head, she told her sister, We still have some time, Luann. Won't you sit back and enjoy the ride? We've never been so far from home. This wasn't my idea, Luann complained. And it's freezing. My coat won't keep me warm enough. This is awful. Though he kept his hands on the reins, Richard glanced at the unhappy young woman. Then he turned to Louise, whose smile looked more like a painful wince. I'm terribly sorry, she managed. It wasn't either of our preferences for her to accompany me. I'm hopeful she will adjust. But in the meantime, please ignore my sister. Richard wasn't certain how to respond. He didn't want to add insult to injury for either of them. Changing the subject, he started to point out the views. It's so beautiful, Louise murmured in an awed tone when they finally reached his house. Why, it's so big and charming, it feels like a Christmas dream. He glanced down after slowing down. It does, doesn't it? You're quite the jolly gift then. Richard didn't know what compelled him to say such a silly thing, and he opened his mouth to apologize. But she laughed, touching his arm before tucking her hands under the blanket. You're too kind, Richard. Just as he opened his mouth again, he heard a shout. There was Mrs. Pennyworth, waving from the porch. Welcome, the housekeeper called. Come in, come in. Pulling up nearby, he stopped the wagon. I'll help you out, Richard explained. We'll have to be careful. I shoveled the snow off the path, but it's still easy to fall. He climbed down and made his way around to Louise. She was complacent sitting there as she studied the house. The young lady was biting her lip. Then she shivered. Richard put out his hands to her. You should wrap the blanket around yourself and not keep it folded in your lap, he pointed out. I was too distracted looking at your lovely house, she explained teasingly. Help me down first, and then I shall do just that. She put her arms out to him, settling them on his shoulders when he grabbed her around the waist and set her down. She had a small waist, warm, and he let go reluctantly. Louise let out a breathy sigh as she tactfully wrapped the blanket around her shoulders. See? She showed off with a warm grin. He could have sworn her eyes were twinkling. Now I'm as cozy as can be. Mrs. Pennyworth reached them. Welcome. You must be Louise Morrow. Oh, what a dear. You are welcome, most welcome indeed. Richard, what are you doing? We'll freeze out here. You don't have to tell me twice, Luann chimed in. Remembering the other young woman, Richard turned to help her out of the wagon, but Luann had already climbed down, one hand gripping the wagon for balance. She glanced between everyone. Well, are we going inside or not? Luann asked pointedly. Mrs. Pennyworth's eyes widened, but she recovered more quickly than Richard thought he had earlier. Welcome, dear. And who might you be? This is my sister, Louise said hurriedly. My apologies for not preparing anyone in advance. It was a last-minute change of travel plans. Mrs. Pennyworth, this is my older sister, Luann Moreau. It's a pleasure to meet you. I've heard wonderful things about you from Richard. 
that made the older woman beam. Oh, you're too kind. Now then, let's step inside before we freeze. I have a toasty fire going and tea waiting for us. Richard, take care of the poor horses already. They don't deserve being left here unattended. Of course not, Richard nodded. Mrs. Pennyworth was in her element, fussing over more than two men who didn't want to be babied. Louise glanced at him curiously, and he shrugged as his housekeeper led the women away from him and towards the house. He set the women's bags down inside and then took the horses to the barn. The wagon was untethered, and he fed them before brushing them down. Richard worked quickly so he could return to Louise. He was just finishing up when his brother arrived, carrying a few horseshoes. Back already, Jacob shot him a crooked smirk. She was bald, wasn't she? Richard glanced up, trying not to get irritated. It was only a joke, he told himself. She's got the prettiest hair in all of Oklahoma. Please call her Louise, he added. Be kind to her, would you? And her sister, Luann. His brother sighed loudly. Great. More strangers for the holidays. Richard stepped out of the stall with a stern look. I mean it, Jacob. Come up and meet them, would you? Though he muttered something under his breath, Jacob followed him up the trail leading to the large house. Richard fixed his jacket as they stepped inside, hoping he looked decent as he found all three women sitting in the parlor chatting away. Ladies, he grinned. This is my younger brother, Jacob. He glanced back at the man who was studying their guests. Jacob, this is Louise and Luann. Jacob tipped his hat off. Then, before Richard could stop him, his brother took the open space beside Louise on the couch. It's delightful to meet you at last, Jacob announced to Louise. Louise nodded. Thank you, she offered politely. It's good to meet you as well. I've heard kind things about you. Luann, this is Jacob. He owns the ranch alongside Richard. Isn't that impressive? The other blonde curled her hair around a finger as she smiled. It was the first smile Richard had seen from Luann. It certainly is. Hello, Jacob. After watching the three of them talk, Richard realized that the other young lady was rather taken with Jacob, as she should be, for he was a fine-looking young man and could be cheerful when he decided to be. Richard hoped that would be enough for his brother to keep his attention on the sister, then instead of Louise. Chapter 7 They were pretty girls, young enough that he hesitated to call them women. Jacob scratched his knee as he looked at the two of them though his brother probably wanted him to sit far off in the chair across the room. He didn't want to do that. There were pretty girls to look at. Besides, he liked annoying Richard. His brother deserved it. He was too cocky for his own good, moving forward with ideas he had no business making happen. Jacob was surprised that Miss Moreau had come to the house at all. He had felt certain that she would be old or frail. Maybe she was dumb. How was your journey? He forced himself to ask politely. He hadn't meant to take a seat to join them. Even though he liked a toasty fire as much as the next person, there was work to get done. Richard was always leaving something unfinished behind, after all. He had left for town without finishing the horseshoes. Those had been needing to get done for two months. A horse could lose its shoe any day after all, and it paid to be prepared. It was a cold day. There hadn't been any fresh snow for two days, but the chill hadn't left. If anything, it had only gotten worse. He could practically taste ice in the sky. They were in for a cold night, and that meant extra work needed to be done. Their garden needed to be covered up, all of the horses needed to be put in the barn, and he wanted the sheep to move to the next pasture 
Jacob could already feel in his bones that Richard wasn't going to remember any of that. Most likely, he'd forget about everything now that there were girls in the house. That hadn't happened in a long time. Mrs. Pennyworth didn't count. When Richard had invited him to come to the house to meet them, Jacob had grudgingly given in. He would have to meet them eventually. If they were ugly, he would have the opportunity to laugh at his brother. If they were pretty, maybe it would soften the winter. And boy, did those pretty green eyes soften everything. They were greener than grass on a May morning, greener than any frog he'd ever seen jumping in the creek as a boy. He assuredly wasn't any kind of poet, but if he was, Jacob knew he would write about those green eyes, green and bright and sweet, especially when they crinkled up in a smile. Louise Moreau smiled at him, and Jacob could hardly believe his luck. How had his brother managed to find a beautiful woman? She had just passed the verge of being a young girl to becoming a woman. That much was clear in the curves of her body. Sitting up straight, Louise had a way of cocking her head to listen that he found himself immediately taking a liking to. Jacob racked his brain as he wondered how it was possible for Richard to have found her. Had she truly been the one who had been writing to him for the last couple of months? Certainly, she had a bow back home waiting for her to finish with this joke. Or perhaps she had wanted a real man and not a pansy in town. Considering his brother, however, he decided she had picked the wrong Hanson. Richard had the ranch, the good graces of town, and everything else. As the older son, he had been the golden boy who could do no wrong. Their parents had given him the first of everything. And that had meant the best of everything. In turn, Jacob had received the leftovers. He received the used clothes, the older horse, the dirty toys, and offhand compliments. Even 20 years later, he could remember the first time he was able to make a hoop fly down the lane. Jacob had spent days trying. He had a drive and goal, just looking for an opportunity to make his parents proud of him. After several tries, after insisting his mother join him outside just for a short while, he had made it happen. The hoop had made it down the lane without tipping over. He had shouted for joy, waving his arms in excitement. When he turned to see her proud smile, he had nearly toppled over to find his mother clapping with her back to him. Richard had come out of the small grove of trees to show the single orange he had found for her. She had been so happy that she clapped for Richard. She laughed and she clapped, but not for Jacob. What was it about Richard that made everyone want to dote on him more? Jacob shot a glance at his brother in frustration. Though his brother wasn't ugly, he wasn't the most handsome fellow. His nose was too long and his hair was always in his face. Everyone still wanted to give him the best of everything, like the horse. He couldn't forget the horse. How could he? Jacob saw that horse every day. It was a silver Appaloosa with a star on the forehead. Not only was he beautiful, the animal was fast. When his parents had brought the creature to their ranch only a week before his birthday, he had been certain they were gifting the animal to him, except that they didn't. Instead, they gave the horse over to Richard, and they gave Richard's ten-year-old horse to him. That very horse still sat out in the barn, only ever ridden by Richard. When he was given the animal, his brother proclaimed that no one else would ever ride the horse but him, and that decree so far had come true. He could feel the itch in his hands again to jump on that animal and defy his brother. Just once, Jacob thought, just to see what happened. Richard acted kind enough. What would he do to his own brother? 
no one had ever wanted to fight him. But Jacob, he had been in several fights growing up. He was the wrestling champion in their town. No one could beat him. Yet he could never find the courage to fight his brother. And he hated it. Jacob swallowed in his dry throat as he turned back to Louise. She was explaining the weather down in Louisiana. Then the girl's sister, Luann, looked at him and grinned. It was a decent smile, and she had the same green eyes. But there was something sharper about the older girl that threw Jacob off and made him uncomfortable, especially when she batted her eyes at him. It was like she was trying to cry. Her actions made no sense, and it only annoyed him. If he could gather the nerve to steal something away from his brother, now was the perfect time to lure Louise away. Sitting beside her had been the right move. But after that, Jacob wasn't certain. He scowled down at the table as he tried to think. And Jacob? He glanced up to Louise, who was still smiling. What have you been up to today? He hadn't smiled in a long time. But now, Jacob found a way to tug the corners of his lips upward and hoped for the best. I worked, of course. A ranch like this requires a lot of work. We hire cowboys often, but it's slow for us now during the winter. There were horseshoes to take care of and the like. Glancing at his brother, he wondered if the other man had caught wind of the dig. But he hadn't. Richard looked as happy as he ever did. When his brother opened his mouth to speak up, Jacob cut him off. You're in for a treat tonight. There should be snow coming in soon. If we're lucky, it'll be bright and early in the morning. Maybe we can go for a ride then. Luann peeked over her sister's head again. That sounds lovely, she offered. As she played with her fingers in her hair, she suddenly stiffened and started tugging at the long blonde strands. They look like they were in a knot. If it's not too cold, Louise nodded slowly. I think that would be nice. Richard jumped in. Riding would be best. Then I could show you around the ranch. There's not much, but I think you'd like it. You spoke of it often, Louise beamed. Her eyes had left Jacob to focus on Richard. A ride sounds like a marvelous idea. You can use a blanket better when you're on a saddle rather than walking. Richard grinned. To Jacob's dismay, Louise giggled. But if you want to walk, Luann cleared her throat as she tugged her hand out of her hair and placed it on her lap. I'll join you, Jacob. Richard had their parents' attention, the Appaloosa and the ranch. Jacob was tired of waiting for something good to come his way. Whatever he could do, he vowed, he would aim to make Louise his own instead. Just as he opened his mouth to focus on Louise again and not Luann, Mrs. Pennyworth jumped in. The woman cleared her throat loudly and stood up. She didn't like being left out. You two ladies must be exhausted, she clapped her hands. Let us get you both settled in your room, shall we? That way both of you can rest up before supper tonight. And gentlemen, I'm sure there are still other responsibilities you should be tending to before the sun sets. Richard glanced at him, but Jacob didn't return the look. Of course there was work to do. There was always more work to accomplish on a ranch. If Richard didn't spend hours poring over letters or bringing back strange, beautiful women to the house, then he would know about the work. The women stood up. Thank you, Louise commended Mrs. Pennyworth. We would be very grateful to you for any assistance. If you can direct us to the rooms, we can get ourselves situated. I would hate for us to be a bother. Mrs. Pennyworth chuckled. You couldn't possibly be a bother. This way now, down the North Hall. Let's find the room and clean up the second Jacob grudgingly climbed to his feet as the three women disappeared. He listened to them chatter and wondered if he might grow annoyed by the sound of incessant talk soon. 
He liked the quiet. Frustrated that the day was not going his way, Jacob shook his head and started for the door. He could hear Richard following behind him, but for once, Jacob wanted to take the lead. He swung the door open to the cold and stepped out. Chapter 8 When Louise woke up in bed, she slowly began to remember where she was. Oklahoma, Richard Hansen, she said the words out loud. They tasted strange on her tongue, even as she smiled. The more she woke up, the more the thrill of being somewhere new grew. It had kept her awake and jittery during the train journey, and now she felt ready to face the day. She sat up and glanced around. It was a quaint little room with a few simple pieces of furniture. There were faded curtains at the window and only a small gathering of dust in the corners. When Mrs. Pennyworth had presented the two rooms, she had fretted about cleaning the second that had not been prepared. But Louise felt terrible for bringing an unexpected guest. With Luann out of sorts from traveling, she had agreed to take the smaller of the two rooms. I can clean it myself, she had offered. I don't mind. Cleaning helps me to settle my thoughts. The housekeeper had reluctantly turned over a duster. It was strange, the idea of a housekeeper. Louise remembered spending a few minutes in bed, trying to imagine having grown up with one like the Hanson men had. Certainly, in running a ranch, they needed all the help they could get. To share the house with someone who wasn't family left a silly knot in her stomach. But then she laughed. She had just spent the previous night in a house with people who were not her family. Shaking her head, Louise decided it was time to climb out of bed. She sorted through her bags to get dressed and cleaned up. Louise wanted to put a little more effort into her outfit since she had the time to look her best. Humming, she straightened the wrinkles in her dress and stepped out of her room. Only then did she realize she must have risen much too early. The hallway was still dark. A sheepish grin spread to her face. She was so used to rising first thing in the morning to read the paper that it was still a habit. Louise glanced at the room where her sister slept. For a moment, she considered waking Luann, but recalling how grumpy her sister could be, she decided against that idea. A small thump sounded down the other direction of the hall. It came from the kitchen. When she rounded the corner, she found Mrs. Pennyworth humming quietly to herself as she built a fire. Before there was time to even open her mouth, the housekeeper had turned around. Good morning, Mrs. Pennyworth chimed softly. Another early riser. Louise couldn't help but return the woman's smile. I'm glad I'm not alone then. Can I help you? Shaking her head, Mrs. Pennyworth gestured to a chair. You can go ahead and rest there if you like. But Louise wasn't the type of person to be waited on hand and foot. As long as she had limbs, her parents had told her she could do something. Louise straightened her shoulders and ignored Mrs. Pennyworth's invitation as she grabbed the poker to check on the flames. What shall we make this morning? she asked as the woman gave her a studious look. Perhaps it was a test, Louise pondered. Then she wondered if she had passed. Being in a new place like this made her think of her days back in the schoolhouse where she was always seeking to learn something new. Working at home for the last couple of years hadn't done much for her education, however, and she realized she craved the opportunity to stretch herself, her skills, her talents, her interests. If only someone would give her a chance. Mrs. Pennyworth handed her a pot. Porridge will be sufficient, the woman announced. You know all about porridge, yes? That made Louise chuckle. From every angle and every temperature, ma'am, my mother taught me everything she knows, bless her heart. I'd be a fool not to put the knowledge to use. 
Mrs. Pennyworth smiled at her. You already proved your knowledge last night at the supper table. You'll have to teach me about those recipes you mention. Does your sister like to cook as well? She added. Getting situated on a small stool, Louise hesitated. I'm afraid I don't know well. Luann is a tough book to read. She likes having something to do, but her favorite activity is to complain. Ah, Mrs. Pennyworth nodded knowingly as she said, I never had brothers or sisters myself, but I've raised these boys long enough to know when something is bothering them. When she's ready to talk, then she'll talk. I hope so, she mused. What of the brothers? Are Richard and Jacob always on their best behavior? It was meant to be a joke, but when Mrs. Pennyworth inhaled loudly, Louise paused in concern. They are boys. The housekeeper glanced over with a careworn smile. Louise knew the look. It was the expression of a mother caring for her family and doing her best, particularly when they didn't listen, and she knew how futile it was, even while she tried her best. Louise nodded, offering an ear. Yes? With no one to turn to when their parents passed, it made sense that they would turn towards each other, Mrs. Pennyworth articulated gently. However, I'm not certain that it ever happened. They've had a complicated relationship between love and hate. Richard would rather ignore a problem, and Jacob would rather tear it to bits. I want the best for them, of course. I know what good men they can be. When the woman hesitated again, Louise nodded. What is it? she asked. There's something more you want to say. A warning, I presume? The housekeeper paused. You're a smart girl. I would only suggest that you would do well not to get trapped in the middle between them. The last thing to do so was a wagon. Louise glanced at the pot. What happened? We bought a new wagon. Mrs. Pennyworth measured the brown sugar and then brought it over. The two women worked quietly as Louise thought about the woman's warning. It reminded her of the one her mother had given to her before leaving on her journey. Your father isn't a terrible man, her mother had said. Remember that, for everyone has more than one side. You have your passion, your words, and your brain. We're all different. No one stays the same. Louise hadn't thought it sounded much like a warning then. But looking back, she realized that her mother's tone had been more serious before softening, so the woman could give her one final tight hug, her nose scrunched up at the memory. How had she not noticed? It was then that Louise resolved to be better. Now there she was, working alongside Mrs. Pennyworth, and, hopefully, making a delicious meal. She nodded thoughtfully before turning to the other woman. I have no intention of hurting anyone, she said assuredly. I would never come between the brothers. Mrs. Pennyworth offered a smile, but it looked much grimmer than she had expected. You don't seem like you would try. I'm glad to hear, dear, but I'm worried we might be too late for that. Louise sat and studied Mrs. Pennyworth's features. The housekeeper looked rather concerned, her gray hair frizzy around her temples and her brow furrowed. There was a tight line around her lips, as though she was holding back more words. Louise wondered if she had misunderstood, or perhaps she had misstepped already. She thought back to yesterday with her arrival and tried to consider what she had missed. There had been the introductions. Then she had rested for a few hours. Supper had brought everyone together again, where she had spoken to everyone around the table. Louise had wanted to make everyone feel included, after all. She wasn't certain there had been time to cause any contention. A knock jerked her from her thoughts. Louise found Richard standing in the doorway from the hall. He was wrapping his knuckles against the frame before he dropped his arms when their eyes met. 
Richard grinned at her and gave her a nod. You're up early, he told her. She beamed. As are you. Were you outside? Her eyes caught on his boots that were covered with snow. Nodding, he straightened up. Jacob and I have been up for over an hour. Cows need to be milked and the sheep get antsy. The sun is just rising over the valley. I thought we could go for a morning ride if you're interested. There was something about the news that he woke up early that made her heart light. And then realizing what he was asking made her heart skip another beat. Her trip here was going to send her heart crazy, Louise realized. If this happened every time she talked to Richard, it's so cold outside, Mrs. Pennyworth said in disbelief, as Louise turned to her with a hopeful grin. But it is beautiful, she added with a chuckle. Don't worry, I can handle the rest of this. Louise clasped her hands together as she stood. Are you certain? I hate to leave you. But the housekeeper shook her head and waved a hand towards Richard. Go on, you two. Richard will give you the grand tour, I'm sure. Dress warm, that's all I'm asking, both of you, she added pointedly to the young man. Yes, ma'am, Richard chuckled. Thank you, Louise leaned towards Mrs. Pennyworth. And I appreciate our conversation. I will keep your concerns in mind. The woman took her arm and squeezed it. Don't mind me, I'm just an old woman. Richard adores you and I'm very hopeful. For all I know, I'm only imagining things. Have yourself some fun. There will be tea and coffee when you return. I have an extra scarf you can use, Richard volunteered when Louise turned to him. Don't worry, I won't keep you too long. Jacob is saddling up the second horse now. Louise accepted the scarf as she followed him to the back door. That's kind of him. Did Jacob want to join us? No, Richard shook his head. There are a few projects he wants to work on, but perhaps we can all take a ride this afternoon. We'll see how the day goes. Here, allow me to help you with your coat. Did you want an extra pair of mittens? It took her a few minutes to get bundled up in her winter gear, but soon Louise was packed warmly in her coat and she followed Richard out. The cold hit her like a wall, stealing the breath from her lungs. But it was beautiful. The sun brought colors streaming through the sky, and the snow on the ground shone before them. Louise grinned at the sight before turning to Richard. He gave her a wink and led her off to their adventure. Chapter 9 it was nearly Christmas Eve, and Richard could hardly believe his luck. He had just helped Louise Moreau up onto his Appaloosa horse, and they made a spectacular picture, especially with the pretty young woman wearing his scarf. He stepped back to admire the sight. You look like a natural, he assured her when she bit her lip. Her face flushed. Are you certain it's all right? I haven't ridden a horse in so long, and if he is your own creature, I hate to separate the two of you. A voice rose up from behind him. She's riding your horse? Your most prized possession? Richard turned to see Jacob standing in the doorway with his arms crossed. It was his turn for his face to turn red. Richard knew he had been a little particular as a kid and wanted things a certain way. The horse he named Shakespeare was a special gift from his parents just three years before their passing. He was a thing of beauty, and he took special care of the animal. Like that morning, he had been the one to saddle Shakespeare while his brother had saddled Socks, their older black horse. Yes, Richard shrugged his shoulders and tried not to make a big deal out of it. All he wanted to do was impress a pretty woman. Wasn't that normal? He swallowed the growing knot in his stomach and managed a grin as he continued. Of course, Shakespeare is an excellent horse for a beginner. 
Not wanting to invite more discussion on the topic, Richard climbed onto the other horse, Socks. He tipped his hat to Jacob. We'll return shortly. Mrs. Pennyworth is finishing up porridge if you want to stop inside soon. Perhaps you could see to Luann. It was a pointed question, though he hoped it didn't come off as too strong. But he gave his brother a look to make sure that Jacob understood that he at least considered making friends with the other young woman in the house. It might be nice. Richard had spent the night thinking. If Jacob could turn his thoughts to someone else. Lately, his brother was too serious and wrapped up in his own head. Jacob just shrugged before turning away. We'll see. He was gone before Richard could say anything more. Awkward tension began to grip Richard tightly as he gritted his teeth. He shook his head for a second before remembering he wasn't alone. He managed to find a smile for Louise. Are you ready? She gripped the reins with determination, a serious expression on her face. Yes, I think I can do this. You can, he assured her with a light chuckle to set her at ease. And remember, I'll be beside you the entire time. Let's take a walk around the barn first, just so you're comfortable giving him directions. He'll follow me, but it's good to be ready. Louise inhaled deeply and then gave him another nod. All right, around the barn then. Richard led the way slowly. He didn't want to take his eyes off her, not just because she was pretty, but because he wanted to keep her safe. At least, that's what he told himself. This is nice, Louise nodded as they rounded the final corner. She flashed him a bright smile before turning back to watch the path. And you were right. It's beautiful out here. You can see for miles and miles, Richard. He realized that he liked the way she said his name. Her accent focused on the second part of his name, breathing it out like a sigh. There was something tender about the way she spoke. She could probably say anything she liked, he pondered and it would sound lovely. I'm glad you like it. He glanced down and fixed one of his gloves before looking at her again. She really did look like a fine woman riding that horse of his. He thought of her letters and how she had spent so much time focused on reading because there was so little she was permitted to do. That made him hope that Louise had found the freedom she had been seeking, that she enjoyed her time here. He realized he was already hoping she would want to stay forever. Clearing his throat, he rode up closer to her and pointed towards the path. I thought we could head down that way. Let's take it at an easy trot. And then you can tell me all about the news in Louisiana. How does that sound? Her dimples stood out in the morning light. It sounds marvelous. Richard wasn't certain what had compelled him to include in his ad, that he wanted an educated woman, though he definitely wanted someone he could hold a conversation with. He hadn't been certain anyone would be educated in the manner he was expecting. Besides, why would an educated woman want to live in the middle of nowhere? But they took their ride slow and she spoke confidently. They even touched on Shakespeare and sonnets. The morning began to pass them by as he forgot about the chill in his fingers and toes and nose while he talked with pretty Louise Moreau. Have you never seen snow before your trip here? Richard asked her curiously when they slowed down. Louise couldn't stop looking around. Her eyes darted about as though she was trying to memorize every little detail. Only a few times. My family lives right outside of New Orleans. It's a large city, you see, with ships in port. People come there from all over the world. There's no snow there, though our town most assuredly grows cold in the wintertime. Our mother's mother lived further north in the territory. I remember traveling to visit her when I was young. There was snow on the ground, but my father didn't like us getting dirty so we didn't do much but stand back and admire the view. 
Richard couldn't stop looking at her. And what do you think? Her eyes returned to him as she smiled. I think it's beautiful. You're fortunate to live in the wild like this. There's a, a peace to the world. You can almost hear the silence. That sounds silly, doesn't it? She asked after a second. He shook his head. No, I don't think it does. When she shivered a third time, however, he knew it was time for them to turn back. His stomach growled, for he had yet to break his morning fast. I think I've kept you out here long enough. He smiled sheepishly at her. Richard craned his neck around and pointed. We're hardly a mile out. I think we could move at a quick trot around the river's edge. We should make it back to the house in just a few minutes. How does that sound to you? Her eyes swept over him with a soft look. Her lips curved upward, making his heart skip a beat. At that angle, she looked like a queen on her steed looking over her kingdom. Richard swallowed hard as their eyes met. He wondered if that strange feeling in his stomach would ever go away. That sounds lovely, she proclaimed. But you won't leave me behind if we move too slowly, will you? Teasing her lightly, Richard trotted around her once and then winked at her. Of course not. Besides, Shakespeare there wouldn't dream of letting old socks beat him in any kind of race. Just watch out for the ice. In a minute, we'll be inside next to the fire warming our fingertips. Louise nodded. If you insist. And then she tugged on Shakespeare to invite the horse to start moving again. The animal knew what to do now that they were clearly turning towards home. As they started off, Richard nudged the horse beneath him to follow. A cold wind swept through his hair as he watched after the young lady. He gripped the reins tightly, feeling invincible. But he didn't know that would be the last second he would feel that way for a long time. They had just rounded the final bend with the barn in their sights when Socks stumbled. Richard dropped his gaze from Louise his stomach plummeting as he realized he hadn't been keeping an eye on his horse's path closely enough. He called out in surprise, but when it was clear that Sox was about to tumble, he let go. He was already airborne. Panic gripped his veins. There was no time to react as he felt himself flying. Richard reached out to grasp something, though there was nothing he could touch until he abruptly slammed into something hard. Pain rippled up his body. It was so violent and harsh that Richard was immediately welcomed by darkness. He didn't fight it, as though he knew being awake would be terribly unpleasant. Except the darkness didn't hold him long. When he heard a voice calling to him, Richard couldn't resist reaching out for it. He followed the voice until he opened his eyes and grimaced in pain. Everything hurt. Richard blinked as the world swam before him. He was on the ground. It was solid beneath him. There was snow, enough snow that he felt terribly numb and couldn't remember how to move. Though his scarf had been in his mouth a second ago, it had been moved aside. He lay awkwardly on the hard ground with the sun above him. Richard, Richard, can you hear me? His head swam as he tried to pull himself together. When he blinked, he saw four copies of Louise before him. There were too many eyes watching him. He squeezed his eyes shut and felt a hand touch his cheek. He inhaled sharply, trying to process what had just happened. Louise was still talking to him. He could hear the tremor in her voice, but it still took him a good minute to pull himself together enough to speak. Louise, he managed a minute later. There was a bitter taste on his tongue, but he couldn't figure out why. After all, he hadn't eaten anything that morning. Richard blinked again, and finally, Louise came into focus. She knelt beside him, her hands fluttering over him, 
as she tugged at his clothes as though to keep him warm and make him comfortable. Or she was trying to put him in more pain. Richard wasn't certain. The important problem was that she was frightened. Richard concentrated on that fact and grasped onto the single shred of sanity he could find. He had fallen off his horse, Richard told himself, and he was in pain. But it was only an accident and he would be fine. All he needed to do was get some rest. I'm fine, he tried to tell her. But the words came out tasting strange on his tongue. Fine. Richard looked at Louise to see if she understood. Her eyes widened before she glanced around them. I, I, I'm going to return to the house. We're close to the house, Richard. I'll find Jacob and, and he'll know what to do. Do you understand? I'm not leaving you. I'm coming right back. I, here. He felt his head lifted slightly after she pulled off the scarf and set it below his head for a pillow. Richard tried to thank her, but it came out as a cough. He was still struggling to remember how to breathe. Before he could worry about anything else, the darkness pulled him back in. Chapter 10 Louise hadn't seen the fall, but she had heard the landing. Climbing down off Shakespeare by herself had been terrifying but not as bad as reaching Richard's side to find him in and out of consciousness. And that sound. Though she wasn't certain he had broken anything, she knew it couldn't be good. She could feel the panic tugging at her bones when she knelt down beside him. Tugging her long hair out of the way, she tried to think fast. She had set his legs down at proper angles. She checked his arms for any breaks and then she had tried saying his name. Louise couldn't count how many times she called out Richard's name before he opened his eyes. It took him a minute to adjust, but she could see the pain in his gaze. Her heart went out to him as she tried to think about what to do, but she didn't know much about snow or ice or injuries. Socks had run off, having been spooked, and Shakespeare was standing around unable to tell her what to do. She had come to see the man she had been writing to in case they wanted to continue their relationship. That didn't mean she had come expecting to help him after a terrible fall. A lump formed in her throat when he said her name. Then he tried to say something else, but his tongue wasn't working. It had been garbled speech that faded away, so she had spoken up in the hopes he would hear her. He didn't respond. Instead, his eyes closed, so she was left alone. For a minute, terror had clutched her soul in the certainty he had died. But then he took a ragged breath, and she was able to breathe as well. Louise realized she was holding his arm tightly, so she let go. She had to do something, she told herself. Her gaze reluctantly left Richard as she turned to the house. Jacob would have to help her, help him. Louise thought dimly of what Mrs. Pennyworth had said that morning, but shook it off. Richard was injured, and his brother would most assuredly help him. At the very least, she had to do something. Right. Her voice was shaky, and her legs were shakier as she forced herself to stand. Louise looked around for the horses before running over to Shakespeare. He stood there patiently, nibbling at some grass, peeking out of the nearby pile of snow. She reached for the pommel, only to hesitate. Richard had had to help her into the saddle before, since the horse was so tall. How could she climb onto the saddle herself? She glanced over her shoulder at Richard. The fear turned into a resolve that gave her the energy to boost herself. Louise had to jump to reach the pommel, also putting her other hand over the saddle to pull herself up. Her thick clothes only created a heavy buffer that took several tiresome seconds of wrestling around to pull herself completely into the seat. I can do this, she told herself anxiously. I can do this. We can do this. 
can't we, Shakespeare? Off to the barn, then. But Richard had been right. The horse didn't want to go anywhere without the man who usually rode him. Shakespeare grumbled as he swung his head over towards Richard as though to make a point. I know, Louise said frantically, wondering if she was going crazy for talking to a horse. I'm trying to help him. Don't you want to do the same? He needs help, more help than what I can provide. She said a short prayer in her heart and nudged the horse again. Grudgingly, he turned, obeying her hands on the reins, and they started towards the house. A lump formed in her throat the further they went from Richard. He had to be so cold, praying he wouldn't wake up to find himself alone. She nudged the horse faster. Shakespeare obeyed and took her to a fast trot that led them straight up the hill and over to the barn. They circled it before she managed to direct him towards the front doors. Just before they were about to enter, Jacob stepped out. Having fun, then? he asked as he fiddled with his gloves. The young man had dark hair that sat long against his brow. Though a few years older than herself, there was a crease against his brow that made him an old man and a young child all at once. Louise couldn't explain it, but there wasn't time. Richard fell, she panted breathlessly. Shakespeare pranced nervously under her, as though he could feel the tension in her shoulders. When she tried to point towards Richard, the horse turned so she had to keep correcting herself. Jacob's gaze flickered there and then shrugged. Then he should have been more careful. He knows there's ice. When he turned around, Louise grunted to the horse, who maneuvered his way between Jacob and the barn, but only for a second before they walked in a circle around him, her cheeks flushed in embarrassment. Her thoughts were everywhere as she tried to control the horse, set aside her worry for Richard, and tell Jacob what had happened. I mean it, she pressed, turning her head to try and meet his gaze. Shakespeare kept walking in a circle around Jacob, who crossed his arms at her. He's terribly hurt. There, there's blood, and he couldn't stay awake. He needs you, Jacob. Please, don't you understand? Jacob's gaze narrowed at her. This isn't a joke? No, there was an accident. He fell off the horse. Who, Socks? The young man shook his head. The horse is a good one. Did you even see it happen? Louise couldn't help the flush creeping up her cheeks. No, but I heard it. I heard it, Jacob. Your brother is terribly hurt and he needs your help, please. He's just down the lane. We have to do something. Her words were spat out so fast that she wasn't sure she was making any sense. She tried to control her flooding thoughts, but her heart kept interfering. It was hard not to wonder if Richard would be all right. And if he wasn't, she didn't know what she would do. Though they had been writing letters for months, Though they had enjoyed each other's company since her arrival the other day, they hardly knew each other. Her heart pounded against her ribs, trying to break free. It beat so hard that it hurt. Tears sprang to her eyes, just as she realized Shakespeare was going to keep dancing around Jacob. So she swung a leg over and jumped down, not caring if something happened to her. Jacob grabbed her arm before she could land in the dirt. Careful. You wouldn't want to ruin Richard's prized horse, would you? He pointed out gruffly. She ripped her arm from his grasp with a stern expression. But before she could talk, she rubbed her cheeks with her hands to make sure she hadn't cried. It was so cold out that she could hardly feel a thing on her skin besides the sharp wind. The horse doesn't matter now, she said pointedly. Then she grabbed his jacket and stared him down. I'm telling you, this isn't a joke. Please, you have to help him, carry him or find a cart or something. He's hurt and he needs help right away. His eyes stayed on hers as she talked. When she was done, 
Jacob nodded slowly, as though it was only just then dawning on him. The young man nodded and fixed his gloves before looking around. He grabbed Shakespeare's reins as the horse danced around them. Find Mrs. Pennyworth, he instructed, his voice harder than before. We'll send her to town for the doctor. I'll hitch up our fastest horse and then connect Shakespeare to one of our carts. Hope flooded through her. Louise nodded furiously. Thank you. Lifting her skirts, she dashed over to the house. Though she stumbled and nearly slipped countless times, Louise made it to the front door still standing. Her elbows banged against the doorframe as she ran in, not minding that she was trampling snow through the house. Mrs. Pennyworth, she called at the top of her lungs, come quick. Fortunately, the woman had just been in the nearby kitchen. Still wearing her apron, the bewildered woman hurried over with a ladle still in her hands. Breathlessly, Louise set the ladle aside and tugged the housekeeper towards the door. You must go to town immediately. There's been an accident. Richard took a terrible fall, and, and I couldn't get him back here. Jacob is going to bring him back to the house. He's saddling a horse for you to fetch the doctor. What? Mrs. Pennyworth scrambled for her boots as Louise grabbed the nearest coat. When did this happen? Is he breathing? Is Richard all right? They stepped outside and Louise led the way to the barn, but the other woman followed close behind, the panic spreading between them. Jacob, Louise called, is the horse ready? When they reached the barn, Mrs. Pennyworth hurried over to one of the stalls where they found Jacob and a dark brown horse being saddled. Leave the saddle be, boy, Mrs. Pennyworth announced. All I need are the reins and a leg up. Louise would have been impressed if she wasn't thinking of Richard lying on the cold, hard ground all alone. She managed a pained smile to Mrs. Pennyworth, who gave them a short nod and disappeared towards town. This shouldn't take long. Jacob dragged a cart out from a corner. You can get warm in the house. She shook her head and marched over, taking Shakespeare's reins. I'm not leaving now, not until I know Richard is safe. Just tell me how to help you hitch up this cart. The young man shook his head in disbelief, but offered a few quick explanations that helped him move faster. I'm going to ride Shakespeare. He can take a rider in the cart, but sitting in the back won't be comfortable. I don't care, Louise said plaintively. Then she glanced around and found several saddle blankets. She ran to carry as many of those as she could to set them in the cart before climbing in it and grabbing hold with both hands. Let's go then. Richard is just down the lane on the left. You can't miss him. He gave her a look like he wanted to protest, but said nothing. She decided that was for the best. She was tired of his grumpy attitude. Jacob nodded and then leapt into the saddle and nudged the horse into motion. Sitting in the corner of the cart was far from comfortable, but Louise decided she could worry about the bruises later. Her first concern was making sure Richard was all right. She hoped he didn't mind she had left him. They weren't that close, she knew, but she had to do something. She couldn't just leave him there. Though Louise wasn't certain how much she cared for the man, he was still a human being who needed to be cared for. And the sound of his fall. It rang in her ears and made her chest ache, biting her lip to hold back the flood of worries running circles in her head. Louise blinked hard several times and nearly sighed in relief when the cart came to a stop. Chapter 11 He tried to take deep breaths, but that hurt. Everything hurt. Richard swallowed hard and opened his eyes as though hoping the world would disappear again but the darkness had left him behind. This left him crumpled in a pile of hard, cold snow 
half a mile from the barn. As much as he wanted to go back to sleep, he couldn't. The pain wouldn't let him. It felt like a small child who didn't want to leave his mother's arms to be put back on the dirty floor. It nagged him, wanting all of his attention. What started as a small nudge became a strong tightness that squeezed the breath out of him. Not wanting to give in, Richard tried to think. The last thing he needed to do right then was to panic. He decided to try to gather his bearings. There was the sky up above him. What little blue had been there that morning had paled into gray and white. Most likely, there would be another snowfall soon. Blinking hard, Richard supposed they would have another two inches by the next morning. He hoped he wasn't still lying there at that point. Feeling a rock pressed against his shoulder, Richard tried to shift. But the wiggle only caused searing white pain, and he froze until his vision cleared. With his hands down on the ground, he felt the packed snow beneath him. He could hear the fresh crunch. His fingers were stiff with the cold. Then he heard another crunch, but it hadn't come from him. It was too loud. A droplet of sweat fell into his eye, and he winced as he tried to listen. He wasn't alone then. He could feel it. Someone else was there, or something. Louise, he asked hopefully. It couldn't be her. He knew that. He had sent her off to the house, but he had hoped to see her sweet face again. Hello, he called out, but there was no reply. He waited several minutes, his eyes wandering as he wondered if he could move. He should be able to. Perhaps he reasoned to himself. He had been premature to tell Louise to run off. Being alone only made his unease grow. His body grew antsy as the cold continued to seep in from the ground up. It took most of his strength to hold back the shivers, let alone the pain. Richard forced himself to swallow, though his throat was parched, and he tried to pick himself up. At least, to sit on his elbows and look around. That was the intention. He had done it a thousand times over, and it was an easy enough action, except in that next moment. When he attempted to pull himself up, a new world of pain ran down his spine. It was so splintering that he couldn't help but writhe in anguish. That only made everything worse. The world blinked in and out several times until he slumped in a heap, dazed and panting. Something was wrong. That was the first conscious thought that came to his mind minutes later as he attempted to process what had just happened. He couldn't get himself to stand, let alone sit up. It didn't make sense. But there was so much throbbing pain in his body that he couldn't think clearly. He just knew that his body hurt. His back felt bruised. His spine felt as tender as it could be, but he wasn't certain about his legs. Richard coughed, winced, and tried to glance towards the bottom half of his body. Nothing down there felt right. They were starting to feel numb, but were pained as well. A strange sensation was settling over him, like he was missing something. He took a deep breath and tried to wiggle his toes. He couldn't tell if they were moving or not, for his boots were thick and he couldn't see them. Richard shoved his hands down into the snow to look for a grip, and then he tried to move his foot. His head was bent just enough to see his foot sticking up, but it wasn't moving. No matter how hard he tried, it wouldn't do anything. Sweat dripped down Richard's brow. Though he was certain he was imagining things, it didn't stop the panic from climbing up his throat. It was slimy and slick as it tried to claw its way out. He groaned and shook his head. That action made the world spin, but at least it was a distraction. Then there was that familiar noise again, a footstep crunching on the snow or something like that. He wasn't alone. He had known it all along. Richard blinked hard and finally noticed socks. 
the smallest ounce of relief relaxed into his shoulders. His animal was behind him only a couple of feet, munching on the grass. That's why no one had responded when he had called out. That felt like a lifetime ago. How long had it been since Louise had left? His heart skipped a beat. He said a quick prayer that she was safe. Eventually, he'd have the strength to stand up. He just needed a minute to catch his breath, to stop being dizzy, and then he would climb onto his feet. The pain would go away. With one hand, he wiped the sweat away and put out a hand to the horse. Richard whistled lightly to Socks, trying to bring the animal over. It took a minute for Socks to finish munching. But then the horse took a few steps forward and sniffed Richard's head. Socks, Richard breathed. You are a ridiculous animal. Come here. He reached out, but the reins were inches out of his reach. That annoyed him enough to forget the pain for a second. Richard tried to nudge himself backward. He was so close. Come here, he muttered. Almost. But his hand missed. The attempt was in vain, especially as Socks jerked back in surprise and then completely out of reach. Richard tried to turn around to see where the horse had gone, but the shift caused his back to move and the searing pain to return. It took all of Richard's strength not to cry out. He gritted his teeth, waiting for the waves to pass over him and fade away. It was difficult to tell if it took more or less time to pass over. Either way, he couldn't budge until the worst of the ache turned dull. Hello? Richard tried to call out, trying to wave his hand, but his throat was parched and he still wasn't free of the hurt. He swallowed hard as his gaze turned to the sky. The clouds were swirling above as though they were laughing at him. Richard grunted lightly, trying not to be annoyed. But the pain wasn't helping, and he couldn't move. When he opened his mouth to call out for socks again, he could hardly use his tongue. His throat felt like it was filled with sand, and he gagged. That's when a hand pressed against his shoulder and squeezed. Automatically, his hand flew up and gripped whatever had grabbed him. When Richard managed to see straight, not realizing until that moment that his vision had been swimming, he found his brother's face frowning down at him. Relief spread over his soul. That wasn't all. Nausea swirled again in his gut. He winced. It took all his strength to keep it down. Jacob released his shoulder, shrugging the hand off. Richard, can you hear me? He said loudly. It took him a minute to pull himself together. Yes, he forced out. Then Louise's face popped up behind his brother. She said something as well, but Richard was having a hard time concentrating. The clouds were dancing now, and he was terribly thirsty. Though he reached for his brother, Jacob shrugged him off. Help me stand, Richard forced out. Can you stand? Jacob asked out loud, three times before he could understand. Yeah, Richard replied. He didn't know if that was true or not. But he was going to try. He only wished that Louise wasn't there to watch him in a state like this. The fall had been rough enough. She didn't need to see him struggling like this. She would never want to marry him if she thought him weak. That reinvigorated Richard. Pushing aside the pain, he glared at Jacob. Help me on my feet, he managed. His tongue felt thick, but he was certain his brother had understood. Jacob nodded. The young man glanced away for a moment and then leaned down again to wrap his arms around him. The two of them clung to each other as Jacob brought his shoulders up. All Richard had to do at that point was get his feet under him to stand straight, except his legs wouldn't obey. When Richard opened his mouth to protest, a strangled gasp escaped. Pain ran up and down his spine again, momentarily blinding him. He blinked for several minutes 
before finding himself back in the same position of lying in the snow, useless and stuck. His brother had set him back down, and for a minute, Richard worried this would become his grave. I'm going to have to carry you. Jacob knelt beside him. Understood? We brought the cart for you. I'm fine, Richard tried to tell him, but only a groan escaped. The world was still dancing, even as he felt his brother wrap his arms around him one more time. Tugged into a sitting position, Richard choked back a scream. It felt like his back had been set on fire. He thought he heard his brother grunt in his ear. It's about time you received your comeuppance. But then jerked upward, Richard blacked out from the pain. He couldn't tell how long it lasted. When he could see again, he found himself staring up at the sky. There was a blanket pulled up to his chin. Do you think he's going to be all right? Louise was right there. He could hear her sweet voice. Of course, Jacob called out from further away. He's a strong man, but let's focus on getting back to the house. It's only growing colder. Are you warm enough? Here, borrow my jacket. Richard opened his mouth to say something. He wanted to let them know that he was fine, that he was only bruised, that he only needed help to sit up, and then he could do the rest. He wanted to apologize to Louise and remind Jacob that the young lady was not there for him. Jacob had not been the one looking for a bride, nor writing to the pretty young lady all along. He could have Luann if he liked, but not Louise. Except he was trapped in the cart, and as it started to move, he could feel every rock and groove through the blankets he was piled in. He lost focus, forgetting his train of thought. No longer able to keep track of his thoughts or see straight, Richard closed his eyes and let the darkness take him back. At least there, nothing hurt. Chapter 12 She could hear the thud. She could picture his pale white face. Sit down, Luann whined from the sofa. You're making me dizzy. Louise rubbed her hands together as she paced in the parlor. She shook her head to try and force the terrible thoughts from her mind. Yet no matter what she did, sitting or walking, eyes closed or open, she couldn't stop seeing Richard lying in the snow. Louise worried it would haunt her dreams. That poor man. It had been a hard fall. What would happen now? Surely all would work out fine. Perhaps it was a fever. Perhaps that was all that was wrong. Louise tried to convince herself that everything would work out just fine. But the longer that the doctor stayed behind the closed door, the more she couldn't help but worry. What if, she started to say, but couldn't finish the thought. An agonized screech escaped the closed door. The noise made her heart jump. She stopped breathless, and wondered how a human could make such a sound. Her stomach clenched tightly, making her feel ill. It didn't sound good at all. The blood drained from her face as she turned to look at her sister. Even Luann looked uneasy. She stopped fiddling with her hair, but wouldn't meet her sister's gaze. It was in that moment that Louise couldn't convince herself to keep lying about what must have happened. Something terrible had befallen Richard, and it was more than a simple tumble off a horse. She couldn't be in denial any longer. But how bad could it be? Louise rubbed her hands together as she resumed her pacing. It helped her to stay calm and keep from pulling her hair out. As she walked, she tried to think, Surely it couldn't be life-threatening. Though he was weak and delirious in the cart, after Jacob had carried him to his room and she had found him some water to drink back at the house, he had started to come around and speak more clearly. He had apologized to her for what had happened and asked to make sure that she was all right. Of course, he was still thinking of her 
while clearly in pain. The man was such a gentleman, even during hardships. Louise only hoped that his pride didn't keep him from receiving the care that he clearly needed. Mrs. Pennyworth had returned shortly after they'd helped situate Richard in bed, bringing in Dr. Clapton. They had gathered all the pillows in the house to help him be comfortable, though it didn't seem to have worked. He had tried to thank them for the kindness, but she could see the agony in his eyes. Those sweet green eyes. You act as though the two of you are already married, Luann sighed. He's just someone you know right now, Louise. Whatever happens, it doesn't need to be so stressful. She stared at her sister in disbelief, wondering how the young woman could be so heartless. It wasn't about her romantic life. Louise wasn't thinking about Richard as her husband, but as a good man who had suffered a traumatic injury. She didn't know what had happened or what might come of the results of her morning out with him. It was only supposed to be an early ride, a tour around the ranch. She had no idea how it had gone so wrong, but he had warned her about the ice. Though she wanted to tell her sister to be kinder, to stop worrying about her personal affairs, Louise forced herself to close her mouth. She didn't want to say anything she might regret. Sometimes Luann preferred to be miserable. Surely her sister was counting it as luck, so she might be the first of the sisters to be wed. It had been the presumption long enough for the eldest to be married first before other siblings. Society expected it. But as Luann had grown older, she had grown more bitter. She was pretty, but had given few men the time of day in the past. Not that it should matter. Louise hadn't cared about any of that before. She had grown up knowing she wasn't the prettiest woman, nor the cleverest or kindest. But she was a hard worker who did her best to treat others properly as she focused on teaching herself as much as she could. It was a short life, and she wanted to make the best of what she had, realizing that the best way to enjoy herself would be to get out of the house, she had taken the initiative to reach out to the world to see if she might be helped. That's where Richard came in. She turned to the closed door, hearing nothing. Her heart hammered against her chest, and she wondered what was happening on the other side. A lump formed in her throat as her anxiety grew. Her trip had hardly begun, and already it had been terribly upset by Richard's accident. Not that she blamed him, but it worried her. Louise couldn't resist wondering what would happen next for everyone. She was torn between her selfishness, of wanting to know what she should do with herself, and her concern for Richard and his injuries. Would she be able to do anything to help him? What if she was useless? If she couldn't help, and would only be in the way, she knew it would be best if they didn't stay. They should return home. The idea sounded wise, but Louise immediately hated the thought of returning there and leaving all this behind. This was supposed to be a chance to escape the boredom and strict behavior she had grown up with. Her stomach roiled, and she winced at how her father would respond. He would tell her, she had tried too hard, talked too much, acted inappropriately like she always did. The man would have a hundred excuses to tell her why she should have never left so he could pat her head and tell her to return to sweeping the entryway. Just take a seat, would you? Luann waved a flippant hand in the air. Really, Louise, you're only hurting yourself by doing this whatever it is that you're doing. Louise told herself that her sister simply didn't understand. After all, she hadn't seen Richard that morning. Instead, Luann had stayed up in her room all by herself, which meant she certainly hadn't heard his fall off the horse. She hadn't even come out to see the commotion until Louise requested her pillows. I'm not doing anything, she told her sister quietly but the girl rolled her eyes. Please, Louise, 
You're always overly concerned about everything. It's silly, especially since you don't really care. She stopped pacing with a frown, not knowing how her sister could say such a thing. Sometimes she wondered if something was wrong with Luann. Of course I care, Luann. You wouldn't understand. You weren't there. Luann paused to give her a stern look. If you really cared for everyone as much as you pretend to care, then you would have never come here in the first place. Father was upset about this, this false courtship of yours. If you really cared for others, you wouldn't have come in the first place. Taking a deep breath, Louise swallowed and tried to let go of her sister's harsh words. I'm sorry you don't understand, Luann, but don't assume what you don't know. I'm just telling you the truth, her sister said. Mother and father would want me to keep an eye out for your safety, after all. She didn't feel very protected by her sister. Rubbing her hands together, she shook her head and quickened her pace. Thank you for your concern, Luann. But if you're uncomfortable sitting here with me, then you're free to go. I'm sure Mrs. Pennyworth would appreciate support in the kitchen. Her sister scoffed as she returned to playing with her hair. But she stopped complaining. Minutes passed in silence between the two of them as they waited. As Louise passed closer by the shut door, she eventually heard the murmuring of the men's voices. Jacob had stayed with his brother to talk to the doctor. They had said it was no business for the women, and Louise understood. They weren't family, after all. Mrs. Pennyworth was cooking food for everyone and had refused any help. She wanted to stay busy and distracted. Louise knew how the woman felt. But because of it, it meant that she was left out of the kitchen and pacing for much too long with nothing to do. She was about to say something about her concern to her sister when the door finally cracked open. She whirled around, staring as the doctor stepped out first. He carried a large bag with him, and she couldn't help but wonder if it had grown lighter during his stay. A lump formed in her throat as she found herself speechless. Good day, he offered gruffly to the young ladies and disappeared out of the house. She wished she could remember his name, but couldn't. Her eyes followed him out before turning back to see Jacob closing the door behind him. The young man had dark hair and dark eyes. There was an air of melancholy about him, and she wondered about the pain he was clearly dealing with. It had been there from the moment they met. Though she wouldn't wish to assume anything, Louise could tell he was struggling, and now she had a sinking feeling that it had to do with Richard. Just remembering the man's scream from minutes ago made her flinch. But there was no time to dwell on the past. Louise inhaled deeply as she rushed over to his side. Well, she asked him worriedly. Her hands clasped together before her as though in prayer. How is he? Please, tell me he's all right. What is it? Jacob's eyes were inscrutable, too dark for her to read anything. She gazed into them anxiously, waiting for him to confirm her fears or her hopes. The doctor will be back tomorrow. Her heart skipped a beat. Why, is that good? He, it's his spine. Jacob cleared his throat and spoke slowly. Doc says it's damaged. Richard might never walk again. Louise clapped her hands over her mouth in alarm. The news brought her concerns to the surface, and she could hardly breathe. She could hardly comprehend the news. It was terrible. It was strange. It was more than she was prepared to hear. Although she thought she had been ready to hear what might happen, she realized she wasn't. There was nothing in the world that could have prepared her to hear this news. Jacob took a small step forward and she took it as an invitation. She didn't know what else to do. Luann wouldn't understand. And if she felt this pain in her heart, then certainly Jacob felt it worse. 
Though she didn't know whose comfort she did this for, she threw herself into his arms. Chapter 13 Richard stared at the ceiling in his bedroom. There wasn't much else he could do, though his strength was slowly coming back. It took all his energy just to sit up, but that still caused his back to ache, which left him little else to do but lie in his bed and stare at the ceiling. It was only another wall, so there was nothing but the planks of wood. He had counted them over and over again since he had woken up. Though he had attempted to go back to sleep, Richard was too bored to give in again. The darkness had left him behind. He had tossed and turned all night after losing hope it would return. But he was left on his own, and it appeared to have gone, never to come back. He found himself missing it for the relief it provided, even though part of him knew it was wrong to want to be lost. If he wasn't lost to the darkness, that meant he had to face reality, and his reality the new reality was not very kind. Dr. Clapton had poked him about, prodding to learn what had happened. After nudging him on the back, Richard had nearly passed out at the sudden pain, yet it brought about the explanation that they were looking for, the answer to what was going on and why he could hardly move. At least, he couldn't move the lower half of his body. Dr. Clapton had hesitated as he took a step back. Fixing the glasses on the bridge of his nose, he'd glanced at Jacob and then at Richard. He had not liked the look that the man gave him. It was too serious, with a furrowed brow that could not present good news. His accident was only supposed to be an accident. He wanted to be back on his feet by Christmas, not wanting to leave all the hard work to his brother or to be a hindrance to Mrs. Pennyworth and their gentle guests. Even if it took a month, he braced himself. He would force himself to accept that. He didn't like the idea of being stuck in bed, but if that's what it took, he would understand. Richard was certain it couldn't be any more of a problem than that, except what the doctor had told him was much more surprising. I'd have to complete exploratory surgery or travel to a city where there are other doctors and possibly new medical advances that could help you better than a country doctor like myself could. But I can tell you this much. Your fall forced your spine out of alignment and chipped away at your vertebrae. It's pressed against your spinal cord, and I'm afraid there's nothing I can do about it. Even exploratory surgery would be dangerous, and you could be completely paralyzed. Richard had rarely heard that word before. It was a strange and uncomfortable term, not one that people talked about or wanted to even think about in any given situation. His heart skipped a beat as he stared at the doctor. Everything that the old man had just told him was difficult to comprehend and harder to accept. His eyes skittered over to his brother. But Jacob stood in the corner with his arms crossed and a blank expression across his face. Then he forced himself to consider what might very well be the truth, his new truth. Paralyzed? Richard repeated the word carefully, wondering if he had heard right. The doctor scratched his white beard before he nodded. I'm afraid so. You said it yourself that you couldn't move your legs. He frowned, not sure he understood. I don't think I... I mean, that's only because the fall stunned me. But I'll walk again. It's not that I... I mean, I will walk, won't I? Shifting in the bed, he couldn't imagine not walking again. Or running. Could a paralyzed person even ride a horse? He couldn't think of knowing anyone who had been paralyzed, so he shook his head to the very idea. But when Richard raised his eyes to look at the doctor again, his breath stopped. He felt his brow furrow and a droplet of sweat trickle down his spine. He tightened his hands into fists to stop the shudder. Unless there's a miracle, 
Dr. Clapton sighed and shook his head. No, I'll keep this short. Bones are pressing on your nerves. Any attempt to fix the injury is most likely to result in more injuries. I'm afraid there's nothing more I can do but, but help keep you comfortable. Richard narrowed his eyes. Am I dying? His brother shifted in the corner but said nothing. The doctor shook his head before glancing between the two of them. No, you should be able to live a good long life. As long as nothing like this happens again, you'll just have to adjust. Adjust. Richard repeated the word slowly. Adjust? How? His brother asked curiously. The conversation continued for several minutes between Jacob and Dr. Clapton. Richard couldn't find his voice as he tried to comprehend what he was being told. What they were saying. None of it felt real. It didn't make any sense what was going on. His brain scrambled, looking for a way out of this mess. That little fall couldn't have done what they were talking about. Accidents didn't last forever. They were only there for a moment before they all moved on. There had been accidents before, he knew that, but they only left scars, and scars healed. Scars didn't leave him trapped or stuck for the rest of his life. The night passed in quiet. Soon he was all alone. He was still scraped up, still cold, and still trying to understand his new situation. It didn't hit him until two days later when the doctor returned. He came bearing a gift that he and Jacob had been talking about that first day, a chair, a chair of his very own that came with four wheels on the bottom. Richard stared at it after Jacob deposited it by his bed. Though his brother had hesitated, almost as though he was going to ask if he needed any help, he walked out before saying anything more. And even if he had offered a helping hand, Richard wasn't certain he would have taken it. Eyeing the contraption warily, Richard thought back to lying there on the snow the other day when his brother had finally arrived to help him. He thought his brother had said something to him. It's about time you received your comeuppance. He frowned, wondering if he had really heard Jacob say that, but it didn't sound like something Jacob would say. They were family, after all, the only family either of them had. Though he wasn't certain they were as close as they once were, there was no reason for his brother to say anything that cruel. Shaking his head, Richard cleared his mind. It couldn't have been his brother. Jacob would never say anything like that. His fall had left him confused and disoriented, so he must have imagined things. There was a knock at the door and Jacob peeked his head in. Mrs. Pennyworth is finishing up the eggs and bacon. Should we bring you a platter, or would you like to join us? Richard rubbed his hands on his legs as he glanced at the chair waiting for him. It looked odd and not very comfortable. While he knew he would have to try it out eventually, he wasn't sure if he was ready to start using it. He worried that once he accepted this new change in his life, things would never be the same. He hesitated. I'm not sure. Jacob took a step through the doorway. Richard, don't doubt yourself. We'll try our best to figure everything out. Just because you're a cripple doesn't mean you need to change who you are. The insistence in his brother's voice made Richard reconsider. He wasn't used to being anxious for very long, and the practice over the last couple of days had been exhausting. Jacob was right. They would figure it out, and no matter what, everything would work out. A small spark of hope was born in his chest. I'll be there in a minute, Richard said with a nod. He grinned at Jacob, who nodded and left him. It was hard work that made him feel clumsy, as though he wore a new body. But Richard managed to eventually scoot himself to the end of the bed, adjust his legs over the edge, and bring the chair over. 
getting himself into the chair would prove difficult. But he wasn't discouraged. He could smell the bacon from the kitchen and was eager to see Louise again. He hadn't felt well enough to see her and didn't want to worry the women. It was time to talk to her again and catch up. Hopefully, she had kept herself busy for the last couple of days without him. One, two, three, he muttered as he gathered all his energy and tossed himself into the wheelchair. It was an awkward jump with his upper body and more awkward with his hands in all the wrong areas. Richard struggled to twist his body around to sit properly. Then he settled his legs into the footplate. His heart pounded as he grinned at his success. Maybe the adjustment wouldn't be so tough after all. Maybe everything could still work out the way he thought it would. Richard swallowed hard before pushing a grin onto his face. Then he opened the door and slowly wheeled himself out of his bedroom. It was awkward business, making his way down the hall. The process was also much slower than walking. He told himself it would take time, for it must be like learning to walk again, only there would be no more walking for him, just riding in his chair. Good morning. Halfway through the kitchen door, Richard looked up. Louise was standing at the counter, an apron tied prettily around her waist. As she turned to him with a small smile, the woman looked as beautiful as she ever had, standing tall, except that she wasn't very tall. No, he realized slowly, it was because he had shrunk much shorter. The realization hit him slowly and then suddenly. A sinking feeling filled his stomach. She looked taller than him with him sitting down, so she would be looking down on him. Awkward tension filled the air between them. Good morning, he cleared his throat. Though he wanted to say something, make a light remark, Richard couldn't find his voice. His hands fiddled with the handbars of his chair as he attempted to speak. It's good to see you up and about, Louise offered after a heartbeat. Will you be joining us at the table then? He nodded. I think it would be good to be moving again. Staying in my room can grow confining. Then, eyeing the door frame carefully, he tried to figure out how to best get through and make it all the way into the kitchen. It was a tight fit, and he didn't want to damage the frame. He needed to be able to touch the wheels to make them move, except there wasn't enough room to do that comfortably. Richard put his hands on the door frame and tried shifting the chair around to fix the angle. If his feet could go through, why couldn't he? Just a second, he muttered under his breath. Then he paused, wincing when he jammed his fingers between the door and his chair. As he grew frustrated, he grew clumsier and banged the chair against the door. Getting into the kitchen had never been so difficult. Richard didn't understand how the situation could be so complicated, since he had walked through that door easily for as long as he could remember. It was awkward and slow going. Only with his ridiculous chair did a problem present itself. A droplet of sweat dripped down his forehead as he tried again, only to bang his knuckles against the wood. Louise gasped softly. Oh dear, please let me help. She took a step forward. When he looked up, Richard paused to find a look of pity spread across her sweet, pouting face. Her brow furrowed in concern, and suddenly he realized how he must look to her, a weak thing, no longer a man. A furious blush spread up his neck in the humiliation that he couldn't bring himself to get through a door in his own house. It struck him so hard that his voice left him once more. But he didn't want to talk. All of a sudden, he didn't want to be anywhere anymore, especially not near her. The shame only grew, and he wished to disappear. Richard jerked his chair back as he shook his head. Making his way back out into the hall proved easier than making it into the kitchen. No, he forced the bitter words out. It's fine. 
I'm actually not. I don't feel well. But Richard. He let the door close between them. His heart pounded. As he prayed that she wouldn't open it, Richard clumsily tugged his chair back to his room and slammed the door shut. His breathing was labored as he found himself in there alone once more. Gritting his teeth, he hid his face in his hands. Being on his own for the last couple of days had been trying. Jacob would stop by and Mrs. Pennyworth would bring him his food. But that had been all. Richard thought he would appreciate the fresh air and especially being around Louise. He gave up as he sank in the chair. Now, more than anything, he hoped no one would ever see him alive again. Chapter 14 The last couple of days had been quiet for Louise. Mrs. Pennyworth had started to speak in whispers, as though the walls were listening to them. At first, Louise thought it was strange, but then she found herself doing the same thing, as though they didn't want to disturb anything or anyone. It took all her strength not to walk on her toes around the house. This wasn't her house nor her home. Louise found herself nervous to leave her bedroom, not certain of what to expect. She didn't want to bother Richard, but he had been the reason why she traveled so far to meet him. If he had to take time to heal, she worried that she would only be in the way. Nonsense, Jacob had told her when she voiced her concerns quietly that first night after the accident during their supper without Richard. You're welcome to stay as long as you like. We won't turn you out. Besides, it's almost Christmas. You must stay, at least until the new year. He had spoken so eagerly that Louise didn't feel that they had an option. She had turned to Luann, who merely shrugged and flipped her hair at Jacob again in the hopes of catching his attention. Louise had returned to her food and then helped Mrs. Pennyworth clean up afterwards. During the day, she had done her best to help with cleaning the linens and tidying the house. Jacob traveled to town to purchase feathers so she had built a few more pillows for everyone. Then the doctor had returned, carrying a chair with wheels. She had only seen one of those once before in her life. It was in the street with a poor beggar boy. A wheel was broken, and he couldn't move. Though she had crossed the road to talk with him, her mother had grabbed her by the elbow. It's his fault he broke it, her mother muttered. We have more important things to worry about. This way, Louise. Louise still remembered the way her heart had clenched when she had to turn her back to the struggling child. Any hope in her chest had fled upon seeing the chair crawl across the room, but then she told herself she was being dramatic. The tears that had poured down her cheeks and over Jacob's shoulders that afternoon had been wiped away. They had not returned. She had resolved that she would not be miserable or sad. In a situation like this, one had to focus on the light. Louise listened as Richard's door opened and closed. Then she paused to say a prayer for strength. Dear, Mrs. Pennyworth glanced in from the kitchen. I'm preparing some food, but I could use your help. Would you care to join me? Louise jumped onto her feet. Of course, she nodded as she hastened over, grateful for a distraction. Though she had decided to find some time to talk to Richard that day, hopefully sooner rather than later, she wasn't certain what she would say. Part of her wanted to ask Mrs. Pennyworth for the woman's opinion. She would surely know Richard better and have an idea of what would be something helpful to say but Louise worried that she was making everything more complicated by bringing in a middle person. It bothered her that she felt so nervous about reaching out to Richard now. The chair didn't bother her. Everyone lived their lives differently. She was only concerned how he was feeling and if he was feeling lively enough for some company. 
there was still so much she wished to talk to him about from their letters. Here, if you could keep an eye on the bacon, don't burn yourself, dear, Mrs. Pennyworth added. I have another apron around here somewhere. Where on earth has it gone? Peeking into the pan, Louise turned the sizzling bacon strips over onto their other side. Mrs. Pennyworth was distractedly rummaging around the kitchen, her thoughts clearly all over the place. Louise could feel the nervous energy from across the room. You said you had recently finished some laundry, she volunteered after thinking for a moment. Might it be in a basket somewhere nearby? The woman tutted as she turned in another circle. I'm afraid you must be right. Ah, I had best find it. There's no sense in ruining our clothes for bacon grease. Will you be fine here if I disappear for a minute? Of course, Louise nodded, absently wondering where her sister was. Luann had only come out for supper the day before, claiming a headache. It might have been a real headache, or perhaps it was only an excuse not to spend time in the kitchen. Louise wasn't certain. She hummed quietly, finding herself alone in the kitchen once Mrs. Pennyworth wandered off. There was the bacon to put onto the dishes and the eggs to set on the plates. She heard Richard in the hall, but the young man didn't make it into the room for several minutes. Not until she heard a door open and something soft thump against the wall. Louise turned to find Richard there. He sat in his new wheelchair, sitting tall. His hair needed a good brushing, but his eyes were bright. A smile climbed onto her face. Somehow, she had missed him. Except, the brightness in his eyes didn't last long. They greeted one another, but Richard turned away as he struggled to get his chair through the door. Louise held her wooden spoon as she took a step forward. She wanted to help in any way that she could, but he turned her away. His brow furrowed as he backed up and the door separated them. Louise stood there in confusion, uncertain of what had just happened. Her mouth hung open as she wondered if she had said something. Of course he was hungry. He had to be. Richard was a grown young man and he needed food. Louise stared at the door as she tried to think about something she could have said to keep him in the kitchen. There was so much more that she wanted to say. Fiddling with the spoon, she racked her brain for ideas. A few minutes later, Mrs. Pennyworth came in with the other apron. Louise had worn it two nights ago a simple checked pattern with three helpful pockets. The woman offered her a smile. I passed Jacob in the hall. It sounds like Richard will be joining us this morning. I'm afraid not, Louise replied faintly. He changed his mind. Mrs. Pennyworth paused. Oh, he came out here? Nodding, Louise tried to find the right words to express what she thought had happened. But she felt that no matter what she might say, everything would turn out wrong. Yes, he decided to return to bed, I'm afraid. Oh, the housekeeper glanced at the door with a slight frown before she shrugged it off. I'm sure he's still dealing with his aches and pains. But don't you worry, dear. He'll be up before you know it. Richard likes to keep moving about, he does. Those eggs look delightful, Louise. Well done. As the woman bustled about the kitchen, Louise finally pulled herself together. Letting go of the shock that had caught her off guard with Richard's sudden dismissal, she was determined not to let him disappear like that. Louise turned back to the counter and pulled out the tray. The housekeeper prattled on, but she hardly listened as she found the best of the bacon and eggs prepared a glass of juice, and made her way out of the kitchen. There was something on his mind, she decided, and it was time they talked. She wanted to let him know that there was no need for him to be shy. They already knew each other through the letters they had written to one another. Since he had guests in his house, he had no excuse to ignore them, 
especially her. It took all of her courage to knock on the door, telling herself that this was the right choice to make. Of course he wanted to talk to her. It was nearly Christmas, and they hadn't had much time to connect since her arrival. There was no need to waste time apart, even if he was going to be picky about where he ate. And he had to be hungry. What is it? Richard called through the door. Louise opened the door with her elbow and brought the tray into his room. It was a large room with few decorations inside. There was a large bed in the middle and a large armoire in the next corner. There was a mirror near the door, a chest at the end of the bed, and a small table with baubles near the bed. She noticed how the baubles had been pushed into a corner to make room for something larger. Her eyes glanced down at the tray in her hands before she turned to find Richard on the edge of the bed. His eyes looked dark when they fell upon her, and she wondered if it was because of the dim light in the room. At least, that's what Louise hoped. Then he turned away from her. Richard's shoulders shook as he pushed the wheeled chair away from the bed. She found herself lowering her gaze. After some fumbling, he scooped each of his legs onto the mattress. Only then did she lift her eyes again. What are you doing? He asked her in a blunt tone. It made her hesitate as she still stood in the doorway. Most of her courage had already been used. Louise swallowed as she tried to put on a smile. I know you said you weren't hungry, but I wanted to make sure you had food nearby in case you changed your mind. I'm not interested. He nearly cut her off. Louise felt her heart clench, and it reminded her of those mornings when her father would catch her reading. There was always someone around who didn't want her to do what she thought was right. It bothered her, and she tried to work her way around it. She swallowed again. I'll leave it here anyway, just in case. When he didn't respond, Louise took it as enough of an invitation to step forward and set the tray on the edge of the table. Though two of the edges hung off, she felt fairly certain it wouldn't fall over. Her stomach growled at the scent of the fresh meal. She only hoped that he felt the same way. Taking a step back, Louise glanced at the open door. Richard, I thought we could talk. I don't want to talk to you. Her eyes turned back to Richard in hurt surprise. But before she could ask him what was wrong, he turned away from her, flipping onto his side. Soon his back faced her, and Louise was left speechless. Even if he had had a rough morning, she couldn't imagine someone being so rude. It reminded her of her father when he was in his nasty moods. She swallowed hard and rubbed her hands. But... She racked her brain to think up the excuses she had thought of on her way to his room. Richard didn't give her a chance. Just leave me alone. Though Louise hadn't been the most obedient daughter for her parents, she knew a stern order when she heard one. Heat climbed to her cheeks as she hastened over to the door to go. Embarrassment climbed up her spine, making her shudder. What had she been thinking? Louise felt the shame spread as she hurried away from the room. They hardly knew each other. Confusion filled her head, distracting her from looking where she was going until she ran into a wall. Whoa, Louise. It wasn't a wall. It was Jacob. The man put his heavy hands on her shoulders with a concerned expression as he looked down at her. Putting a hand to her forehead where she had struck his chin, Louise only felt more humiliated. She wondered why she could never seem to do anything right. Not only could she not be the daughter her father wanted, but she couldn't help Richard, and now she was in Jacob's way. I, I'm sorry, she felt the heat spread across her cheeks as she looked away. I shouldn't have been walking so quickly. I'm afraid I wasn't thinking. 
He gave her what she supposed was meant to be a comforting squeeze, but she was too distracted to mind. It looks like you could use a walk. That always helps me clear my mind. Louise stepped out of his grasp with a quick shake of her head. Thank you, but I should return to the kitchen. Mrs. Pennyworth has everything under control, Jacob assured her. Just a short walk. The fresh air will help you think right. Come now, I won't take no for an answer. She didn't know what else to do. After a moment, Louise supposed that a short walk might be just the thing to help her out and perhaps she could speak to Jacob about his brother. So she gave the young man a nod and followed him out of the house. Chapter 15 Paralyzed He hadn't heard a lot about that word before. It was a whisper that people spoke of, an idea that never came to fruition. Jacob could hardly believe it. His stomach had protested the idea, roiling around so much that there was a bitter taste on his tongue for a day and a night after the news. It left him unbalanced, leaning against the walls to stay on his feet. The following day brought him some peace of mind. He had a hard time sleeping at first, but then Jacob rested like a babe exhausted from their new world of existence. When he arose, he almost laughed. Richard was paralyzed. After a lifetime of living in the shadow of the golden boy, Jacob couldn't help but be stunned. For everything that this meant for them, he could hardly imagine. It took all of his strength not to tell the town what had happened when he rode in to purchase more feathers. He just wanted to tell someone what it meant for him. He could almost sing. The situation became much more real when he helped the doctor offload the wheelchair. Jacob had never heard of such a contraption until the man had explained it to him. They had discussed measurements, options, their best choices. Eventually, Jacob had given the doctor one of the kitchen chairs that Richard sat in, and now the chair had returned with cushions tied to it, a footplate, and four wheels, two large ones and two small ones. It was a clever contraption. He could readily admit that. But no matter how clever a chair was designed, it couldn't hide the truth. His brother had become a cripple. When he had muttered in his brother's ear about his expected trouble, Jacob hadn't expected anything so severe as a lifetime sentence in a chair. He could hardly believe his luck. The future suddenly felt unlimited and free. All he had assumed was a broken leg and some ribs, something that would heal within a short period of time, just enough that would deter a pretty young girl like Louise from him, and just enough that Richard would have to realize how much better Jacob was at running their family ranch. He would be. He would have to be. Richard would be trapped in his chair. They weren't even sure if the man would ever be able to ride a horse again. That meant there was nothing he could do from outside of the house. Picturing his brother trying to wheel around in the dirt and snow made him laugh. With a shake of his head, Jacob told himself to sober up as he finished dressing. He couldn't hate his brother that much. He was just glad that the young man had finally been put in his place. It was about time. He had waited long enough. Now anything was possible. Jacob headed outside and handled the morning chores. The work didn't feel as difficult as it used to. He found himself whistling as the sun made its way up after the chores. He headed back to the house in hopes of finding food on the table. Perhaps that would give him an opportunity to talk to the pretty lady. Jacob. Pulling off his hat, he looked up to see a lady. But it wasn't the one he was looking for. Jacob quirked his eyebrow up at Luann. Good morning, ma'am. He didn't want to get familiar with her. Is there something you need? He realized he should probably check on his brother, make sure he was going to eat something. 
Jacob couldn't very well leave his brother to rot. He would change, check on Richard, and then eat food. It sounded like a solid plan and one that didn't include Luann. It's lonely in here, Luann stuck out her bottom lip. You're always out there in the cold, it seems. I could really use some company. Why don't we see about spending some time together? We don't need the kids or the old mother hen around. Jacob narrowed his gaze at her as he tried to understand what she was saying, but her fingers were distracting as they kept playing with her hair. Luann leaned against the wall, watching him take his jacket off. He supposed Mrs. Pennyworth was something of a mother hen. That made sense. But it didn't make sense for him to spend time with her. She wasn't the one he had decided he wanted. No, thank you. I have other duties to attend to, Jacob added as way of an explanation, and then passed her in the hall. He thought he could hear her mutter something under her breath, but he decided not to bother with her. Jacob stopped to put his scarf on his bed before passing Mrs. Pennyworth in the kitchen and moving on to check in on Richard. His brother didn't sound thrilled at the prospect of getting up, but he was easily convinced to try out his chair. It would be the perfect opportunity for Louise to understand what it would mean to continue such a ridiculous courtship. Whistling again, Jacob changed his shirt and wondered if Louise was up for the day. He could picture her sparkling eyes, and it made him smile. She was a pretty girl. Now, she would have no choice but to see him as the better option. He headed over to the kitchen, but she wasn't there. When Jacob heard his brother's familiar squeaking door open, he stepped back into the hall to find Louise stumbling out of Richard's room. His heart skipped a beat, as he took a step forward. He wasn't even disappointed that he had found her with his brother. After all, he was hardly any competition anymore. She was pretty, even as he could tell she was clearly upset. Her eyes glistened as though she were close to tears, and when she bumped into him, it was clear something was wrong. As Jacob led her out of the house, proud of himself for getting her alone. He realized Richard must have been the reason she was upset. His brother had done something to hurt her feelings. Jacob frowned and wished he had told her sooner not to bother with him. Just because he was the golden boy didn't mean he was perfect. Clearly, Louise deserved better than Richard, and she needed someone who could be there for her who would treat her better, like he could. They started down the path around the house. It was hard to take his eyes off her. She had the prettiest oval face. There was something about her that he simply couldn't ignore. I do hope Richard will be all right, Louise murmured. Jacob swallowed the annoyance down as he stepped closer to match her step. He will be, he assured her. He might not be the same as he was before, but he's alive. And that's the important thing. It's only a shame that he can no longer do, well, anything. Anything. Louise glanced up sharply. He shrugged, stuffing his hands in his jacket. The doc didn't want to promise anything. It's hard to say, but Richard is going to have a hard time of everything moving forward. He'll have to change his way of life. Everything. Of course, I'll do everything I can to help him. But he has to figure out a lot of it on his own. Jacob didn't know where he was going with his talk. One moment, he was almost making his brother sound good. But he didn't want to put Richard down too much, so he himself sounded bad. It was a complicated situation he had put himself in yet he was ready for the challenge. Oh dear, Louise murmured with a shake of her head. I can't possibly imagine what it's like. Do you know if he is in any pain? Surely he is feeling well. He bit his tongue and shrugged. Well enough, but he isn't up for much company. 
The more he could separate them, he knew, the better. Jacob watched Louise nod softly before pinning a strand of hair behind her ear. His thoughts wandered back to all the occasions where he had joked with Richard about the mysterious letters he insisted on writing and receiving. Now he wished he had stolen one to read. He was curious what she had seen in Richard and what she had told him about herself. The few girls in town had pined through their youth over Richard. What made Louise so different that he had picked her? His thoughts were beginning to wander off track. Jacob wasn't certain how much he cared, only that he wanted her. As they made their way around the large house, he knew he could have her. It was obvious. Richard would no longer be one of her suitors now that he was a cripple trapped in a chair. Since Louise had only just arrived, it would give him all the time he needed to convince her that he was the right choice, not his brother. After all, Richard had had everything handed over to him for much too long. Now it was Jacob's turn to have everything. He nodded along as Louise spoke. She was saying something about her sister being there and how helpful Mrs. Pennyworth had been for their arrival. It went something along the lines of hoping she wasn't a burden, or something like that. She had a pretty voice, with a pretty accent. That was what Jacob noticed the most. They slowly made their way back to the front door. On the steps, Louise turned around and gave him a smile. His heart quickened, feeling it was just for him. Thank you she said sincerely. You were right. The fresh air was helpful. My mind is clear again, and I'm ready to return indoors. And you? As she stood on the next step up, they were nearly eye level. The air was crisp, and he could feel his blood rushing in his veins. Jacob could hardly believe his good fortune. Everything was going his way. For the first time in his life, he was the golden boy. He just knew it, and it was time to enjoy it. His eyes dropped down to Louise's pretty pink lips. They looked to have grown plumper since they had stepped outside. The moment felt right, and the urge struck him to kiss her. She would be his. That was clear now. Jacob gave her a grin and leaned forward. It had been too long since he kissed a pretty girl, and he knew it would make her feel better. She had to feel the sensational moment between them. He bent over to reach her lips, but the lingering kiss he imagined never happened. Instead, a heavy thud struck his cheek, so suddenly that he saw stars dancing around him. Jacob covered his injured cheek with his hand, nearly falling off the stairs. He opened his eyes wide in disbelief as he realized what had just happened. Louise had just slapped him. What are you doing? She wore a shocked expression in return. She took a step away from him. Jacob, that is entirely inappropriate and, and much too forward. Why would you assume I would do such a thing? He gaped at her wondering where the fire between them had run off to. She had to be crazy to have not noticed it earlier. It wasn't like he could have imagined it. He tried to say something in his defense, but his voice faltered as she stared at him sternly. That is entirely unacceptable, Louise announced. Now appearing more upset than she had the night before, the young woman whipped around and stomped up the stairs. She left Jacob standing there, stunned, wondering where they had gone wrong. Chapter 16 Her lips burned as she ran back into the house. Louise's heart jumped as she fumbled for the door, but she wouldn't turn back. She couldn't. Her hand twitched itching after the sharp slap she had given Jacob. She hadn't meant to. Not really. She had never injured anyone like that before, whether on purpose or by accident. 
one had to respect other people. But he had overstepped his bounds. Now, Louise wanted nothing more than to get away from him. A loud sigh of relief escaped her as she stumbled inside where she was bound to be safe. Not that she was in danger. At least, she hoped she wasn't. Closing the door behind her, Louise closed her eyes to relax. It had only been a kiss, her first kiss, stolen by a man she did not love and did not like. She wrinkled her nose. She tried hard not to have negative feelings toward others. It never sat right on her shoulders, and the Bible said that it was important for people to forgive. Most folks didn't do rude things on purpose. Her lips still tingled, and she considered making an exception. Louise couldn't bring herself to regret the slap nor the scolding. Jacob had taken something from her and taken it without permission or invitation. She had no idea what he must have been thinking to suppose she might favor him in such a manner after traveling so far to meet his brother. It was Richard she had come for, not Jacob. Only then did she realize she could hear Richard somewhere close. Louise jerked her head up, still dazed. She blinked before focusing on the hall around her. Richard was nearby as he talked. No, she realized a moment later, he was much too loud to be talking. The man's voice was raised. It wasn't quite a shout, but possibly on the verge of one. Her shaking hands slipped over the folds of her dress in a quick effort to smooth out any wrinkles. She had hoped it would help her calm down. Tugging off the shawl, Louise redirected her attention from Jacob outside to Richard inside. As she took a step, however, she realized who he was talking to, Luann. You're just being a child, her sister called out in her infamous snide voice. If you want it, come and get it. Alarm ran through Louise's body. Jerking away from the door, she picked up her skirts and hurried down the hall. She looked in the dining room, but they weren't there, nor was there anyone in the kitchen. The house truly was too big. Louise could hear their voices better the farther she tiptoed down the hall before finally finding the two of them in the parlor. She stopped in the doorway to study the scene before her. In the other doorway stood Richard. Or rather, he was seated in his chair. Any gladness she felt about seeing him up and about was diminished by the fact that he looked quite upset. Her stomach churned. With one arm resting on the armrest, his other arm was gesturing across the room. His brow was creased in frustration as he looked across the room. His energy was directed towards Luann who stood against the sofa. She had something in her hand as she gestured back to him. The other hand leaned on the sofa behind her as though she didn't want to leave her comfortable spot. After all, she was either there in her room or at the table. Luann had hardly gone anywhere else in the couple of days they'd spent at the ranch. Nothing had been thrown in the room yet, nor ruined. The coffee table in the middle of the room that separated the two unhappy parties had not been touched. Louise glanced around just to be certain she hadn't missed anything, but she had to have missed something to walk into this bewildering scene. She inhaled shakily before clearing her throat. It was meant to gather their attention, but Luann was breathing loudly through her nose and Richard was speaking. Before we continue into the story, do us a favor. Like this video and hit the subscribe button because it helps very much with YouTube's algorithm. If you want the audiobooks ads free, visit our website and select our bundles to save more. Thank you again. Now back to our story. No right, he said loudly and firmly. You are a guest in this house, my house. It's not yours to touch. Is something... Louise touched her hair only to find her fingers were still shaking. As she spoke, she felt the strange tingling on her lips. She tried to interrupt again. Excuse me, but... 
They still didn't notice her. I said you could come and get it, Luann reminded the man. But you won't, will you? You can't even deny the truth. I don't care who you think you are, but you can't tell me what to do. The vehemence startled Louise, for she hadn't heard her older sister talk like that in a long time. Luann, she found her voice and spoke sharply, giving her sister a pointed look. What? the girl cried out in exasperation. Then she paused in surprise at seeing Louise there at the door. Louise hoped that her sister was about to calm down, that whatever they had been arguing about meant nothing, and they could all be friends again. The two of them needed to come to their senses. She raised a hand, but stopped as Luann's gaze narrowed. If anything, she looked even angrier. That wasn't what she had hoped for. Swallowing hard, Louise turned to Richard in the hopes of finding him in a better mood. She had been praying he would be feeling better and want to be up and about. There was still so much she wanted to say to him, to talk to him about, especially about Jacob. They could recover from their last conversation if only he would talk to her. But he wore a scowl as well. She tried to get him to look at her, but he wouldn't. Richard kept his eyes down as he tugged himself in his chair backwards out of the room. He used the walls and the wheels to maneuver about. Louise took a step forward, but it was already too late. The only way he could have left any quicker was to have run. She bit her lip. She shouldn't think thoughts like that when he was in his chair. It hadn't been very nice. Nor was the way he had scattered like that Shaking her head, Louise turned back to the only other party in the room. She crossed her arms with a pointed shrug directed at Luann. Even though she was the younger of the two, Louise had received plenty of opportunities to play the peacekeeper back home. What was that about? What was that about? Luann repeated sarcastically. The girl pulled her hair from her shoulder and collapsed on the sofa with a loud huff. That was about someone being ridiculous and unreasonable. Did you hear him talk to me like that? Louise took another step into the room as she stared her sister down. I mostly heard you, rather, talking like that to him. What were you doing? I was talking. I was defending myself, Louise. Don't get your skirts in a bunch, would you? It's none of your business anyway. Luann defended herself flippantly. She deflated with a sigh, never looking at Louise. She rarely looked anyone in the eye lately. It was as though she had woken up into a new world that was unhappy and strange. Louise didn't like it. Jacob had false notions about her modesty and commitments. Luann didn't care about what people thought or wanted, and Richard wanted nothing more to do with her. All she wanted to do was return to bed so she could cry and sleep until the world turned right again. But she didn't. Louise told herself that couldn't happen. She stepped farther into the room until she stood before her sister. It is my business, actually, Louise said decidedly. I'm the one who wanted to come out here. I'm the one who has been writing to Richard for months. If you're here and bothering him, I think I have a right to know. What was going on with you two? Luann scoffed as she fiddled with her hair. I told you, he was just being angry over nothing. I am apparently perfectly wonderful at ruining everything. If there is even anything here, we're in the middle of nowhere in case you haven't noticed. I had, Louise breathed in through her nose. It's open land and I wanted to come here, but... I didn't come so I could hear you shouting with Richard. Honestly, Luann, can you tell me the truth? Can you tell me anything real? I just want to understand. What were you two arguing about? I've never seen a fight like that before. Her sister stood suddenly. Stop playing pretend, Louise. You aren't perfect, and we all know it. After all, what kind of perfect angel would go on a walk with the brother of the man she's courting? Don't you think that's a little rude? As Luann flipped her hair behind her shoulder to go, 
The ends struck Louise. Stunned, she stood there in her spot as she watched her sister stomp out of the room. The older girl could be heard traveling down the hall and into her bedroom. A loud slam sounded as the door shut unnecessarily hard. It was only after that moment when Louise managed to breathe again. How had her sister known where she had been? Louise wondered if Richard knew as well. Could that have been why they were fighting? But it seemed unlikely. Surely they would have wanted to talk to her about what had happened if it involved her. A knot grew in her stomach as she wondered about what she had done. She felt the need to explain herself to someone, but there was no one around to listen to her. Her arms dropped by her sides. Turning slowly around the room, she studied the space around her as though hoping it would tell her what had happened. Luann had clearly skirted answering the question properly. Louise wondered why. What could those two have possibly talked about? As she chewed on her lip, she was reminded that the only thing Luann and Richard had in common was herself. But why would they talk about her? She could feel her heart pounding in her chest, already worn out from her day. When Louise picked up her hands, only one hand was still shaking. It was the hand that she had used to slap Jacob. Her eyes skirted towards the doorway to see if he might walk through there to make her day even worse. But no one came. Forcing herself to breathe, she shook her head tiredly and went to sit on the sofa. She took her sister's seat and tried to relax. If she could only clear her mind, then she would feel better. Her head was too muddled with everything that had just happened. Louise knew she had wanted more excitement in her life, but this was not how she had expected it to go. As she stretched out her hands, her fingers found something on the sofa. She grabbed it to find a small stone. It glittered in the light with silver and gray. Louise studied it curiously, noting the stripes and the ridges. There was one smooth side that curved like an apple, but the top was rough and made her think of a mountaintop. It fit perfectly in her palm and was cool to the touch. Louise pondered where it might have come from. Perhaps Luann knew. She didn't want to talk to Luann. She wasn't certain she wanted to talk to anyone, not even Mrs. Pennyworth. All she wanted was some time alone to gather her thoughts. The rock was put down as she stood up. Louise decided she was tired of everything happening to her when she had no choice in the matter. Surely there was something she could do for herself. Deciding she didn't want to be found if Jacob returned to the house, Louise made her way to her room to think. Chapter 17 When Louise had left his room that morning, Richard had concentrated on his self-pity for only another minute before realizing he might have been too rude. He turned over, but the door was closed. There were voices on the other side, but they soon faded into the distance, leaving him alone again. That frustrated Richard. Everything annoyed him. It felt that every time things started to go well, something happened. Most of the hiccups in his life were manageable. He had concentrated his efforts on the ranch. Even during the harsh winters, they had survived. Even when their parents died, he and Jacob had survived. But this was beginning to feel like too much, especially as he tried to imagine the future where there was nothing waiting for him. Every time he tried to look for a semblance of hope, he was reminded of his clumsiness before Louise that morning. He remembered how the pity spread across her face, along with the hot shame that followed. A man was supposed to be able to take care of those he loved. A husband had to protect his wife. A father had to be able to support his children. Trapped in the chair, Richard was certain he couldn't do any of that 
He couldn't even fit himself through a doorway. Grumbling under his breath, he tried to get some sleep. His body still ached through the bruises, and part of him was certain that he would never be free of pain. But when he couldn't fall asleep, Richard noticed the tray on his table. Louise had left it for him, even when he said he didn't want it. His stomach growled, as though telling him it had all been a lie. Glancing at the food, he knew it would have tasted better if he had eaten it while it was still hot, but he hadn't. Now it would be cold. He sighed and realized that he might never enjoy a hot meal again if he had to keep eating in his room. At least things can't get any worse, he muttered to himself. Shuffling around, he tugged at the blankets that had wrapped around his useless legs as he tried to sit up. It took more effort every time he had to move the lower half of his body. Part of him wished he could just cut it off to save himself the trouble. Sighing, he shook his head and reached over for the tray. It was tricky to pick up and move with one hand. He winced as the cup started to slide. Don't, he started to say as though speaking to the inanimate object would help. It didn't. Richard twisted his wrist to tilt the tray in the opposite direction. That action only helped the cup slide in the other direction, tip over and then slide over the edge of the tray. One hand was on the tray and the other was propping him up, so there was nothing he could do to stop the inevitable fall. The cup hit his bed frame and crashed onto the floor. It broke into several pieces as though to taunt him. Liquid poured everywhere. Working his jaw, he looked over the edge of the bed to glare at the broken pieces and spilled water. Perhaps things could get worse, and if they could, then they probably would. That seemed to be his life now. A knock at the door jerked his head up. Richard, Mrs. Pennyworth called out to him. I thought I heard a noise. Is everything all right in there? His eyes glanced towards the floor as he said, It's fine, Mrs. Pennyworth, just fine. A moment of silence. Are you sure? Yes, Richard called before gritting his teeth. He didn't mean to sound so bitter to her. She hadn't done anything wrong. But he didn't want to talk to her or have to explain to anyone that he had dropped a cup because he was weak. That's all he was ever going to be. The dread of the future consumed him. Richard managed a few bites of his food before putting the plate down. It was left on his bed and not the tray. He didn't want to break something else. Frustrated, he tried to consider his options. His eyes kept straying back to his chair. It was supposed to help him get around, not humiliate him. He couldn't stay trapped in this room for the rest of his life. The very idea of never leaving his bed again nauseated him so badly he grew dizzy. No, he told himself as he reached out against the wall to catch himself from falling. Sometimes talking to himself reminded him to live in the present and not his mind. Closing his eyes, Richard shook his head and took a deep breath. No, I won't be trapped. When he opened his eyes, he almost felt like the chair was shrugging its shoulders at him. If he wasn't going to be trapped, then he was going to have to learn how to use it to get around. Richard swallowed the bile down and told himself to stop mourning what he had lost. There was surely something good out in the world still. It was a little easier than the first time to climb into the chair. He knew to move his hips and then the legs. They banged lightly against the corner, but he didn't really feel it. He only winced once before he found himself settled in the chair again. He inhaled sharply. See, Richard told himself, I can do this. Another deep breath, and he took himself to the door. It was a wider frame than many in the house, an advantage he hadn't considered until now. He scooted easily through and was about to close it, but decided it was too much effort for the moment. That was something he could work on another day. 
Perhaps just getting used to moving himself around by pushing and pulling on the wheels would be best. He raised a hand to look at his palm, glad that his hands were calloused. Perhaps he would want something to help him in the future. So he considered finding gloves for later on. Until then, he could explore around the house. When he spotted Mrs. Pennyworth in the kitchen, Richard decided against stopping there. He wasn't hungry, and he wasn't interested in talking to her. She had a penchant for optimism, and at the moment, he wasn't interested. Once he figured out how to move again, maybe then he would celebrate. But his shoulders were already growing tight, and the chair wasn't going to be comfortable for very long. Richard continued through the hall until he spotted the parlor door open. He peeked in to find the older sister, Luann, wandering around. It struck him as rather odd, and he wondered what was on her mind. The way she eyed everything so thoughtfully made him uneasy. She walked slowly and was touching everything her eyes fell on. The piano, the seat, the keys, the window, the curtains, the wall the table, the candle, the rock. Immediately his heart clenched. Put that down, he instructed, and then caught himself. Please, he added. Whirling around to find she had been caught, Luann's eyes widened. Then they fell on him. Her pout turned into a dark look. What did you just say? It was a gray little rock with silver streaks not worth any money but rich in sentimental value. He could still remember his mother's delighted cheer when he showed it to her. She said she would never forget it and praised him for a whole week before placing it in the parlor for all to see it. The rock had never been moved since except to be dusted. He could still hear his mother's laugh in his head sometimes. Richard swallowed as he forced his way into the room. Please put it down, he tried to be polite. It belongs on the table and shouldn't be moved. Luann glanced away from him to look at the rock. His heart jumped when she tossed it into the air and then caught it. This? It's just a rock. Then she laughed. Rocks belong outside, you know. That's not the point, he shook his head. Gripping the armrest tightly, he couldn't help but scowl. It had been a rough enough day, and she didn't need to be mocking him. I asked you kindly, ma'am. She rolled her eyes. Ah, uh, what a gentleman. What's the point of this? It's not even a gemstone. Why would you bother with keeping this inside? That's none of your business, he cleared his throat. I've asked you enough times, so please put it where it belongs. The young woman tossed it again in the air before she turned to the table. She floated the rock around as she goaded him. Does it go here, or was it here, maybe an inch to the left? Though Richard pushed the wheelchair over to get closer, there was the table in the way. He could hardly squeeze between the two chairs before the table. They were on opposite ends of the room. Last week, he could have walked right over there to her. Now he had no idea how to reach her. But Richard felt certain that were he not in the chair, she wouldn't be treating him this way. Though she might not be that much more respectful, she wouldn't be teasing him like she did now. His stomach clenched in distaste, unable to believe that she would be so disrespectful and arrogant. I asked you kindly, he couldn't help but raise his voice an octave. This is my house, and that is my property. I will not ask you again, Luann. It's not yours. Luann called out in a loud and terrible tone, You're just being a child, as if she wasn't talking about herself with her hands on her hips. If you want it, come and get it. Something flared within him. He gripped the armrests as hard as he could, but there was nothing they could do. Richard's chest heaved as he glared at her and gestured to the table. Luann, put it down this instant. Oh, right, she laughed cruelly. You can't come and get it, can you? Look at you in that chair. 
You wish you could slap me, don't you? But you can't because you're nothing. I can't believe my sister won't let us leave already. It's not like she'll ever marry you. You're just a cripple. He could hardly breathe because he was so angry. His gut tightened, and he wanted nothing more than to tear the room apart, to rip it to shreds and throw everything out the window. Why did they have so much furniture in there? Why had Luann come all this way only to do everything she could to make him angry? Richard told her that she had no right to act that way in his house. Everything was his and not hers. His heart pounded as he watched her hand with the rock in it, worried that it would disappear. He didn't want to lose something that reminded him so much of his mother. Because he was so focused on the rock, he didn't notice Louise until she said something. Her face was pale, though her nose was red. She must have been outside. Richard noticed that absently as he stared at her for a moment. Louise wouldn't have acted like her sister had to him. At least, he hoped she wouldn't have. But now, anything was possible. Luann was right about one thing. Her sister wasn't going to marry a cripple. Richard forgot about the rock, unwilling to be seen by Louise anymore. Not like this. His chest still heaving, he forced himself out of the room and down the hall. He wheeled himself as quickly as he could to his open door. It wasn't very fast, but no one followed him. Too annoyed to just sit there and do nothing, Richard moved himself in the chair back and forth as he caught his breath. His head hurt, and he tried to think about what had just happened. Chapter 18 The cozy sensation of hiding away from the world within her blankets felt just like old times. Louise had kicked off her shoes and then slipped under her blankets. She tucked them over her head, but left a small opening for the natural light in the room to peek through. Using that, she blindly organized the letters into a neat pile. Then she picked one up and slowly opened it. Her father had meant well even with his strict standards. She knew that. But there were certain things they had disagreed on, and knowing she couldn't be wrong about reading because of how happy it made her, she had spent years smuggling all types of reading material under her blankets. The only thing missing was hearing her father grumble across their little house, complaining about everything and nothing. But Louise was glad that all was quiet. She wasn't certain how much more she could take of her day with all the chaos and noise. All she wanted was to be in a place where everyone was free to do as they wished and got along with one another. And yet, that's not where she was, even after all of her efforts. When the blanket drooped across her face, she twitched her nose and wiggled around to prevent that from happening again. She lay on her side and returned to the letter. To my reader Louise, that is a very large list of books you have read. You must be a voracious reader. I enjoyed your thoughts about Shakespeare's sonnets and would love to hear what you think of his histories. Those are my favorite, for they address the manner of how people should and should not act. Mostly the latter. I must agree upon your concerns for education. As you may imagine, being out in the wild provides even less schooling if you'll pardon the comparison without proof. Fortunately for myself, my parents were avid readers like yourself. When they bought this land, they carried more books than anything else. I'm not certain how they survived, but I am proof that they did for that time. They passed away some years ago. I tell you this now because I believe certain truths should be shared upon an introduction such as ours. This is my third letter to you. And while I'm still unclear of everything I should write, I do know I desire to be honest with you, more than anything. My parents left my brother, 
and me a good home with a large ranch in the valley. It may look nothing like a city, but the view is magnificent. If you are ever able to travel this way, I will show you how beautiful the wilderness can be. Not only is it colorful in the spring, but it is glorious in the winter and wonderful in the autumn. The summer is only average, so do not come then. As I believe I mentioned in my second letter, Jacob is my younger brother. We live here in this large house with Mrs. Pennyworth. She is our housekeeper. There isn't that much work for her to do always, but she keeps herself busy and keeps us fed. She used to travel here from town, but after our parents passed, I invited her to join us. We could use the company, and I always worried for her safety. I think she would like you. And my brother Jacob, you sound both intelligent and kind in your letters. I cannot help but already look forward to your response. There is much about you that I would still like to learn. Did you enjoy your studies as a child? How is it growing up with two sisters? What does Louisiana look like in the spring? And I believe we are on friendly enough terms for me to ask if it is the state you were named after. You know I must have noted that by now. But, of course, if you wish not to answer, I will respect your choices. I only hope you will take up the tedious task to write me again. Letter writing is not my forte, but I am willing to put in the effort if you will have me. Until next time, Richard. That was one of her favorite letters. Louise rubbed at her eyes as she was torn between laughing and tearing up. She had giggled for days upon receiving that letter. She could hear his humor in his words between the gentleness. There was something about the man that struck her with the desire to meet him. It was then that Louise supposed that perhaps a marriage like this could work, that she could go off and marry someone whom she had yet to meet. If he was anything like the manner in which he wrote his letters, Louise was certain she would have a happy life. And yet, she murmured to herself. She sniffled and set the letter down to read another. The more she read, the more Louise grew bewildered. Richard had been so cheerful in his letters. Even in speaking of his past hardships, he had been optimistic and grateful for the opportunities to grow. Now, she wondered where all of that had gone. Richard's joy was gone. She couldn't even feel the adoration she had felt certain she had for the man any longer. In the last couple of days, Everything had changed, and she didn't like it. Louise worked through two more letters before she returned to that first one. It might have been one of her favorites. She devoured the words, craving the feelings that had struck her the first time she had ever read the letter. If only she could go back to that day and relive the thrill that had run up and down her spine. She was brushing a finger against his signature when there was a knock at her door. Louise paused. The letter was set down carefully, and she peeked her face out of the blanket. It didn't sound like Mrs. Pennyworth. The woman would have called out her name or immediately peeked her head in. The housekeeper wasn't very patient. But it wasn't Mrs. Pennyworth. Another knock. Louise, I know you're in there. A breath escaped her lips before she remembered how annoyed she was at her sister. Shifting in the bed, she turned towards the door and reluctantly called out. Come in then, she said. Luann opened the door, leaning against it as she appeared. She wore her dramatic pout before she sighed and rolled her shoulder. I was wondering if you were crying. What would you have done if I was? Louise furrowed her brow. As comforting as it was to have a familiar face so far from home, it wasn't doing much to bring a smile to her face. She couldn't remember the last time Luann had comforted her. Sure enough, her older sister shrugged. I don't know, but I wouldn't blame you. I know that much. After all, you did end up here. With him. 
Louise slowly sat up. Peering up at her sister, she rolled back the blankets to sit up, but made sure to hide the letters. She didn't want anyone else reading them. That gave her a minute to collect her thoughts as she considered what her sister had just said, how she had ended up there with him. Louise supposed Luann meant Richard. What do you mean? she asked finally, not looking to play games. Luann wrinkled her nose. You certainly have bad luck. Coming out here in the middle of nowhere to find a handsome man only for him to suddenly be trapped in a ridiculous chair. That's not a nice thing to say, Louise frowned. Luann, please. Her sister put her hands up in defense. What? I'm only saying. I just think it's funny. You thought you'd what? Ride into the sunset like all your silly little stories end? What did you expect? I expected a pleasant trip with my sister, Louise countered calmly. She had never liked to be teased. In the last couple of years or so, Luann had really turned her attitude up a notch. Once, it was playful. Now, there was a pit forming in her stomach. She sighed and shook her head. Just say whatever it is you want to, then let me be. Luann sighed loudly once more. Just think of it. You'll be able to sit on his lap whenever you like. Only I suppose you'll need to be reaching for the high shelves. Perhaps father will give you a stepping stool for your wedding? Is that all? Louise smiled tightly. Any short jokes? Unmanly jokes? Her sister scoffed. You're so grumpy these days, but I suppose you never could take a joke. That'll make your relationship difficult, won't it? It's hard to keep a light heart when you're marrying a cripple. Louise bit her tongue and tried to remain calm. Please, Luann, that's a cruel word. It's just a shame. That's all I'm saying. You're going to marry a cripple, I can tell. You would stay here and marry him even after what just happened, after his fall and after he shouted at me. He's a cripple now and he will always be a cripple. He can't ever do anything again. Why, he'll never even be able to take a walk with you outside or anything. She refused to deal with this anymore. Louise didn't care what Luann must be going through to act in such a manner but she had to stop. Louise climbed out of bed and crossed her arms. I'm done talking to you. Leave or I will make you. After a groan and a roll of her eyes, Luann grudgingly obeyed. She closed the door as she left while muttering something under her breath about attitudes. Louise didn't care. She was done with her sister for the time being. She needed time alone and away from everyone to think and come to her senses. Returning to her bed, her eyes caught sight of the letters peeking out from the blankets. Louise could still remember the rush of butterflies she would get upon receiving every letter. Everything Richard had written would make her smile. Climbing back onto the mattress, she couldn't help the niggling doubt that Luann might be right. It was perfectly reasonable that Richard would forever be in his chair. Would she marry him? Upon her arrival, she was ready. But lately, she wasn't so certain, not with the way he had treated her. Her heart pounded at the thought of marrying a man who could never be able to do anything with her. No, she told herself adamantly. No, you don't know what might happen. You can't know the future. Perhaps he will walk again. Even if he doesn't, that doesn't mean it's the end of his life. There is still so much one could do. There has to be. As she picked up the letter on top and slowly reread her favorite letter, her eyes paused on one section. He had talked about showing her around the ranch, and that's what they had started out doing upon her arrival. He had to be able to still go outside. An idea came to mind, and she straightened up. Slowly, the idea began to build within her. It was a tricky idea, but Louise believed it could work. The pieces came together so perfectly 
that it had to be possible. Richard would have to be cheered up with it. The only problem was that it meant she would have to talk to Jacob. Chapter 19 Pulling his jacket tighter around him, Jacob glanced around warily before returning his attention to the fence. One of the posts had grown loose and was knocked aside by one of the cattle. Though he couldn't prove it, such a matter had happened before. All it needed was another hole dug and better mud support to fix the problem. Work was usually a helpful distraction from everything happening up at the ranch house. He could focus on what he could control and use his time effectively. Jacob knew he could make a difference in that matter and get the work done, especially if this meant Richard would no longer be able to do his share. Jacob couldn't help but find it ironic. Yes, his brother was a cripple who could no longer stand or do much of anything on his own any longer. It severely limited his opportunities for work and societal interaction, but that meant Jacob had to pick up the slack. He shook his head. Life was never going to be perfect. That much had been made clear every year when Richard had received new gifts for Christmas, and he had received the used materials because he was smaller, but not anymore. As he worked, he pondered about what the future might hold in store for them, what could happen moving forward, and what he could do about it. His parents had raised him to take action. They had said there was always work to be done and matters to take into hand. Soon the post was back in the cold, hard ground. Sweat dripped down his nose from the exertion. Jacob was surprised he had managed to do that much within the season. For extra measure, he kicked more snow around the post. That would hopefully freeze the ground and keep the post from moving again until spring. With any luck, it wouldn't move again until he wanted it to. He stepped back to admire his accomplished work, breathing hard. Wisps of white, frosty air appeared before him to remind him of the cold. He would need to slow down for a short while because he was already feeling hot. If he grew too warm and damp, his body wouldn't recognize the chill, and he could start to freeze. He tugged his hat down over his ears, just as he thought he heard his name being called. Jacob paused and slowly turned around to look towards the house. Louise was coming toward him. She wore two thick coats and a hat that left strings dangling around her chin. Her cheeks were bright red and she had forgotten gloves, as she lifted her skirts to hike her way through the snow, at least, Jacob noticed, she was wearing boots. Even as she stumbled, there was something graceful about the young woman. He watched her curiously as he wondered why she was coming back to him. She had changed her mind. Why else would she come out in this weather? Besides, he was far away enough from the house that she would have had to spend some time looking for him. Jacob couldn't help but smirk. The young lady couldn't get enough of him. He questioned if he should demand an apology for the earlier slap or just let it slide. He set his tools down at his feet as he waited for her to reach him. All the while, he enjoyed watching her come closer and closer. Jacob, Louise announced breathlessly once she was close enough. She inhaled deeply and glanced around. When her eyelashes fluttered, he could see frost tinging the edges. I've been looking for you. He shrugged. If I had known, I would have come running. Louise blinked before she pursed her lips. I'm still upset about that kiss, Jacob. That wasn't appropriate. The confidence within him melted away little by little. Jacob frowned. Why not? And why else are you trampling around out here, coming all the way out to see me? It didn't make much sense otherwise. If she had only wanted to talk, she could have waited until he returned. The young lady straightened her shoulders and crossed her arms. I came to tell you that you owe me. I owe you? 
His eyes narrowed. He didn't like the sound of that. Being in anyone's debt left a sour taste in his mouth. Just as he was about to argue her point, Louise nodded. Indeed, and I'm calling on you for a favor. Jacob opened his mouth, then he closed it. He wanted to be mad, but the fire in her eyes was something sweet to behold. If he argued too much, then she would leave him again. This meant his only options were to turn her away or let her stay. If she was truly upset about the kiss, he reasoned to himself. She would still be avoiding him, but there she was, seeking him out in the cold weather. This had to mean that he still had a chance, especially if she wanted something from him. Jacob supposed that meant Richard couldn't give it to her. He opened his mouth again. What kind of favor? That made her eyes light up. It made Jacob want to explain that he hadn't said he would do anything, but that seemed pointless. She immediately dove in, taking a step closer to explain. While Richard might be restricted to a chair, it doesn't mean he must be restricted to the house. There must be something we can do about creating a chair that can work outside as well. With all this snow, perhaps there's something we can create that you can create to allow him to travel outdoors. Jacob's enthusiasm dampened at the sound of his brother's name. He rubbed the back of his neck and fiddled with the collar again as he glanced around the fields. It gave him a moment to think. She was still set on Richard, that much was clear. She wanted him to come outside. That sounded ridiculous. It was dangerous as well, surely, though Jacob decided not to concern himself too much with the dangers, only the problem that it presented, like how he still needed to convince Louise that she didn't belong with Richard. But, he pondered, if he helped her, maybe she would realize how clever he was. By showing his abilities that Richard no longer had, perhaps he could still convince her otherwise. Jacob toyed with his options before he found himself wondering what was on her mind. You mean a chair made for the snow, like a wagon or a sleigh? He rubbed his numb hands together. Nodding, Louise beamed. Yes, or, or you mentioned snowshoes. I don't quite understand those, but, but could those help him? He couldn't even picture it, and so he shook his head. No not with the way he has to distribute his weight. Snowshoes are, they're not made for sliding movement. You need to pick up and move your feet around. It's a lot of work, nothing with wheels either. That won't travel through the snow. Do you have a sleigh? Louise asked after a heartbeat. She bit her lip as she thought about it. But I don't want him to feel like he's in a wagon that much. I can walk, but he needs to be able to move about, like in the chair, you see, with not too much effort. Jacob paused. What do you mean, you can walk? I mean, I can walk beside him as we finish our tour of the ranch, Louise stated. I intend to finish it with Richard. However, I want him to be comfortable, and he shouldn't be restricted merely out of inconvenience. Now, what about a a small sleigh. She wasn't even giving him time to slow down and process everything. Jacob hesitated as he realized that she was requesting his help to spend more time with Richard. While he understood she would desire to be a respectable woman and not turn her attentions away so quickly now that the man she had traveled so far to meet was crippled, she didn't have to try so hard. Jacob shook his head and tried to catch up to where Louise was at. No, just the wagon. A sleigh is different. It doesn't have wheels. If anything, that would be easier for Richard. His chair has wheels to move around inside on a solid surface. To go outside, he should probably have flat skis as well. It would help him on top of the snow. But... That's not something he can control. She shrugged. Why not? 
Trying not to be exasperated, Jacob sighed. A sleigh has horses. It needs something to push or pull it. Skis for humans have poles, and going downhill is easier. Richard would need a way to control his movements. Perhaps if someone pulled or pushed him, but that's a lot of effort. He couldn't use poles from sitting. He couldn't get enough leverage. Louise inhaled sharply. The sleigh. You said sleighs need horses, so Richard can use a horse. Why didn't I think of that before? Yes, a creature he can still use his reins on in order to turn and stop and move about. That would work, would it not? He closed his eyes in an attempt to imagine it. I suppose. But a chair would need to be made or altered to work as a sleigh. It would need to be reinforced for the movement. But the horse, if he's shorter than they are, he can't see over it and the reins won't work. Then we find a smaller horse, Louise reasoned. Her eyes were bright as she nodded eagerly. Yes, a small pony. There must be one we could find for him. She had a point. Jacob nodded slowly as the idea came together. He had studied the chair that Dr. Clapton had fixed for Richard. Adding skis to another chair had to be manageable. He'd worked with wood enough to have some ideas about making it work. Then purchasing a horse was easy enough. Even as Jacob didn't want to help his brother, he realized that this was allowing him time with Louise. If he turned her away, he realized this connection they were building would cease to exist. He wrinkled his nose but forced himself to nod. The two of them slowly started back to the house to get warm again. As they walked, the two of them made their plans. They could purchase a small pony in town and nail in some skis to a chair. It was going to work, and Louise offered to help. That offer made him grin. The more she helped, the more time they would spend together. Certainly, that would be enough to show her that he was the one she should be with, not Richard. Chapter 20 The wind whistled outside of Richard's window. It was Christmas Eve, and there he was in his room, all alone as a crippled man. Slowly he glanced around his room as though to look for relief, but there was none. His bedroom was as it had always been. It carried the necessary furniture, included curtains, and a rug that he no longer could feel beneath his feet. He had reached down to feel it the other day with his hands. But he wasn't interested in doing that again. Though he was closer to the floor on a more frequent basis now, it was a lot harder to get himself up if he had to. Everything was a lot harder now. Just putting on clothes was a tiring process. He glanced at the scarf that Mrs. Pennyworth had insisted he wear that morning, claiming he looked cold. Richard didn't feel cold. There was a shadow creeping over him that was taking away all the feelings he had once clung to. It was a strange sensation, not feeling anything. Slouched in his chair, Richard skirted his gaze back to the window. The wind continued to whistle loudly as though calling for his attention. He could almost remember how it felt on his face, harsh and unfriendly. He was tired of sitting there and doing nothing. Trapped in a chair, Richard could hardly even provide any help in the kitchen. He had attempted to mix the dough ingredients for Mrs. Pennyworth that morning but it had proven more difficult than expected. He was useless. No one would say that out loud, but he could tell they were thinking it, because he was also thinking it. Tired of feeling nothing, his eyes darted around the window as an idea came to mind. He grabbed the wheels of his chair and slowly managed to maneuver himself around in the room. There was enough empty space that nothing blocked him as he headed to his door, opened it, and guided himself into the hall. There you are, Mrs. Pennyworth, 
stepped out of the kitchen. How would you like to help me prepare supper? Above her smile, he could see the pity in her eyes. It immediately annoyed him. He was still Richard. He was still the same person. He just couldn't do what he used to do. There was no need to offer him chores and responsibilities to make him feel normal again. Richard shook his head, not wanting to endure any more time in the kitchen for the day. No, but thank you. I'm heading out. Out? Mrs. Pennyworth couldn't keep the surprise out of her voice. What? How? I mean, why? Richard kept moving down the hall. He worried that if he delayed, he'd end up stuck there forever. The wind was calling him, though, as he itched to feel something. I'll be back soon, he called over his shoulder and continued tugging himself towards the front door. Doors were a lot of work. He had never thought of them before, but now they proved to be inconvenient. Not only did he have to get close enough to wrap his hand around the doorknob, which usually meant him banging into the door, but then he had to pull himself back with one arm and open with the other. In the hall, he could do it to the side to get into his bedroom, but this door started in the narrow hall and forced him to open it however he could. Either way, he managed to open it and glanced outside once the door was open completely. The wind welcomed him in a frozen wave of cold air. It hit him sharply in the face, stinging his eyes and burning his lips. Richard tugged the scarf tighter around his neck. Then he carefully tugged his wheelchair out into the frosty morning air. Richard had always enjoyed their large porch. It wrapped around the entire house, with posts climbing up to the overhang every couple of feet. He remembered using sandpaper on them as a boy, making them as smooth as possible until his mother ran a finger across them and smiled. It had been a long time since he had thought about that smile. Once, it had been able to warm him to his soul. Richard remembered missing it more than experiencing it. He sighed and set himself beside the rocking chair to admire the view. To his left was the grove of trees that his father had planted many years ago. He could see the brown creeping through the blanket of white. The trail where he had taken his fall was just a little further on. The barn blocked him from seeing all the way down the lane. That building was only a couple hundred yards ahead of him but now it was practically miles away. Richard gripped the armrests of his seat. He thought about his horse and the other animals. He thought about the cattle roundup from the other week. Then there were mending the fences, tending the animals, and a hundred other chores he could no longer help out with. It's a strange place. When he glanced around, Richard realized he wasn't alone. There was Luann sitting on the rocking chair. His body invariably tensed as he remembered their last conversation. She must have followed him out a moment ago when he hadn't noticed. Call it what you will, he said after a moment. It's home. Not my home, she reminded him as she tugged the blanket on her lap closer. But... It looks like my sister and your brother are enjoying it. His eyes flitted up to see what she was talking about. It took him a minute before he found what she was referring to. To the right of the barn, half a mile away, two small figures stood together. Something dark surged up his spine. He recognized his brother's dark brown jacket. It wouldn't have been anyone else. Richard squinted with a frown, wondering what was going on. They were awfully close. He wished they were closer so he could hear what they were talking about, if they were laughing and smiling. His stomach churned, and he let out a huff. The moment he had turned weak, the young woman turned to someone else, on Christmas Eve no less. He watched the figures move, 
they walked together towards the barn. Richard grew antsy, feeling coming back into his body and mind. But he wanted none of it. He was supposed to be the one out there with Louise, not Jacob. And yet, he couldn't be out there. More than anything, Richard realized he was disgusted with himself. I bet they're talking about you. Luann yawned. Maybe even courting behind your back. My sister certainly received many letters before she came here. Who's to say they all came from you? No one. Richard found himself responding to her question unwillingly. The young woman glanced back at him, but he kept his gaze straight ahead. What a poor fool you are, and you almost had her. Oh, well, at least Louise has an option now, don't you think? Oh, he bit his tongue. She turned to him from the chair, leaning over as though she were about to share a secret. But Luann didn't whisper as she said loudly, Yes, now she has Jacob as an option. No one wants to marry a cripple after all. Now she can marry a real man. His stomach churned as he watched Jacob open the barn door for Louise. Richard slouched in his seat, the anger slipping away. There was no reason to be angry because there was nothing he could do about his situation. Luann had said what he had already been thinking. Even as he wanted Louise to himself, he realized there was nothing he could do about it. What kind of man would he be to ask a beautiful young lady like herself to spend the rest of her life with a useless man in a chair? You're right, he said faintly. The rocking chair creaked. Oh? Luann's eyes widened in surprise, not having expected him to agree. She leaned back to take in his reaction. He would be a terrible person to attempt any relationship with Louise or with anyone else. That chair of his would keep him a single man for the rest of his life, if he could even consider himself a man anymore. His heart sunk lower into his chest, his heartbeat slowing down in disgust for his future. There was no way he could run the ranch any more without being able to see what was happening. No more riding horses, traveling through the valley or raising the cattle. Richard couldn't do anything. As much as the ranch needed a woman, he couldn't have one. Perhaps it would be best if Louise did turn to Jacob. A sour taste filled his mouth. It was a sacrifice but one he knew he had to make. A strong union like that was just what the ranch needed. In order to keep the ranch thriving, it needed more support. He had already known Louise would be the perfect addition. That was a fact he had known for quite some time, back when they were just beginning to correspond with one another through letters. Louise was intelligent, kind, and bright. From the moment she had arrived, Richard had known of her potential there. He had hoped to share his future with her. He dropped his hands into his lap. They couldn't hang by his sides any longer because the armrests were in the way. It was a small change, but it bugged him. He would never get to walk with his arms down by his sides again. Richard glanced at his hands and shook his head. Luann tutted. They're dirty, aren't they? Being stuck in that chair certainly comes with unprecedented problems. Life came with unprecedented problems. His eyes flickered over to meet hers as he wondered what was going on in her head. Her sarcastic nature was fairly bitter. He hadn't noticed as much at the beginning, but now he understood her clearly, almost as if he understood the bitterness himself. Swallowing, he shrugged. We all must endure our own trials. She narrowed her gaze at him before eventually shrugging and turning back around to look out at the world before them. The young lady sighed loudly and burrowed deeper under her blanket. But she appeared to be done talking, and for that he was grateful. There was enough on his mind to consider. 
and his parents had raised him to speak of good things, not ill. Luan could use some practice in making conversation, but he wasn't ready to offer his services. Instead, Richard followed her gaze out onto the land before them. It was a view he had seen for the majority of his life. Now he was at a different angle, one he hadn't been at since he was a young boy. He didn't care for it, but he didn't have a choice. The view he kept turning back to included that of Jacob and Louise. They made a fine-looking couple from a distance. Richard bit his tongue and tried to imagine the conversation he would need to have with her soon to tell her to turn to Jacob and not him. He was only a cripple, after all, a cripple who could hardly make it through the door. When his brother and the young lady turned towards the house, Richard did the same. Heading inside, he returned to the quiet corner where his room sat in the house. He didn't want to speak to them yet. All he wanted was some time alone to think and to wallow. There was little else he could do from his chair after all. Chapter 21 Now, Jacob's thoughtful expression faded into a frown as he looked at her hopeful expression. Louise could hardly believe the man. He was constantly switching up his moods to either be helpful or detrimental in their conversations and as they began to make plans. She nodded furiously. Of course. Why not now? But it's Christmas Eve, he shrugged. Why not next week? Her eyes widened at the idea of delaying for so long. Next week? Because it's days away. Why should we sentence Richard to the house for all those days when he could be spending time out on his ranch? Our ranch, he muttered and shook his head. It's our ranch, and he can wait. When he stepped to the side to get around her, Louise copied to block his path. But it's Christmas, she told him pointedly. We treat each other well during the holidays. Think of the Savior, would you, of our God. That made him hesitate. Her heart leapt hopefully as she could see in his eyes that he was thinking about it. Standing just outside the house, Louise tried not to shiver as a cold wind blew past her. She wrapped her fingers together and blew on them as she waited for Jacob to respond. His eyes darted past her towards the barn. He worked his jaw as he mulled over the idea. They both knew she was attempting to guilt him into this. Now she had to see if it would work. Fine, Jacob agreed in resignation. Find some gloves and a better hat. I'll saddle the horses. Louise brightened up with a broad smile. Wonderful. Yes, yes, of course. The man before her sighed wearily and waved her off as he managed to skirt around her and started walking towards the barn. His shoulders were hunched as he carried his box of tools on his way. There was not an ounce of excitement within him. She didn't mind. He had agreed to help. The man owed her, and he owed his brother. Louise didn't know what to expect about their ride into town, but she was certain it would work out well. It had to. Turning towards the house, Louise hurried. It was freezing cold. Even as she blinked, she could feel her eyelashes freezing. Jacob had a point that she needed gloves and a better hat. It was too small for her head and wouldn't tie properly any longer. What kind of plans are you kids making? Louise jerked up to find her older sister tucked into a ball under a blanket as she sat on one of the rocking chairs. She tightened her grip on the railing, praying she didn't slip. Louisiana never had weather like this, and so she wasn't quite used to it. She turned her attention to her sister as she carefully climbed up the steps. Her heart skipped an anxious beat. Plans? How did you know we were making plans? Her sister narrowed her eyes. What else would you be doing? Exchanging secrets? Luann shrugged. 
or exchanging kisses? Either option. The words trailed off with meaning that Louise didn't understand. She reached the porch to shrug. What about them? You're wrong, just in case you desired to know. Then Louise hesitated, reminding herself she didn't want to start a new argument. She shook her head and sighed. Jacob and I are going into town if you care to join us. We'll be leaving in a moment. And she went inside before Luann could respond. Mrs. Pennyworth, Louise called as she shook the snow out of her hair. She adjusted her jacket, dropped the hat, and rubbed her hands as she trotted down the hall towards the kitchen. Mrs. Pennyworth? The woman turned as she opened the door to the kitchen. Yes, dear. Louise offered a quick smile. Jacob and I are going to make a trip into town. Would you perhaps have a hat I could borrow, along with gloves if you don't mind? As she talked, the older woman made her way around the kitchen to her and frowned. My dear, your hands. Were you just outside? You're nearly frozen. Why would you want to go into town now, with Jacob? It wasn't judgmental, like Luann, only confusion. Louise appreciated that. We're finding Richard a gift, she said in a loud whisper. A thrill ran up her spine. She was certain Richard would appreciate her idea. It'll be a short trip, I'm sure. The woman glanced out the window warily. It was a white wonderland out there with little else to see. Even the sky was so white that it blended in with the ground. Mrs. Pennyworth shook her head. I won't tell you no, but I will say I think that's silly. But come along, I'll find something to keep you warm. Another blanket or two would do nicely, I'm sure. This way, then, to the closets. Louise followed closely behind, still blowing warmth into her chilled hands. She kept her eyes out for Richard and could hardly stop smiling. Hope beat proudly in her chest as she continued thinking about the right little horse that they would find for their project. Soon, the housekeeper had found her a much thicker hat, a cozy scarf, and gloves that were too large but would keep her warm all the same. Mrs. Pennyworth helped her back outside onto the porch, where they found Jacob nearby with two saddled horses. I'm not a very good rider, Louise said, biting her lip. Jacob waved his arm to her. Then I'll tie the bridle to my horse. Come along. We don't want to be out after dark. Or did you change your mind? Her eyes narrowed. Of course not. Louise glanced around to see if her sister was still watching, but the chair was empty, and there was no blanket left there. Luann must have returned inside where it was warmer. Louise shivered before she forced herself to nod. Being inside beside a fire sounded much lovelier than being outside. The wind whipped around her like dull knives pressing against her skin but she still forced herself forward, out into the cold, where Jacob helped her onto the horse. She inhaled sharply as she clung clumsily to the saddle horn as the bridle was taken and tied to the next horse. And then they were on their way. Jacob kept them at a smooth trot through the cold, along the edge of the trail so they crunched through the snow instead of the slippery ice. It took Louise several minutes until she felt comfortable enough to look around at the landscape before her. Oklahoma was even lovelier than she could have imagined. Louise tucked the scarf up higher to cover her nose and hide her smile. There was something magical about being in a world of white. It made her want to laugh and dance until she grew dizzy. Louise was so lost in her thoughts of wonder that she hardly noticed the time passing. Soon, they had made it into the blustery town where few people moved about in such windy weather. She could feel the wind stealing away her breath, but it only amazed her more. I'll help you down, Jacob shouted as he climbed off his horse. She hadn't realized the weather was loud until then. 
Give me your arms. He grabbed her around the waist and set her down. Louise felt her feet sink in the snow and grinned. Good. Let's find that horse, shall we? Ignoring his hesitance, she marched forward to the building she assumed was the stables. One door was open, so she stepped through. Moving to the right, Louise stayed out of the way as Jacob led the horses into the shelter. She followed him as he patted the horses down. There's always oats there, Jacob mumbled through his scarf. Her eyes fell upon a nearby bucket. With a nod, she obeyed and fed the horses. Only once both animals were happily settled did Jacob straighten up and find the stable master, Jed. Jed ended up being a tall, thin man with a raspy voice. Louise's eyes wandered around the large barn with all the stalls as the two men talked. It was a fascinating place, she decided. She'd never been surrounded by so many horses before. She leaned over one railing and watched a fold doze, wondering if they dreamed. Louise, she jerked up. Her boots squeaked as she turned toward Jacob, who waved her over to them. The two men motioned over to a corner stall where she curiously stepped up and glanced over. It was a larger door than one she could lean on, one made for taller horses. But it was not a tall horse behind the door. A gasp of delight invariably left her lips as Louise stared at the shaggy blonde pony before her, hardly the height of her shoulder, she couldn't remember finding anything half as sweet as the little creature. It's beautiful, she announced. It's ours, Jacob corrected her. Good disposition, that one, Jed drawled with a pipe in his mouth. Was a gift for the mayor's daughter. Only she wanted a real horse, I suppose. Louise counted that their blessing. She turned to them with a broad smile. It's a Christmas miracle, then. She was still smiling as Jacob checked out the pony, prepared all three animals, and led them all the way back to their house. Louise's cheeks ached from the cold and smiling, but she couldn't help herself. All she wanted to see was Richard light up again like he had in her letters. Surely this would do the trick. No, no. Louise shook her head when Jacob tried to put their new pony into a stall, up to the house, just for a moment. She doesn't even need to go on the porch, only close enough for him to see. The dubious look she received in return still didn't dampen her enthusiasm. Louise's heart skipped a beat as she took the lead up to the house wanting to make sure she could bring Richard out to see his early Christmas gift. It was perfect. Louise felt certain of this. Richard would see the world open up before him with unlimited opportunities. They could go out for strolls, and he could finish showing her all around the ranch he loved so much. Whatever frustration he had felt before would fade and everyone would be cheerful again. Hello? Richard, Louise scampered over to his bedroom door, breathless with anticipation. She heard movement. What is it? It's me, she leaned against the door. Louise, I, I have a gift for you. Would you come out here? I mean outside, just for a moment. Though she thought she heard something else, Louise couldn't be certain. She bit her lip and waited until she was certain there was the creaking of floorboards. Taking a step back, she tugged her scarf away from her face and grinned as Richard eventually opened his door. Come along, she invited him. She was too excited to say anything more. Louise walked quickly, realized her mistake of going too fast, and turned back to him, committing the same mistake repeatedly all the way to the door. Louise grabbed the doorknob and then sneaked a look outside to make sure Jacob still had the pony with him. He gave her a short wave and ushered her to move faster. So she opened the door completely and jumped out onto the porch to make way for Richard. Surprise! 
she cried out as she clapped. Slowly, she watched Richard roll his chair out the door. He glanced at her warily and then over at his brother. Jacob didn't wave again, but he did bring the pony closer to the first step of the porch. The pony dropped her head to consider the stairs. Then she licked up a pile of snow with her long tongue. Louise grinned. Isn't she wonderful? It's a pony, Richard stated. Realizing he wasn't smiling, Louise's eagerness froze. I, yes, yes, Richard, it's a pony. Louise suddenly panicked because she hadn't explained to him why there was another horse on their ranch. Oh, right. Louise hurried over to his side and down a step to gesture. She's a much smaller horse, but she's strong, too. Jacob is going to build you a, a new chair that will allow you to travel over the snow. And this pony will drive you. You'll have your very own sleigh. Isn't that wonderful? There's so much more we can do now. What do you think? Louise turned back to Richard hopefully, praying in her heart that this was the solution they were looking for. Everyone deserved happiness. And if someone like Richard needed help finding it, she wanted to do whatever it took to give him some joy. Chapter 22 A Pony, A Sleigh Any hesitation Jacob might have had at an earlier time about this idea was immediately confirmed when he heard the tone that Richard was using. He had hardly ever heard it before. He had used it often enough himself, however. His grip tightened on the pony's reins. When he glanced up to the porch, he realized Louise hadn't understood the disgust in Richard's voice yet. It made his heart pound. Everything she had hoped for was about to come crashing down, and she didn't even realize it yet. She started to say something, but Jacob didn't hear it over the loud wind. He turned his head to avoid a sudden cold front. Bringing the pony closer to the steps, he heard his brother interrupt Louise. But there's no point, Richard told her. This was a waste of money. That's what you two spent your time doing today? Running around town together to find a ridiculous horse? I can't believe either of you thought this was a good idea. Louise took a step back. We were only hoping to help you. Does it look like you can help me? You're just trying to kill me. Now that I can't move around the ranch, you're trying to patronize me. And on Christmas? It's pathetic. This was all a mistake. You wasted your time and you wasted our money. It's insulting. Richard had hardly said anything cruel in all the time Jacob had known him. And that was all of his life. He stared slack-jawed at his brother, who was hunched over in the chair. The young man had become a completely different person in just a week. He didn't even recognize him anymore. When his eyes turned to Louise, he found a flash of her hair and skirt disappearing inside as she ran off. He didn't know what to do. Jacob was stunned with what had just happened. His brother had never spoken so cruelly to someone like that, especially someone like Louise. As he tried to think back, Richard had always had justification about anything negative, he said. If the winter was ruining their crops, then his brother could grow a little moody because every attempt to save them was futile. But Jacob couldn't recall Richard ever speaking like that to anyone. Richard... He searched for his voice, but his brother shook his head and turned back inside. This left Jacob out in the snow, his numb fingers clutching the reins of a pony munching happily away on the snow. It was a shaggy little creature with enough hair to keep it from growing cold. He glanced down and frowned. There was little to do with the animal if Richard refused to work with it. Sighing, he turned from the house towards the barn. It was beginning to snow again, and he didn't want to stay out there any longer than he had to, and he'd stayed out longer than he had to. 
come on then, he muttered to the pony and tugged lightly on the reins. The pony obeyed easily and trotted alongside him as they returned to the barn. It was strange brushing down such a small animal and rather uncomfortable as his back ached. But soon, Jacob was headed back to the house. As he trampled through the snow, he had enough time to think over the incident that had just occurred with his brother. There had been a lot on his mind lately about the entirety of the accident, and it was time that the two of them talked. Jacob stomped his way inside, attempting to shake all the snow off. The boots came off, the jacket and scarf came off, and then he set his hat on the rack before locking the door and heading down the hall. He cleared his throat and rubbed his cheeks to get the cold out. He peeked into the parlor to see if Richard was hiding out there, but it was empty, his bedroom then. Jacob continued down the long hallway and then knocked on the door. I'm sleeping. It almost brought a grin to Jacob's face, almost. I'm coming in, he announced in a low voice. When he stepped through the door, he found Richard wheeling himself around in his chair from the window across the room. Jacob was pretty sure his brother had the larger room, and yet the man had never taken advantage of it. All these years later, there was hardly anything in there. His eyes skirted the familiar pieces of furniture before flitting over to the curtains. They used to be in their parents' room, lace ones that their mother had made when she was married. He swallowed, pushing back the familiar feeling of heartache, and stared down at his brother. He wanted to glory in such a feeling. But then he thought of Louise's hopeful face before she had fled. You have to give Louise's idea a chance, Jacob told his brother bluntly. As he said the words out loud, it came to his attention that he might be accidentally bringing Louise and Richard back together if his brother obeyed his demand. He closed the door behind him as he considered leaving, but he couldn't do it. He couldn't stand to see Louise disappointed after her hopes had grown so high. Whatever it took to make Louise happy, he had to be willing to do it. Richard scoffed. It pulled Jacob from his thoughts. There was a new wrinkle between Richard's brows. His shoulders were hunched as he rested his elbows on the arms of his chair. The man's hair fell in his eyes and only gave him a more brooding look. That new look did little for him. Richard looked much better with his shoulders straight, his hair combed, and a smile on his lips. Whoever this new version of him was, Jacob didn't like it. I don't have to do anything, Richard corrected him. Perhaps the fall had caused head damage. Jacob stared at his brother as he attempted to comprehend what was going on within Richard's head. Surely it couldn't make sense. It had to be a jumble of strange ideas because the golden child had rarely been so petulant. He really was a child. You're an idiot, Jacob said. Richard furrowed his brow. And you're rude. Go away, would you? Play with your new pony. No, Jacob said vehemently as he took a step forward. It's your pony. We got it for you and you're going to use it. You're going to try out Louise's idea if I have to carry you outside. His hands balled into fists as a surge of frustration flooded over his shoulders. He had never wanted to hit Richard more than in that moment. His brother stared at him with a frown. You're not going to carry me. But he didn't sound as confident as he had a minute ago. Jacob took another step toward him. I will if I have to. And you know what else? You're going to take her on that tour. You're going to be nice to her, and you're going to have a good time. You can't force me to have a nice time, Richard pointed out. Oh, I will, Jacob assured him. One way or another, I will. He paused as he noticed his hands were shaking. He shook his head before glaring at his brother again. You upset Louise. I've never seen you be so stupid, he continued. 
He could hardly believe the words were coming out of his mouth. But as he thought of Louise, he just wanted to bring that smile onto her face. And if it took Richard to make it happen, Jacob was willing to ensure Richard made it happen. Richard gripped his wheels tightly. He started forward, but the bed blocked them, and he would have to take care of more turning to get closer to his brother. So he stopped where he was. Don't call me stupid, but you are, Jacob pointed out. You have a beautiful woman trying to make you happy. You're an idiot for letting a good woman like that go. What, did you think scolding and shaming her would make her fall in love with you? You upset her. His brother threw up his arms. If you're so bothered, then you take care of her. I'm just trying to help, he inhaled in frustration. Or better yet, Richard talked as though he hadn't been interrupted. If you like her so much, then you go and marry her. Jacob took a step back in surprise. Stunned, he stared at his brother. Did Richard know what he had been thinking when the young woman first arrived? Did he really mean it? Where had that familiar optimism gone? Yeah, Richard leaned back in his chair with pursed lips. I've noticed. I told you I'm not stupid. He didn't know what to say. Thoughts clouded. Jacob only recognized the small stab of guilt that was rising up through his throat. Words were about to come out. He finally noticed the weight on his shoulders for what it was. Hoping he could ease the contention between them, Jacob swallowed and licked his chapped lips. I... I'm sorry. I shouldn't have. But if you do this, I won't stand in your way any longer. I've done enough damage. Because I think... He wiped his brow. I think that chair is my fault. Richard jerked his head up. What? I don't think... I was distracted and mad, so I don't think... I don't think I tightened Sock's saddle as much. I don't remember. I was angry. You have everything, Richard. You always have. The ranch is yours. That horse is yours. And now, Louise, you have everything anyone could ever want. The words spilled out awkwardly. They tasted bitter on his tongue, so he spat them out as fast as he could. Rubbing the back of his neck, he shrugged and stammered. And now, you're being an idiot. You could still have all of it. And you don't even want it. Richard shook his head slowly. Get out, Jacob. I said I'm sorry, Jacob started. Get out, his brother bellowed. The volume caught him off guard. Jacob had never been yelled at by his brother before. He was so startled that he immediately obeyed. Breathless, he made his way out and hurried off to his own room. He stood breathless behind his door, one hand still on the knob. His heart pounded furiously, pulsing loudly in his ears. Jacob couldn't hear anything else as he attempted to comprehend what had just happened. It had been a mistake. That's what he had told himself when the accident took place. Surely it hadn't been his fault. If anything, it could only be Richard's fault for falling. And horses were wily creatures. But the more Jacob thought about it, he wasn't certain he'd fixed the saddle properly. One had to buckle it and then elbow the horse's ribs to make sure the animal wasn't swallowing extra air to make it loose. Richard had no reason to fall. He was a fine rider. If it had been the weather and ice, the horse would have slipped and been injured as well. So if it wasn't Richard and if it wasn't the horse, it had to be the saddle that brought them both down. A lump formed in his throat. It wasn't my fault, Jacob tried to tell himself, but he didn't believe it. He swallowed hard as he stumbled back onto his bed and rubbed his eyes. Life wasn't supposed to go like this. He wanted his brother to have his comeuppance, but it was beginning to come at too high of a price. Louise had been upset after trying desperately hard to please Richard, and Richard wanted none of that. 
Jacob wished there was someone who cared enough for him like that, but he didn't want to be so heartless as to ruin a budding relationship. He didn't mean to ruin everything for everyone. Besides, even if he had received his comeuppance, Richard was supposed to be more positive about the situation. That's who he was supposed to be. Jacob didn't like the new version of his brother and hated the idea of being stuck with him like that. Running his hands through his hair, he tried to think about what he could do, but then he worried that he had done enough. Chapter 23 Richard breathed in and he breathed out. His heart hammered loudly in his chest so much that it almost hurt him. Everything hurt, and yet he could feel nothing. He opened his eyes and noticed his hands were shaking. They gripped the arms of his chair so tightly that his knuckles turned white. Nothing made sense anymore. He was tired and wide awake. He couldn't feel anything, but he could feel everything. He bit his tongue and couldn't decide what the sensation meant. It took him several minutes to pull himself together. You're going crazy he murmured to himself a few minutes later. Richard shook his head and took another deep breath. He closed his eyes until he could no longer feel his heart pulsing in his head. It took a few more minutes before he finally opened his eyes to look around his room. Nothing had changed, but his chest still felt tight. He rubbed it lightly as his gaze turned to the door. It was still closed from when Jacob had left. His brother Jacob, the traitor, the schemer. He didn't know how he could have been so blind. It was Jacob's fault he was stuck in this chair. Now he was a useless lump of flesh, no longer a man, all because his brother had been irresponsible. And those excuses, those faulty excuses, the ranch was not his, especially now that he was trapped inside the house with nothing he could do about the fields or cattle. Louise was not his. She was only in the way now and was ridiculing him by bringing a pony onto the ranch. The horse, Richard supposed Jacob meant his own prized horse, was only a horse, and now useless since he could no longer ride. Everything that Jacob complained didn't belong to him now could, just what he had probably wanted and what he had intended all along. Richard wondered how he hadn't seen it coming. A stinging sensation reached his hips. Grasping the arms of his chair, he flinched and gripped them tight. The doctor had warned him such pain and irritation was bound to come and go, but it didn't make the unease any better. Richard tried to focus on something else. He knew his brother could be moody and private and occasionally unhappy, but he hadn't expected Jacob to be like that, to be so cruel as to cause an accident like this. Glancing down at his useless bottom half, his lip curled. Soon, he was going to shrivel up into nothing. He could feel it within him, no longer a young man in his prime, but a shell of what could have been. Richard was going to be nothing, just like Jacob must have wanted. The hair on the back of his neck prickled. It itched, so he rubbed his neck again out of irritation. That only bothered his neck more. Ducking his head down, Richard wondered how he was supposed to live life like this when he was so frustrated. This can't be the rest of my life, he scowled to himself but he didn't see any way out of it. There was no cure for a cripple. His fingers dug into his neck as someone knocked on his door. What? he called out. Though he didn't mean to sound so angry, Richard didn't apologize as Mrs. Pennyworth ducked her head in to see him. She offered a smile, her frizzy hair spilling around her features. It made her look a little younger than her age of 50 or so years. He wasn't certain how old she was. Perhaps she had never told them. 
It's supper time, the housekeeper reminded him. Come join us. I've made quite a feast for everyone. The thought of joining everyone around the supper table only brought dread. No, I'm not hungry. Her smile faded slightly. Richard, you haven't yet joined us at the table. Don't you think it's time? I'm sure the other ladies would appreciate your company. That made him laugh. Who would want his company? Jacob, his careless brother. Louise, a foolish woman. Luann, who was disgusted by him. Only Mrs. Pennyworth would say such a lie with conviction. She wasn't picky about her company. I don't think so. Richard shook his head at her. Let's not waste our time. The woman furrowed her brow at him. Is everything all right? I heard you and Jacob earlier. I hope the two of you aren't back to your childish ways with the silent treatment and teasing. She had never taken his anger or his frustration seriously. It came across as belittling when she ignored him like this. Richard gritted his teeth as he searched for the right words to scold her for her own actions. As their housekeeper, she had no right to talk to him like that. We're not children anymore, Richard reminded her as his voice rose. I would appreciate it, Mrs. Pennyworth, if you didn't treat us in such a manner. Is that understood? The older woman's eyes widened. As she straightened up before him, her mouth opened and closed but no sound came out. Instead, the door opened wider as Jacob pushed it open. He stood tall in the doorway, his broad shoulders taking up much of the space behind Mrs. Pennyworth. The woman whirled around in surprise, mumbling something under her breath. Richard felt something in his spine tingle. It felt like pinches running up and down his spine. He gritted his teeth in annoyance twitching to try and be comfortable, but it was hard to find comfort when trapped in a chair. Turning back to those invading his room, he tried to block out the irritation. What's going on here? Jacob frowned as he glanced down at the smaller woman. She tried to smile. It's all right, dear. I was only inviting Richard to join us for supper. It's nearly ready, and I wanted to set a place for him. We miss him at the table, of course, and... But Richard was tired of the lies. He was tired of them pitying him in that manner. There was an itch in his back that made him want to cringe as Mrs. Pennyworth tried to explain herself. Any explanation would only sound more and more ridiculous. That's enough, Richard told her. I've missed supper before, and I'll miss supper again. Just bring me my food here instead. Is that so much to ask? Jacob's frown deepened. Richard, there's no need to talk to Mrs. Pennyworth that way. As he talked, the younger brother stepped forward to tuck the woman behind him. That was a protective action if Richard had ever seen one. Had he missed something between them? He wondered if they had been planning something like this before in the past. Gripping his seat, he tried to roll forward but ran into the bed. His foot caught on the edge, sending searing pain through his nerves. It should have stayed in his toes, but he felt something again in his spine. He shouted out in frustration. Just get out of here, he ordered them. Mrs. Pennyworth obeyed. He could hear her footsteps trotting down the hall, but Jacob stayed in the doorway, his arms hanging loose at his sides. There was a strange look across his face that Richard realized must symbolize regret. Jacob had little experience in such a state, so Richard decided he couldn't trust his brother. And you, Richard added through gritted teeth, I don't want you in here. And I don't want to be here, Jacob put out both hands in a defensive stance. But you can't keep treating everyone like this. You can't take your anger out on everyone. All of a sudden, his brother had become self-righteous. It was nearly laughable. Since when? Who are you to say? You, the one who has mocked my every endeavor with mail-order brides? You, 
who just confessed to ruining my life? Richard winced as another jolt of pain rushed through his body. He stiffened his arms on the chair and tried to stretch it out. He gritted his teeth and shook his head when Jacob took a step into the room. Don't touch me. Are you in pain? Jacob asked hesitantly. It was in that moment that Richard realized the reality of his situation. He thought he had, but now it was worse. Slowly it dawned on him more and more as he learned how it was going to affect the rest of his life, the uselessness of his legs, the inability to leave the house, how he could never care for or protect a wife or a family. None of it mattered. His body froze as the truth slowly crept in through his brain like the first snow of winter. It swirled around in his head, growing frostier by the second. Nothing mattered anymore. What was done had been done. Jacob couldn't take back his mistake. Richard couldn't take back his fall. Just like his brother must have wanted, their roles were reversed in a way neither of them had expected. At least, he hadn't. He didn't know about Jacob, but it didn't matter. Because Jacob had won. Just minutes ago, he had explained how much he had wanted everything Richard originally had. And now he could have it all. Richard was useless in his chair. The dark thoughts spiraled down fast, further than before. He forgot any pain as he searched for the right words to say what Jacob had clearly been hoping to hear for a long time. Just take it. Richard gave up his strength and collapsed in a heap in his chair. His elbow banged into the post on his bed, but he didn't care. Jacob straightened up. Take what? Everything. He waved a hand around. You wanted it, didn't you? The ranch was always both of ours. Don't know why you thought otherwise. But now it's yours, and Louise is yours to do with however you please. Richard. He kept talking, ignoring his younger brother's interruption. Jacob had always liked to get a word in edgewise, but Richard wasn't done. Just do whatever you want. His voice grew dull. Any hope he'd had for the future was disappearing quickly. Do whatever you want and just leave me in peace. Jacob took a step forward. That's not what I wanted but his words weren't very convincing. Richard offered a short laugh as he shook his head. Just go. I don't want to look at your face anymore. I don't want to look at anyone. Don't you get it? I can't do anything. I'm not good for anything any longer. Take what you want. Just leave me be. You're just being crazy, Jacob started hesitantly. You can try the pony, remember? I don't want to. Richard banged a fist down onto his chair. I'm sick of this. His brother tried again. It's only been a few days. A few days too many. Jacob inhaled sharply as he wiped his hands on his pants. He glanced over his shoulders as though someone were calling his name, as though he wanted to get out of there as fast as possible, and as well he should. He had no reason to be there. We could always, he started slowly. Momentarily forgetting his situation, Richard lunged forward as though he'd catch a runaway calf. His arms were outstretched for his brother across the room. But Jacob took a small step back, and Richard fell to the floor before he could catch himself. His legs had caught him up, tangled in the footrests. There was no time to catch himself as he fell. He fell onto the floor in a heap. His chin throbbed as he groaned, turning himself over to his back. Jacob inhaled sharply. Richard, what are you doing? You're so... You could have let me help. But Richard put a hand up. He had been humiliated enough, and this was beyond the worst of his situation. Inhaling sharply, he shook his head. Don't. Just get out. His voice was low and sharp. Now. There was a moment of silence. He closed his eyes and waited. 
Eventually, he heard his brother let out a heavy breath, take a few steps, and then the door closed. Richard could feel it the moment he was alone. He dropped his arm and opened his eyes. His heart hammered as he glanced around. There was his chest. There was his bed beside him. There was the chair at his feet where both legs were still hanging up in the footrests, not touching the floor. The flush of embarrassment washed over him with a sickening warmth. Lying there on the floor, he began to realize his shameful attitude of the day. He couldn't survive on his own anymore, which meant he needed people, and that meant he couldn't scare them away. Gritting his teeth, he tried to breathe through the discomfort in his spine. He had to get up, maybe not in that moment, but soon. He couldn't sleep there all night. He would have to get up onto his bed somehow. Richard glanced at the chair as he wondered how to climb back into it from down below. Later, he told himself. Then he took a deep breath and tried to pull his thoughts back together. Out of the darkness, out of the cold, out of the humiliation. It was going to take a long time, but Richard knew he had all the time in the world. He closed his eyes grudgingly and tried to forget the world. Chapter 24 After Richard angrily protested the gift she had tried so hard to bring together for him, Louise couldn't prevent the tears from rolling down her cheeks. Ducking her head, she wrapped her hands around her face and ran inside. She nearly tripped over the threshold before hurrying down the hall. Though Louise meant to go straight to her room, she realized she would need something to clean up her tears. She almost laughed, realizing that was her priority as she made her way into the kitchen. Upon finding the room was empty, she had hardly found a towel before she felt the panic erupting in her throat. Louise opened her mouth and a soft sob escaped. It felt like all the snow outside had fallen onto her, burying her under a thick, heavy cloud of gray. Louise didn't know where she had gone wrong, how she could have done something wrong. It didn't make sense. She had tried so hard to make things right, to make Christmas better. And yet, she hadn't been able to do it. If anything, she had ruined things. She leaned against the counter and slowly slid down. The knobs for the cupboards nudged her back painfully, but she didn't do anything about it. One pressed against her skull above her ear as she leaned back to catch her breath. What am I even doing here? Louise asked herself between her gasps for air. She buried her face in her hands wishing she were stronger than her weeping state had resigned her to on the floor. There were snowflakes melting on her hands, and she could feel herself sitting in a puddle of water. It must have come from her skirts or her boots, perhaps her hair. She wasn't certain. Louise didn't care. She didn't even know why she was thinking about it. After all, her clothes didn't matter. Whatever was wet would eventually dry. But what about her? What about the time she was spending on the ranch? Luann didn't want to be there. Richard didn't want her there anymore. And her? Louise didn't know anymore. She had been so hopeful, so certain that Richard would be pleased with her idea. After all that effort with Jacob, after going into town and finding the perfect pony, it had only been reasonable for him to be happy about the gift. It had come together so perfectly that it felt like it was meant to be. Now, Louise wasn't certain where she had gone wrong. She had tried to do everything right. Even now, she could remember the way Richard had written those notes to her in a way that had made her heart soar over the clouds. She was nowhere near the clouds today. Louise? A fool, that's all she was. Louise could hear Richard's words still ringing in her ears. 
even as she closed her eyes and shook her head, they wouldn't go away. She was a fool, and she had made a terrible mistake. She didn't know where it had started, but she had to end it somehow. Louise? She hiccuped in surprise. Clasping a hand over her mouth, Louise hurriedly stood up. She faced the cupboards as she wiped her face clean. That was why she had come to the kitchen in the first place. After attempting to sniffle quietly, she managed, I'm sorry, I just, I dropped something and I only came in here for a moment. Mrs. Pennyworth sighed behind her. Oh, Louise, you poor thing. Whatever is the matter, I'm not crying, Louise said in a shaky tone. But her voice cracked in just those three words to betray her. She was never a good liar. The woman behind her tutted as she placed a comforting hand on Louise's shoulder. It's okay to cry. No, it's... But she couldn't finish saying it. Such kind words only prompted another sob. She clapped her hand over her mouth in an attempt to muffle the noise. Though she leaned against the counter, no longer hiding herself completely, she didn't turn to the woman for comfort. Mrs. Pennyworth stood there to offer her support. She squeezed Louise's shoulder and took a corner of the towel herself to wipe away the trickle of tears. There, there, the older woman murmured. Such a kind action reminded Louise of her mother, someone who she had never been far away from before like this all her life. The woman had always been within reach. Though she never disobeyed her husband and his wishes, her mother had always tried to support her however she could. Louise inhaled shakily. It was a deep breath where she grabbed all of her resolve to pull herself together. She didn't like how she felt so weak and helpless. It wasn't something she was used to feeling, and she wanted to fix that. She swallowed and wiped away the rest of her tears. Just another second, and she found the strength to compose herself. I'm sorry, she murmured, as she worked up the courage to look the housekeeper in the eye. I don't know what came over me. Mrs. Pennyworth accepted the towel when she was finished drying her tears. Of course you know why, Louise. You have a heart, a very big one. Jacob just told me what happened. That was a very unfortunate reaction you received. Louise almost laughed. Unfortunate was one word for it. She shook her head as she ran her hands over her cheeks again to make sure they were dry. Her face felt very puffy, and she knew she was making it worse. But she needed to do something with her hands, and she was more than embarrassed for being found in this state. Yes, but I shouldn't have put so much hope and, and expectation into it. That was only a silly idea after all. I should have asked Richard first. Louise ransacked her thoughts for everything she could have done better. She could have done this or said that. Anything could have influenced what had happened only minutes ago. With a sigh, she shook her head. She couldn't keep blaming her circumstances. It was time to take responsibility for her actions and move forward. She could do this. She had to because she was all out of tears. Don't give up hope, Mrs. Pennyworth urged her softly with wide open eyes. Certainly things will get easier from here. That was a lovely idea. How? Louise sniffled. Richard, I thought I knew him, but now I'm not so certain. It's like I can't reach him, who I thought he was. Mrs. Pennyworth shook her head as she ran a hand through Louise's hair to pluck out some of the snow that still hadn't melted. It's a tough situation he has found himself in. Any of us would have a hard time surviving what he is being forced to endure. But don't give up hope, Louise. You came here for a gentleman. He is still somewhere in that body. Her mouth turned dry. She tried to think of Richard when she had first arrived. He had smiled at her and charmed her, those warm eyes. She thought he'd even had a dimple, 
but she wasn't sure anymore. She wasn't certain about anything anymore. Louise, Mrs. Pennyworth touched her cheek. I believe in Richard, and I believe in you. Perhaps it will just take some time to bring that gentleman back to the surface. We'll give him time and we'll give him space, and soon, I'm sure, we'll see him smile again. By the time she had finished talking, Louise had managed to pull herself together. She took deep breaths and was feeling much better. Whether it was her breathing or the other woman's soft tone, every moment that passed stripped away some of the panic that had gripped her only minutes before. Perhaps you're right, she allowed with a soft breath. Perhaps we should wait a short while longer. Mrs. Pennyworth nodded. Exactly, although he should be with us for supper. Finish the corn, would you? I'll see if he'll come out. Perhaps he just needs some food in his stomach. With a wink, she walked away. Louise noticed a weight had lifted off her shoulders once she was alone. A calmness settled around her as she breathed in and then breathed out. Her hands no longer shook. She straightened her shoulders as she pulled herself together. She had overreacted, she decided. While she didn't deserve to be treated in such a manner, she hadn't taken into account Richard's situation. Perhaps she had tried too hard. This was something she could think about after supper was prepared. Humming, Louise located the corn and buttered it for the table. This kept her focused and busy until Mrs. Pennyworth returned in a rush. The woman straightened her frizzy hair and put Richard's plate away. They didn't talk about it. There was little conversation during their Christmas Eve supper, let alone for the rest of their evening. Jacob checked on horses, and Louise curled up by the fire to read from the library. Luann hung around the room, not quite complaining, but not cheerful either. And then it was Christmas. They were all in a better mood after getting some good sleep. Louise convinced her sister and Jacob to build snow people. They took the pony out for a stroll and then made popcorn. It was difficult spending the holiday in a strange place without the rest of her family, but she made the best of the day with what she had. Part of Louise hoped that Richard would come out to join them, but he didn't. Instead, she noticed how he watched them from the window. He would peek his head out as long as she pretended not to look. Someone, she wasn't certain who, convinced him to come out of his room for the tail end of supper. But they sat at opposite sides of the room, and she did her best to ignore him. His attitude was still far from charming, but he was a little quieter. Louise focused on entertaining her sister and Mrs. Pennyworth instead. Luann could be happy when she desired to be, and it was hard not to be happy on Christmas. As she lay in bed that evening, Louise glanced at the letters, but decided against reading them. They were from a Richard that wasn't there at the moment. Maybe it was time to act that way. She thought about her last conversation with Mrs. Pennyworth and tried to convince herself that things would work out well. Time, patience, that's what she needed. Except there was only so much time she would need to return to her family soon if nothing came of her visit to the ranch. All the hope she'd arrived with had begun to fade. She no longer had any idea of what would happen next. A few more days, she told herself. A few more days. And then she would see about going home with her sister. Luann would appreciate that. The idea brought a knot to her stomach. But perhaps it wouldn't be so terrible going home. Something would work out. She had to believe that. Whether it came through patience with Richard or somewhere else, something good would come. Chapter 25 Christmas had been his parents' favorite holiday. Richard remembered decorating the house with garlands 
and decorating a large tree with ribbons. There had been sweet foods to eat, stories to share, and everyone had been in a wonderful mood. This year was different. With Richard in his chair, after everything that had just happened, he stayed in his room to stew. His thoughts swayed from one direction to another. He spent hours staring at his useless legs. Though Mrs. Pennyworth attempted to bring him out to join them for meals, he didn't care to enjoy anyone's company. After watching everyone else enjoy their Christmas day, Richard didn't care to be around any of them. They left him alone in the house and ignored him. No one invited him to play in the snow. Though he knew he couldn't, it would have been polite for them to ask. Perhaps that was why he grudgingly acquiesced to the housekeeper when she suggested he join them for supper. He could smell the hot meal from his bedroom and hated the idea of missing out on something so fresh. When he went to the table, Jacob hurriedly moved a chair out of the way so Richard could roll his chair up. Then he glanced around to see the young ladies who didn't bother to look at him. Instead, they stared at their plates. It was as if they couldn't stand him. Richard bit his tongue and stared at his own plate. Jacob said grace before anyone ate. The meal was quiet, with no one raising their voice to speak. It was somber with a touch of irritation. That last part might have come straight from Richard. He wasn't certain. No one would look at him so that he could tell the difference and decide for himself. Picking up his fork, he fiddled with the roast lamb on his plate, swirling it around into the jam. There were steamed vegetables as well, a rare treat. Everything looked perfect. But Richard couldn't find his appetite. Richard? He blinked before looking across the table at Mrs. Pennyworth, who smiled innocently. What? She motioned to his plate. Is everything all right? I can heat your plate up by the fire if the temperature isn't right. Her eyes were wide and innocent. No he said a moment later. Richard glanced around the table. Luann and Jacob both turned to him when he spoke. Louise, who sat the furthest from him, didn't look up. She fiddled with her fork instead while she played with her food. Her head was down with her curly hair falling into her face. It nearly fell across her plate. Even when he stared, she didn't look over at him. It's fine. Richard turned back to Mrs. Pennyworth and shrugged. I'll eat this. Everyone returned to their plates. The rest of the meal was quiet, but there was an uneasy feeling that settled in that wouldn't go away. It settled like a hard rock in his stomach. As he bent over his plate, Richard stiffened as his spine itched as well. The sensation was uncomfortable as well as a little painful. He just gripped his fork tighter, swallowing his anger and frustration. The moment he was done eating, Richard rolled himself away from the table. It sounded like Mrs. Pennyworth opened her mouth to call him back, but her words died in her throat as a small grunt, and he made his way out of the room. That was clearly what they wanted after all. No one would look at him or talk to him. They all knew what a cripple he was how useless he was now. Richard slammed his door shut before rubbing his hands over his face. Just moving himself from room to room was exhausting. The anger he carried around grew heavier with every passing minute. It was as cumbersome as his chair. Nothing felt normal anymore. He didn't like having to sit constantly. It made his hips ache. Moving around was difficult and felt pointless because there was nothing more he could do but hope people would continue to feed him and keep him from dying. Like a babe. He rubbed his face some more, trying to push back the dark thoughts. But they were all he had since everyone had left him behind, since everyone wanted to ignore him. Richard spent the rest of his Christmas evening sitting in the middle of his room where he wished he could be anywhere else doing anything else. 
Over the next couple of days, nothing changed. Richard tried to find his optimism again, but it was nowhere in the corners of his room or the shadows in his head. Even when he found the strength to leave his room, it didn't seem to help. Jacob would try to say a word or two, but Richard wasn't ready to forget what had happened. His brother couldn't understand what his carelessness had caused, so Richard left whenever he tried to say something. Of course, Luann had nothing kind or polite to say. The two of them sat in silence once or twice in the parlor, purposely ignoring each other and everything. Then, Mrs. Pennyworth tried to be cheerful for him. It only annoyed him. The woman couldn't understand how much of his life was ruined. She was only pointing out how trapped he was in the house for the rest of his life. As for Louise, she still wouldn't look at him. She wouldn't talk to him unless he said something to her first. He had to test that out just to be sure. You're in my way, he had pointed out to her in the kitchen when she was cleaning dishes. Louise had whirled around, water dropping from her soap-covered hands, to find him there. Oh, sorry, she said. Her eyes had glanced at him for only a second before she hurried out of the way. She paused a few steps away. Then she left the room completely, still clutching a dripping plate. Four days passed in that infuriating manner. No matter what happened, everyone decided that he was best to be avoided, especially Louise. He had more than enough time to stew over her strange, silent attitude. She was acting like a martyr, as though she had been injured. But she hadn't. She simply refused to talk to him or look at him. It would have been amusing if it hadn't been so frustrating. Richard noticed her every time he left his room, wondering what she was doing. The women had yet to leave. He couldn't help but wonder if Jacob had seriously considered what he had said and was now trying to court her. Louise and Jacob. His lips curled. He wondered what Jacob had told Louise. Did she know everything? Did she want to be with him? If she knew what he had done to Richard, did she still want to be with him? No matter what Richard did, he couldn't stop thinking about Louise. He tossed and turned in his bed at night. He shifted uncomfortably in his chair during the day. Nothing felt normal or right anymore. Whether it was the cold in his fingers or the pain in his spine, Richard couldn't tell. But he felt deeply unsettled, and soon he couldn't take it anymore. The next morning, he forced himself to slowly get dressed and join everyone to break their fast. They hadn't planned on him joining them. Mrs. Pennyworth jumped up upon finding him in the kitchen and hurriedly set him a place to join everyone. Did you sleep well? Mrs. Pennyworth asked him once he had rolled himself up to the table. His eyes darted around the table. Jacob was gone, probably still out on the ranch with the cattle. Luann sat next to him, her chin in her hand as she picked at her food. Louise sat across from her on the other side. Though he thought he had seen her using her fork and knife a moment ago, she had set them down to put her hands in her lap and stare down at her plate. Turning back to Mrs. Pennyworth, he gave a smile that probably looked more like a grimace. The usual, shooting pain in the back. Doesn't appear that I'll ever sleep again. Mrs. Pennyworth paused before nodding slowly. That's unfortunate, she volunteered. Do you need more pillows? If five pillows aren't enough, then ten aren't, he pointed out to her. Shaking his head, he picked up his fork and ate his eggs. They didn't taste like much. He forced himself to chew and stayed even as Mrs. Pennyworth started to clean up. Luann and Louise soon stood as well to carry the plates over to the sink. He set his fork down and watched Louise carefully ready to talk the moment she was free. As long as she was in his house, she couldn't keep avoiding him. He had to bide his time until she took off her apron and stepped out of the kitchen. 
there was his chance. Richard's heart skipped a beat as she disappeared into the hall. Immediately, he started after her, ignoring when Luann muttered under her breath about him rolling over her foot. The hall was empty. Wondering where she had gone, Richard headed towards the front door. But that area was empty, along with the study beside it. He was just turning around when he found Louise heading towards him while she fixed a scarf around her neck. She looked up at last and stopped when she found him blocking her way. Her eyes widened. Oh, she managed in a small voice. I'm sorry, I... Then she turned to go as if she hadn't been intending to go outside all along. Still avoiding me then, he demanded, scooting himself a little closer. The woman paused. She licked her lips as she glanced around everywhere but at him. No, no, I, I'm only busy. I'm trying to help out around the house. I told Jacob earlier I would check on the pony. That's all. May I? So you'll do everything but talk to me? He scoffed. Aren't I the reason you're here in the first place? Louise hesitated before she shrugged. He wasn't certain he could be any more insulted than he already felt. She had grown distant as though he was no longer worth her time or effort. Heat crept up in his cheeks as his hands balled into fists. Well, he pressed her, demanding answers. Aren't you going to say anything? Or are you going to ignore me all over again? Her mouth opened and closed twice before she found her voice. No, I only, I wanted to give you some time. In space, I didn't want to bother you. Scoffing, he shook his head. Bother me? What else am I going to do? I'm trapped here, Louise. Louise straightened her shoulders as she finally looked him in the eye. And what am I to do, Richard? No matter what I do, it's always wrong. I talk to you, and I'm in your way. I avoid you, and you say I'm ignoring you. I offer you kindness and gifts, and you want none of it. I offer you silence, and you can't stand it. Every time I tried to help, you shoved it back in my face. Her eyes softened in a way that gave Richard pause. I can't win with you, can I? She looked so troubled that he couldn't find any answer to give her. Instead, a new feeling entered his gut and twisted his insides around. As Louise had explained herself, he could see the moment she was talking about. Slowly, it made sense what he had done and why none of it made sense. His anger had grown out of control and unreasonable. He was too frustrated to have noticed. While he didn't feel that everything he had done about his new situation was completely unreasonable, Richard knew he could have done better. He could have tried a little bit more. He also noticed how she didn't reference Jacob. There was nothing about him or about her desiring to leave just yet. A lump formed in his throat as he searched for an appropriate reply. His hands balled into fists as he tried to find a kinder response than telling Louise she was foolish. Because she wasn't, it had to be him. In the silence between them, she grew antsy. Richard sat there mulling over her words as she started to inch around him. I should see to the pony, she mumbled. She likes having company. I, I'll return inside in just a moment, and perhaps we can talk more then. No. She froze as he jerked his head up. Richard saw the apprehension in her gaze and grew mad that it was he who put it there. He swallowed his pride and frustration as he forced a tight smile onto his face. It was time he made up to her for his recent attitude. Perhaps it's time that we finish that walk after all, he managed to say. If you would bring the pony out, I'll get my coat. Louise blinked before she nodded slowly. A small smile slipped over her lips. That sounds lovely. I'll return shortly. Then she slipped out the door before he could say anything more. 
His heart pounded in his chest as he swallowed hard. There was a lump in his throat that he tried to ignore as he thought about what had just happened. A tightness had wrapped around his chest and it made it hard for him to think. Maybe he misread her and she didn't care any longer. Maybe she was outside laughing at him, but maybe he found a spark of hope. She would forgive him for his recent actions. It had been days since he'd been outside, almost a week. Richard slowly wheeled himself back to his room to get dressed, though part of him tried to convince him to stay put and not follow through with his suggestion. The other part reminded him of Louise's tender gaze. The least he could do was give her what she had wanted. After that, however, he wasn't certain what might happen. Chapter 26 The look on Richard's face as he settled into his sled chair emphasized his regret. But to Louise's surprise, he didn't tell them to stop or help him back inside. She twisted her hands as Mrs. Pennyworth wrapped one more blanket around Richard's legs before moving back to the porch. Jacob had been quiet for the last couple of days, as he had continued working on the chair even after his brother had refused the gift. Louise didn't know why, nor what had gone through Jacob's mind, but she found herself grateful for his actions. It was hard enough seeing Richard's character change, but to be the brother of the one going through this hard time sounded nearly impossible. And there he was. Richard was strapped into his new chair, similar to his wheeled one that had strong ski strapped to the legs. The footrest came out instead of dropping down into the snow. The armrest had extra padding, and he looked as warm as one could be. Louise lost count of all the blankets that were tucked around him. When he grudgingly glanced over, Louise wondered if he was pondering the same question. Then he shrugged and waved the reins at her. Well, are we going? She straightened up. Swallowing hard, she forced a smile on her face. There was hope in her soul that this walk would do them good but her first step was hesitant from the way he had treated her lately. Louise prayed that he wasn't going to use their time alone to yell at her. After all, if he wanted this, then he had to be in a better mood. After fixing her jacket, she nodded. Lead the way. Where shall we go? He grabbed the reins and gestured toward the western trail. We can start there. She glanced back at the porch where Jacob and Mrs. Pennyworth stood. They raised their hands to wave as Richard started down in his chair with the eager pony. Louise turned around to find Richard already yards away. Inhaling sharply, she trampled through the snow to catch up. Jacob had given her makeshift snowshoes that helped her walk over the snow, but they were clumsy, and she nearly toppled over several times. When Richard realized she had fallen behind, he reined in the pony. He glanced over when she caught up, breathless and flushed. Richard squinted at her. I didn't realize we were moving that quickly. Inhaling deeply, she shook her head. No, it's all right. I haven't had many opportunities to be out in this much snow, Louise added after a heartbeat. He shrugged but she noticed that his frown was a little softer. Within a few minutes, they had found a new rhythm of moving along. Though it was still fast, the new pace was manageable. It allowed her to get a sense of the world around them. Everything was colored in shades of white. She hadn't realized how beautiful that could be. It was such a relief to be out in the fresh air, even if it was freezing cold. The sun was out, shining on them. The world was flat out there except for the grove. Far ahead, she realized there were dark moving objects. At least, some of them moved. Others were still. Some were white with the snow trapped on their backs. 
they were cattle. As her mind thought back to the letters where Richard mentioned his ranch, she had been only able to see it through his eyes. She remembered how he talked about the fresh scent of hay, the wide open skies, and the warm winds that wrapped around him throughout the year. Now she was seeing it all for herself. It was just as beautiful as he had described. Let's stop over here. Louise jerked her head up to see Richard point to a small overlook by the river. She had hardly paid attention to the running water, or what there was of it, for most of the water was frozen over. There were cracks in the ice, and as she followed after him, she could see movement beneath the ice. It's lovely, Louise said as she sucked in a deep breath. Her chest heaved as she realized she had been struggling during their walk longer than she realized. Then she glanced at Richard. Why did we stop here? Setting the reins down in his hands, he glanced up at her. His eyes tracked over her heaving shoulders and her wide eyes. The pony, Richard turned away. She needed a rest. I thought this might make for a nice view. A flush spread over her face as she looked away, not certain of how to respond. His face told her it wasn't just for the pony. Trying not to be embarrassed, she cleared her throat and looked back to the river. It is a lovely view, she echoed softly. You're very fortunate to live somewhere so beautiful. You should see it in the spring when everything is growing, he pointed out. Then he paused quietly, fiddling with his reins. Before he turned his gaze to her, even without looking at him, she could feel his eyes studying her. Speaking of such time, why are you still here? She licked her lips as she fiddled with her gloves. That was a simple question, a fair one for him to ask. They had planned for her to visit, but they had left it open-ended. A train ticket had not been bought for her return only because they had hoped that she wouldn't. Luann was supposed to return on her own within a few weeks, but no one had talked about that possibility for a while. Louise asked herself the same question. Why was she there? Staring at the ground, she could feel Richard studying her. His lips were pressed tightly together, as though he readied himself to be attacked, ready to fight back. She didn't know what he wanted to fight about. Lately, it was all he wanted. That saddened her heart, causing a deep ache as she thought back to those early letters from Richard. Louise had started reading them at night to help her rest. But in the mornings, she was left wondering where that man had gone. Louise considered providing Richard with a lie. It might be easier for both of them, yet she didn't want to lie to him nor to herself. He could fight her or mock her if he desired. It didn't matter. She wanted to be honest and hopeful no matter what happened. A very kind man wrote me letters over the last couple of months, Louise said slowly. He sounded handsome and told me about this ranch that he loved. This man was sweet, for he asked me questions and paid attention to what I wrote and what I cared for. I suppose I came to see that man, and I'm rather hopeful that he's still here somewhere. Her heart thudded loudly in her chest. It was louder than when the pony huffed, making her jump in surprise. Louise swallowed hard as her body tensed ready for however Richard might respond. It could be with laughter or screams or kindness. When she dared look down, he was shaking his head. I don't know who that is, Richard muttered. Louise swallowed again as she took a small step forward. I think I do, she volunteered. He's here somewhere, I know it. And I, I'm not ready to give up on the man who wrote me such letters not after everything that happened. Shifting in his chair, the man turned away from her. Richard refused to meet her gaze. You're only fooling yourself. I, I'm no longer that man. 
there was something in his voice that made her heart ache for him. An ounce of hurt was there to push her away, but he wasn't as cruel as he had been before since there was no shouting or anger. This just made her want to come closer. Louise inched forward as she shook her head. Of course you are, Richard. No matter what happens, whether you're sitting or standing, you're still the same man. I believe that more than anything. You can't, he said in disbelief as he fiddled with his blankets. Just because I'm a cripple doesn't mean you have to fawn over me like a helpless child. I have never thought that, Louise frowned. Don't call yourself that name, Richard. You can be whatever you want to be. Look at you now. You're outside. You didn't think you could leave the house, could you? But you did. Imagine what else you could do. When she put out a hand, he shook his head. Richard leaned to the far side of his chair before waving her off. Yes, look at me. I'm half a man. In this chair, I don't even meet your shoulders. Don't you understand? I'm nothing. You're wrong, she tried, but he interrupted her. No, you're wrong. I'm nothing, Louise. You deserve more, so much more. Her parents had said that before. Louise's mind thought back to the mornings she had sneaked reading bits of the newspaper. Then she thought of her letters exchanged with Richard. Everyone had their own ideas of what she deserved. No one listened to what she wanted. I know what I want and don't, she murmured with a shake of her head. Snow began to fall as she glanced up at the sky. And I know that I don't want more. But he didn't listen as he scoffed at her. I can't do anything for you. That's not what you deserve. You deserve more. You just don't understand it yet. Louise swallowed back a girlish whine. Richard, please, if you would only listen. We should start back. Richard cleared his throat, fixed his blankets, and picked up the reins. Either he didn't hear her or didn't believe her. He clicked his tongue and brought the pony around back towards the trail. He killed the conversation before she had a chance to say anything more. There were words at the tip of her tongue, but when she opened her mouth, falling snowflakes landed there instead. She wrapped her coat tighter as she started after him. They still had a mile or two back to the house. The river was on the outskirts, past the grove and past the cattle. As Louise squinted, she thought she could see the barn far in the distance. But somehow, that didn't bring relief to her weary soul, not after the way their conversation had ended. She glanced back toward Richard and trudged after him. Chapter 27 Louise had sounded like a sensible woman in her letters. She wanted a home where she was free to be who she was, to read and write and have a safe place to live. Richard remembered that from her letters. In every missive, it was pointed out how intelligent she was, how freely she wanted to live her life. It didn't make sense now why she was being so foolish. Surely she had to see the truth how he was no longer who she thought he was or who he could have been. That man was gone, and left in his place was a crumpled mess bundled in blankets like a baby. He shook his head with a heavy sigh. Even as he tried to be kind and considerate to her, she was tossing it back in his face. What did she think was going to happen? That he would fly out of his chair to swoop her in his arms? His parents had taught him that anything could happen, but then typhoid fever took them away. It was a little hard to believe anything they said anymore. Richard sighed. Then he glanced behind him to make sure Louise was still nearby. Though he wanted a moment alone, he didn't mean to pull himself so much further ahead. The young woman was shuffling her way through the snow 
weighed down with her skirts and layers. Richard tugged on the reins again, but instead of merely slowing down, his seat stopped and jerked. He gave the ropes slack as he turned to see the pony stumble down onto her side. His entire body tensed. Bewildered, he wondered what had happened and moved to the edge of his seat, but he was trapped in his chair. He felt his mouth turn dry, feeling as helpless as he had been when he had his fall. The horse had stumbled and fallen, but he didn't know why. The uncertainty and fear crept over his shoulders to freeze him over. Richard tried to swallow the lump in his throat when he felt a droplet of sweat slip down his forehead. Oh, Louise called after him. Richard, what happened? No matter how far he stretched out his arms, Richard couldn't reach the pony. His hands tightened into fists, but he stayed in his chair. Shaking his head, he could only gesture. I don't know, he said, when Louise brushed by him to kneel by the pony. He heard her sharp intake of breath. Her shoe is split, Louise called back to him. There was something sharp in the snow. There's blood. What? Richard gripped his armrest tightly. How much? he asked, frustrated he couldn't see for himself. If it was bad, he told himself, he'd get out and crawl. But he wasn't certain there was much he could do from that position. He furrowed his brow as he tried to see over her shoulder. They were just on the edge of the grove, in front of the dense trees that blocked their view of the house. Towards the left were all the cattle, and on the right, the valley dropped down into rocky wilderness. Richard glanced up at the sky to find the sun hidden behind the clouds. It was dropping quickly, a reminder that the days were short in winter. He hadn't realized how much time had passed them. If they didn't hurry up, they'd be walking in the dark. Richard shifted in his seat, sparking a stab of pain in his lower back. He gritted his teeth against it as he turned back to Louise. How is the pony? he called to her. We need to hurry up. I just want to stop the bleeding, Louise called over her shoulder. I only need a few more minutes. Then he watched as she pulled off her scarf and started to wrap it around the pony's leg. There wasn't much more that he could see from his seat. It was a limiting worldview from his chair. Richard hated it. Annoyed, he shook his head and tried not to let it get to him. He had been having a pleasant enough afternoon. There was no need to ruin it. Even if he was trapped in a ridiculous chair with a child's pony, which he had already ruined somehow, wolves howled in the distance. They sounded closer than he would have liked. Richard shifted to look around. Even if he could be their lookout, there was little else he could do. He furrowed his brow, feeling his throat turn dry. A wolf would see the pony and Louise on the ground. He was fine but appeared short in his chair. No one would present as a threat if a wolf found them. That made the hair on his neck stand up. Louise, Richard said tersely, I need you to hurry up. We've been out long enough. He didn't want to say anything to scare her. Besides, he was only being careful. A wolf wouldn't dare come this close. He only wanted to make sure nothing happened. In a moment, she called over to him. I'm worried she won't walk well. It looked like something had shifted in the nearby trees. He stiffened. Was that a snow pile or something else? Richard's eyes darted about. He swallowed, but his mouth still felt dry. She'll walk, he muttered. Anyone would run to save themselves. That included a pony. Richard opened his mouth as he realized it had grown awfully quiet. He couldn't even hear the wind. The howling of the wolves was gone though he told himself it had to be a coincidence. The knot in his stomach said otherwise. Louise, stand up, Richard demanded. She obeyed as she turned to him. 
Frowning, she shrugged and asked, Whatever for? I'm still fixing the scarf as a temporary bandage. I want to make sure she'll be all right. As she talked, he urged her to come over to him. She took one step in his direction, but didn't leave the pony. Something moved beyond the snow pile, a dark shadow. Richard straightened in his chair. As he opened his mouth to say something, he realized he didn't want to scare her. Perhaps he was imagining things, but already fear was beginning to grip him. It wouldn't have been so dangerous if he could stand. It would be easy enough to scare the animal away then. He could chase it back into the shadows, except he was trapped in a chair. The pony wasn't going to appear threatening while lying down and bleeding, and Louise had no idea. Come here, he told her in a low tone. Right now. He glanced at the confusion on her face. Richard didn't want to worry about upsetting her when he was wondering if he might have to fight for their lives. He fumbled with his belt to pull out the knife he kept by his side. It fit better in his chair than a gun. He hadn't thought he would need anything more. Louise slowly inched over to him as she looked around to where he was staring. When she gasped quietly, he knew she had seen the creature. She took another step and blocked his view, but she was close enough within grasp that he leaned forward and tugged her coat to the right. Her hand shook as she reached out and grabbed his armrest to stand beside him. Once out of the way, Richard looked up and froze. There it was. A wolf was coming for them. Out of the shadows, it crept low behind the snow. Richard could hardly blink. He didn't want to for fear of losing sight of the predator. Fumbling with his knife, he pulled it out and gripped it tight. But to be able to defend them with it, he had to come into contact with the creature. He gritted his teeth. He had never been so helpless. Glancing at the folds of blankets he was trapped under, he started pulling at them. They restricted too much of his movement. The sharp-toothed animal would have to practically be on top of them for him to do anything. He couldn't stand up and scare the wolf away now. Richard scrambled for ideas just as the wolf started running toward them. It went for the pony on the ground. Richard was weighing their options of protecting the animal when Louise jumped forward. No, she cried out to the wolf. Don't you dare. Louise. He reached out an arm to stop her, but she was already running. Panic grabbed him tight. His heart flew into his throat as she stepped toward the wild animal to protect a little pony. The pony shied, kicking at the ground as the wolf reached them. Louise ran forward, waving her arms. She screamed loudly again. Richard watched frozen in disbelief as the wolf tackled Louise and the two of them went down. The moment they fell, his muscles seized. There was no time to think. No, Richard roared, shoving himself forward. The chair couldn't go anywhere, but he could, even if he had to pull himself along by his arms. He slapped his hands and banged on the chair, trying to make as much noise as possible. Even if he couldn't be tall, he could be loud and startle the animal. It worked. The wolf looked up with its bloody mouth and snarled. Richard glared and yelled at the animal again, throwing snow in its face. His chest heaved with the effort, but he didn't stop even when the wolf growled at him. It did the trick, for the animal moved away from Louise, who wasn't moving. When it jumped after him, Richard angled himself on his side and put an arm out. The wolf came for him. The heavy weight forced him deeper into the snow, but there was no time to wince as a sliver of pain shot up his spine. Teeth ripped into his clothes, and he could feel them pierce his skin. He could smell the wretched animal. Richard shouted as he thrust his knife upward into the wolf's soft belly. The teeth loosened as a soft cry escaped the monster. 
He stabbed again, and the wolf let go, staggering off. Richard tried a third time, but the animal staggered off dizzily, leaving a trail of blood. There was a weak growl, and then it was gone. Richard could smell the blood as he gasped for air. He blinked away the sweat as he watched the wolf melt away in the distance, having lost the fight. From the amount of blood dropping into the white snow, the animal wouldn't make it far. He could feel the stickiness on his hand, but his attention was elsewhere. Louise. Richard's eyes widened as he turned back toward her. Still clutching the knife in one hand, he crawled over to her. The young woman was still lying motionless in the snow. Richard panted, his chest heaving as he prayed that she was still alive. She had to be all right. Even after her foolish desire to protect the pony, she had to be safe. The bloody knife was set aside. Brushing the sweat from his face, Richard scooted up to her and rolled her onto her back carefully. He heard the pony huff, but he would get to her in a second. Snow clung to her. Louise's face was covered with her hair that had escaped her hat. His hands shook as he brushed it away and found her eyes closed. Dread seized him, worried she was never going to wake up. Louise? He swallowed hard. Louise, wake up. Louise, come on, wake up. After he brushed a thumb over her eyelid, he saw a twitch. He froze as her face scrunched up. It took her another moment of eye movement before Louise opened her eyes. She gasped for air and grabbed his arm. Where's the wolf? She asked tremulously. Is it gone? Still holding her cheek in his hand, Richard gave a loud sigh of relief. You're awake. Yes, the wolf is gone. I injured it. I don't think it'll bother us again. He glanced over his shoulder to be certain and found nothing. Then he turned back to Louise to make sure she wasn't injured. She was shaking terribly as she tried to sit up. When he heard a whimper escape, they looked down to find the sleeve of her coat ripped and bloody. Louise, he started, but she shook her head and gave him a painful smile. I'll be all right. It's shallow, I think. And you, Richard. Suddenly she lunged forward to wrap her arms around him. You saved me, she exhaled. I thought, you saved me, Richard. You're my hero. Though he wanted to welcome her warm, soft touch, those words made him stiffen. Richard forced a deep breath before he shook his head. Don't call me that, he instructed her. Then he turned from her, forcing her to let go. He could feel her eyes on him as he tersely wiped his blade and awkwardly crawled back to his chair. The sound of crunching snow told Richard that she was right behind him. Sure enough, he clambered into his seat and turned to find her there. Let me help, she volunteered and knelt before him. Though he got the upper half of his body situated in his chair, he had to fix his legs, especially with the pile of blankets now beneath him. Richard groaned and shook his head at her. He didn't want help with something so simple and embarrassing. It's fine, he started. You don't have to but he trailed off as he watched her run a hand over his shin to fix the crumpling of his jeans around his boots before tugging at the nearest blanket. Something felt strange. Richard frowned, wondering if he was imagining things. The accident was supposed to have paralyzed him where he could not feel a thing. It didn't make sense why he could feel her grip on his leg. Chapter 28 Helping Richard get comfortable again was the least she could do. Even though her arm throbbed, Louise was determined to help him somehow. Only there were so many blankets that she didn't know what to do with them. Louise shifted, winced at the use of her arm, and wondered how to best keep him comfortable. She licked her lips, but it was hard to concentrate. Her heart was beating wildly in her chest. 
she looked over her shoulder again, fearful that the wolf had returned. But all she found was the trail of blood leading off into the distance. Louise. When she turned back, she noticed Richard had bent to her eye level. He placed a hand over hers. She wondered how he could look so calm. Then she wondered if he had killed a wolf before, killed anything before. Yes, she managed, when she realized he was waiting for her to say something. Everything had happened so quickly that she still wasn't quite sure it was over. Adrenaline coursed through her body. There had been the wolf. It had attacked her. She could feel the cuts on her arm, but Richard, he was there. He was calm and collected and brave, and he had saved them. He had saved her. His hand gripped her wrist that still held his leg. Louise swallowed and let go, feeling a flush climb into her cheeks. That had to be what concerned him. It was improper touching a man she was not related to nor married to. She'd been caught up in wanting to help him and repay him for saving her life. I can. Richard hesitated as he dropped his gaze to stare at his leg. He let go to touch his shin where her hand had been. I think I can. I can feel that. It took her a moment to understand. Slowly, her eyes widened as the astonishment sunk in. Louise jumped up to her feet, gasping. Then she knelt back down and grabbed his hand. You can? Can you really? She kept glancing at his leg and his face. Hope flooded into her chest as questions filled her mind. How had that happened? Why had it happened? Why now? What had caused it? Was this real or imaginary? If this meant he could feel his legs now, did that mean someday he could walk? What if he tried now? Realizing she was still clutching him, Louise let go. Richard rubbed his shin and then pinched his leg. His eyes widened in surprise. Yes, he mumbled with his voice full of wonder. I can. That's... That's a miracle, she filled in when the man trailed off. It could be a sign, Richard. If you can feel your legs, perhaps they'll carry you again. You might walk. You could do anything. A Christmas miracle. Though the holiday had passed, it was still the season. Her eyes shone as Richard rubbed his legs again in wonder. I don't know how... He trailed off. We must return to the house, Louise gasped. We must tell the others. Oh, they're going to be so happy. She jumped back to her feet, whirling around to see the pony still lying in the snow. They had to get back to the house. Her own injury was forgotten as she checked on the poor pony. The hoof was still wrapped tightly in her scarf. There was a scratch where the wolf had attacked the pony, but the bleeding had dried and the cuts weren't deep. Come on, you, Louise told the pony. Let's go. She tugged on the reins, urging the pony up. She had been getting ready to do this just before the attack. Now it was time to finish their walk. The adrenaline from the earlier attack lingered as she breathlessly brought the pony back onto her feet. The reins were returned to Richard, who was still rubbing his legs. Don't get your hopes up, he told her as he grabbed the reins. But it could be a good sign, she asked him hopefully. He hesitated and then nodded. Louise grinned at him. Then we must tell the others. Her eyes skirted the area as the sun continued to set. We should return inside in case that wolf has friends. Richard's face grew serious. Exactly my thoughts. Neither of them had anything more to say as they concentrated their efforts on returning to the ranch house. Though she had to hurry alongside the pony and Richard, Louise didn't mind. Her thoughts scrambled in disbelief over everything that had happened in so little time. Everyone came out to meet them on the porch. Mrs. Pennyworth was beaming and waving. Luann curled up in a blanket on a chair. 
Jacob's expression was blank as he came down the steps to help, but he stopped short. What happened to the pony? Richard can feel his legs, Louise blurted. At the same time, Richard said, a wolf attacked us. Their audience stared before questions poured out. Even Luann clambered out of her seat to hear the story. Though it was cold outside, and the other women weren't dressed for the snow, no one budged until Louise and Richard told them everything. Why, that's, Mrs. Pennyworth said in amazement. If I kicked you right now, Jacob tried to understand, you would feel it? Richard sighed. Probably, but I'd rather you didn't. Luann leaned forward and pinched Richard's leg. You felt that? I did, Richard cleared his throat. A shiver ran through Louise's shoulders as she continued grinning. She couldn't help herself, or perhaps it was merely the adrenaline, but the smile wouldn't go away. Something good was going to happen to Richard. She could feel it. Your poor arm, Mrs. Pennyworth took her hand. Oh, it's bleeding again. And you, Richard, Jacob, help your brother inside. What are we doing? We can't just sit around in the cold. It's going to snow again. Luann, heat up the kettle, would you? We need that tea started. Bandages, too. There was a flurry of movement. Louise was led up the stairs, shivering, with Mrs. Pennyworth. Luann followed after grabbing all the blankets from the chair. Jacob carried his brother to the front door, where his wheelchair was waiting for him. While Jacob went to unharness and tend to the pony, Louise and Richard were led to the parlor to bandage up their arms. It's good news, Louise told Richard again. I know it. It has to be. Perhaps something changed, or it really was a miracle. We have to, to embrace it, do something about it. I don't know how, but perhaps you can learn to walk again. What, like a child? He asked tiredly. The man slumped in his chair, rubbing his face with one hand, while the other was bandaged by Mrs. Pennyworth. The woman hummed quietly while she worked, patting his arm dry and wrapping it tightly. Their arms looked nearly identical with the bites from the wolf. Louise blinked several times as she inhaled sharply. Her mind was running faster than she could catch up to it now. Beneath her, her feet danced in place. Sit still, Luann told her. She was the one caring for Louise's arm. Though her sister wasn't the most tender nurse, Louise didn't mind but she winced when the alcohol touched her open wound. It didn't look good, and it would most likely scar. She would have to wear long sleeves for the rest of her life if she wanted to hide the mark. I can't help it, Louise let out a deep breath. I have so much energy buzzing about me. I'm a beehive, Luann. Oh my, if you could have seen what happened, that terrifying wolf. And Richard, he saved me. He saved us. I don't know how we survived. And now his legs. It's a miracle. Mrs. Pennyworth chuckled. Don't worry, she told the girls. It's just a rush of energy. Louise will be out like a light in an hour. That made her laugh. I can't imagine ever falling asleep again. And Richard, we have to do something. I don't know what. But surely if we bring back your doctor... Perhaps he'll know what can be done. There was a pinch as Luann started wrapping her arm with the bandage. Yes, Luann drawled. You'll first learn to crawl and then walk, but I'm sure any dancing skills will certainly be decrepit. Louise decided to ignore her sister. I wonder how long that would take. Would your doctor know? What if we need an expert? Her sister jerked her head up with a strange glint in her eye. Then go to Louisiana, Luann told her sternly. Don't you remember? On the other side of Gramercy is that healing clinic. We used to joke it was a spa, she added. Louise shook her head, not recalling what she was talking about. 
Whatever do you mean? How do you know this? Her feet continued to dance beneath her. Now her free hand fiddled with her skirts, finding a loose thread to pull. Her older sister shrugged. I never went there, of course, but I've heard tell of it. Some type of hospital for such a thing. They treat people with odd limbs that don't work properly. What, you think a country doctor could help? No, you need a special place for something as silly as legs that won't work right. Though Luann ended it with a note of sarcasm, Louise's heart surged hopefully. She turned to Richard. That's it, she told him. We can go there. You must. You want to walk again, don't you? Perhaps they can help. Another miracle. I can't just go to a strange place and hope something like that works. Richard shook his head. Since Mrs. Pennyworth was done, he studied his bandage and then shrugged. Louise stood as her sister finished as well. But we must try. Gramercy isn't a strange place. I can. I'll come with you and show you the town. This could work. I know it. Her heart soared, even as Richard shrugged. What about Jacob? This is my home, my ranch. I can't leave Jacob. I can't just go anywhere. You wouldn't be going just anywhere if she knows the town, Mrs. Pennyworth scoffed at him. Besides, Jacob won't be alone, Luann reminded him and gestured to the housekeeper. She'll be here, and I can stay as well to keep them company. When Louise looked at her sister in surprise, Luann merely shrugged and dropped her gaze. She set her amazement aside. They were going to help. That's what mattered. The fear she had endured that afternoon was wiped clean away as she thought about Richard standing and laughing again. He would be happy and safe and well. It's a wonderful idea, she pressed. Consider it, Richard. If you want to walk again, shouldn't we be willing to try anything? Richard fell quiet. His anger had faded during their walk. After the attack, his mood had softened. Even now, there was hardly any bitterness in his voice. Taking a step forward, Louise prayed fervently for him to consider this. He wanted so badly to walk again. They would have to sort out some details. To be certain, Jacob would need to talk to his brother about the ranch, and if her sister wanted to stay, then they would need to work that out. Louise forgot about the throbbing in her arm. The pounding in her heart was much too strong to ignore. She could think of nothing else. Richard could walk again. She just knew it. Chapter 29 I guess this is goodbye. He could hardly say the words before Mrs. Pennyworth reached for him. Richard hesitated before patting her back. It was hard to imagine he was leaving home. Besides a couple of cattle runs, he had hardly ever left town. This land was everything to him. It was the ranch his parents had built before he was born. He had planned to live there all his life, and now he was leaving. I'll be back soon, Richard offered when the woman didn't let go. Fortunately, the woman caught on. Soon, she repeated purposefully. You will return to us soon. Sitting or walking, we want you back in one piece. Understood? Nodding, he dropped his gaze. Yes, ma'am. The last two weeks had changed everything. There had been endless discussions to consider leaving town for his health. He hoped he had packed everything. Inside his luggage were his clothes with enough money to finance him for several months, possibly more. But even all the luggage waiting out for him in the cart didn't feel like enough. There was an itch in his brain, as though he was certain he was missing something. Richard glanced around, patting his pockets. On the bright side, Luann offered, You can't possibly get any worse. Louise muttered something to her sister under her breath. Richard bit his tongue 
to hold back a response. He had been working on that lately. After checking every day that he could still feel his legs, it was easier to have a bright attitude. Not a lot, but enough that he was trying not to antagonize everyone. Are you sure about this? Jacob frowned at him. Shaking his head, Richard scoffed. You wanted the ranch, so you're getting the ranch, at least for the next couple of months. See how you really like it out here on your own? Luann and Mrs. Pennyworth waved them off before they headed towards town in the wagon. It was a blustery day, but the sun was shining again and the snow was melting. His legs tingled and the cuts on his arm were healing well. Maybe it was a miracle. The hope in his chest dampened as they reached the train station. Scooting to the end of the wagon, he grudgingly accepted himself to be carried to his chair. Jacob didn't bang his elbow or legs this time. Still, neither of them was comfortable about the chore. Wrapping his coat tightly around him, Richard shifted to get comfortable. In the process, he could feel eyes on him. The itch slowed him down. He squirmed and couldn't resist taking a look around. There were folks around the train station and in the street. Most were familiar faces he had known all his life. Jacob, is that you? A familiar voice called. His brother helped Louise down before he turned. Richard looked up to see the pastor's wife and her twins coming from the haberdashery. Mrs. Roberts, Jacob nodded to them. Rachel, Johnny, it's good to see you all. How was your Christmas? The woman beamed up at him, nudging her young teenage children. Just lovely. It's been a beautiful spiritual time. You missed my husband's last sermon, did you not? Just last Sunday. We missed you in the crowd. Oh. Jacob glanced back at Richard, who had his head down. He didn't know what to say to them, and from the side glances they tossed, they didn't know either we decided it was best to stay home. Richard wished he hadn't put it like that. Now it forced the Roberts to look at him. Mrs. Roberts's eyes softened as she bent forward like he was a child she had to crouch down to see eye to eye. The woman breathed softly. Yes, Richard, we heard about the accident. My family and I are all so sorry for your accident. It's a terrible happenstance. His mouth grew dry as he tried to think of something to say. Thank you, he managed. But that didn't feel right. There was nothing to thank them for. There was nothing they could do to help him. An awkward silence began to settle between them. It was Louise who stepped up. I'm sorry to interrupt, she offered politely but I think it best we turn to the train's platform. We don't want to have to rush later. Oh, Mrs. Roberts asked, are you going somewhere? Not me, Jacob shook his head. They are, Louisiana. Richard inhaled sharply, wishing his brother wasn't telling everyone the news, but it was too late. To a healing facility, he explained as he threw his brother a look. For my legs. Mrs. Roberts clutched her heart. Oh, that is just darling. Why, I do believe that's wonderful. We'll pray for you. She smiled cheerfully before falling quiet. Then she turned to her children. Well, we had best be on our way. It was lovely running into you. They left, but the awkwardness lingered. Richard rubbed his legs, then his face, then his hands. He cleared his throat. Get me out of here. It wasn't fast enough. There were other people who stared at him, familiar faces who offered their condolences and pity. Before they made it up the platform, Richard had a pounding headache. All of it reminded him why he had avoided town since the incident. Did you tell everyone? He threw Jacob a look once they were settled on the platform. Why does everyone know? Jacob shrugged as he pulled off his hat to wipe his damp brow. 
I don't think so. No, I don't know. It's not like it matters. People would talk about anything. He bit his tongue to hold back the sharp words. It was only the whistle of a train coming around the valley that held his thoughts back. Richard shook his head and sighed. You don't have to sound so thrilled, his brother said. Richard just glared. No one else could understand what it felt like to be stared at like such a helpless mess. After working all his life to be a good man, a helpful man, he was now as helpless as a baby. No one gave him respect, just pity. The train pulled up and people stepped down. Then there were a few folks who climbed on. He stared at the stairs and realized he hadn't thought about those. There was a bitter taste in his mouth as he held back a groan. His brother sighed and turned away as Louise murmured, I forgot about the stairs. She stood beside him, hands clasped, as they looked for where Jacob had gone. Richard hoped it had been to find a ramp, but his brother came back with two strong men who were willing to help him up. It was embarrassing as strange gentlemen carried him onto the train. He wanted to close his eyes to block it out, but he couldn't trust them and forced himself to keep his eyes open until he was securely settled onto a rail bench. The men nodded to him and disappeared. Send me a wire if you need anything. Richard glanced up to see Jacob rubbing his hands together. Or a letter. Let me know how it, how everything, well, you know. Jacob hesitated. I hope it works, you know. Richard remembered his brother's confession. He wondered what Jacob really wanted. Pursing his lips, Richard turned away. We'll see. Before his brother could respond, Louise reached them. The young woman was flushed as she smiled shyly. I'm ready if you are, she offered. Right, Jacob shrugged. About time you two left, he said bitterly. Louise watched him go before she slid onto the bench beside Richard. She smelled sweet and fresh. It was almost too much for him to bear. Richard tried to scoot further down the bench, but there was limited space. Annoyed with strangers, his brother, and now a woman who could never understand, he wished he was back alone in his bedroom. Louise noticed something was off. Richard, are you all right? Is something wrong? He turned towards the window. Fine. It's going to be all right, she offered in an encouraging tone. I know this is the right choice. They can help you. You'll only need help for for a short time, and then you'll be walking again. Already he knew that her eyes would be open wide and hopeful. She would be thinking too many cheerful thoughts. They couldn't have so much hope. She had so much that it was dancing off her like the brightness of the sun. He could hardly stand it. Richard focused his gaze on the world outside the window. The day was still clear and bright shining above them. It used to be his favorite way to start the day, but now he wasn't certain. It was too bright, so bright that it irritated him. His eyes darted about, not even pausing as the train started to roll. Soon, the world was flying by. It was mostly white, but there were flecks of color that caught his attention. He could feel the beating of his heart fall in sync with the wheels of the train beneath them. The irritation flooding through his system slowly slipped away. Everything disappeared. Richard was in his own world all alone. Perhaps there he would learn to stand and walk again. As he closed his eyes, Richard prayed that it was possible. Some way in some day, it had to be. He leaned against the bench to think and in the back of his mind, he could hear a familiar sweet voice humming. Chapter 30 Her first train ride had not been very pleasant. 
Louise could still remember sitting anxiously, twisting her hands and fiddling with her bag. Luann had been there. She had not been very supportive. Now, her second train ride was quiet. There were several children at the front of the car, but they never came over by her. Louise tried not to be disappointed. Again, she was seated on the end of the bench by the aisle, eyeing everyone curiously to bide her time. She hummed and she watched. Eventually, the snow faded. There were mountains they passed, and then hills. The outside world turned brown and green. Louise wondered if she was imagining a familiar scent, or if it was just her knowing she had returned home. Home. A shiver ran down her spine. She loved her parents, but found herself reluctant to return. She wondered what they would think. Luann had written their parents a letter to explain their new situation. But Louise realized she didn't know how her sister had phrased everything. She supposed that either way, she would find out soon enough. Her thoughts consumed her as they made their way off the train with the help of kind strangers. Richard fumbled grumpily with his things but said nothing. They looked around for several minutes before realizing they hadn't planned a way to go anywhere. Louise thought of the healing center called McCoy's. They had a meeting the following morning. But not wanting to be rushed, they had decided to arrive the day before to settle themselves. Ah, Louise cleared her throat and turned to Richard. It didn't look like he had rested during their journey. I suppose we should employ a cart, he nodded. We have enough bags that we need the help. Are there any boarding houses by McCoy's? She stared at him in confusion. I... I thought we would stay at my parents' house, she offered. It had not been said aloud, but she thought it was assumed. They live just south of here. We'll be quite welcome. But as she explained, a shadowy expression crossed Richard's face. He shook his head. We will not be staying with your parents. Why not? she asked in dismay. They didn't have anywhere else to go. Richard. They have the space. I know we won't be very comfortable there, but it shouldn't be for long. I don't want to, he told her. I know I haven't always spoken kindly of them, but they are good people, Louise offered. There's enough space and food, so there's nothing to worry about. I'm certain my parents will be more than happy to have us. He shook his head adamantly. I will not meet your parents as a cripple. Not yet, not until I'm walking as a proper son-in-law. His words were forcefully said, but it wasn't the tone that caught her attention. She paused, not wanting to make a big deal out of it. After all, she could see the shame in his eyes. But he had hope that he could recover. Her heart skipped a beat. He had faith for a recovery and a future marriage. Slowly, Louise nodded and let out a deep breath. He had certainly surprised her. She licked her lips and tried to think. Though she had hoped he felt that way and prayed daily for his spirits to lighten, Louise wasn't certain of his thoughts about their future. The man who had written her those lovely letters was still there. She knew that with a certainty now. She tried to clear her mind. Louise swallowed and considered their other options. They wouldn't go to her parents' home. It might be easier if they could find a boarding house closer to the clinic. Let me ask someone, Louise offered. Her eyes searched the platform before spotting a train worker with his hat and vest. Perhaps he knows a place. She had never needed to know about boarding houses after all not when she had a home in Gramercy. Louise went up to the man, asking what he might know of the best places to lodge in the northern part of the city. Fortunately, he had a few ideas. When she returned to where she had left Richard, he wasn't there. Louise's heart dropped as she spun in confusion. Their bags were also gone. 
Louise. Richard waved an arm to get her attention. He was in the street in an open horse carriage. Her eyes widened as she hurried over. She hardly glanced at the driver as she ran to Richard's side. I thought you had disappeared, she said breathlessly. How did you get over here? I walked, he offered sarcastically. Then he shook his head and opened the door. Get in. Malcolm here said he would take us anywhere we wanted. Everything is already put up. Did you find a place of lodging? Obeying, she scampered in. The carriage was made for six people to sit comfortably, but the extra space was used by his wheelchair, so she sat directly before Richard. It was a close seat, and her knees knocked against Richard's. She tried not to think about it. Yes, Louise fiddled with her skirts before turning to Malcolm. Hello, sir. Can you take us to Rene Avenue by the orchards? the large house with white shutters. Malcolm wore a ridiculously tall black hat with a longer goatee. Most certainly. The white shutters, then. He turned to his horses, and they started off. Louise sat at attention as she recognized the area's buildings. Her eyes searched the crowd for familiar faces. Even the scents were as she remembered. While she was more than happy elsewhere, there was something comforting about being in such a familiar world. You missed this, didn't you? Her gaze turned to Richard. He had been watching her. Constraining her smile, she offered a shrug. Yes and no. It's hard to explain. It's the town I grew up in, after all. I know the food, the streets, the people. I know the traditions and the habits and the smells. But I was ready to leave, she added when an unreadable expression crossed his face. I felt like I was reading the same chapter over and over again when I wanted something new. Something in his eyes flickered. And now that you're back, you're reading that chapter again? She nodded. Yes, I suppose. I know the words by heart, but it doesn't mean they're my favorite ones. A flush spread over her cheeks. That sounded silly, didn't it? His eyes left hers as he glanced into the street. Not really. Louise swallowed and turned back to watching the streets pass them by. Silence fell as they enjoyed their bumpy ride along until Malcolm set them in front of the cobbled path leading up to the lodge. Indeed, there were stark white shutters on top of a bright yellow house. It wasn't the prettiest, but it certainly looked large enough to house a few travelers. Thank you, Louise offered Malcolm, as she accepted the last of their bags. The man offered an extravagant bow with a farewell in French. Once their bags were set down, he headed down the street, and Louise couldn't help but be amused with the man. With Gramercy on the edge of New Orleans, there were always strange characters in town, Shall we? Louise turned to Richard. He had a bag on his lap and a suitcase tied to the back of his chair. Then she had her two bags in her arms. That was everything they had brought with them. She gave the street one more glance to make sure she wasn't missing anything and then nodded. They headed up to the house together. Richard was able to wheel himself there for the most part but the wheels bumped roughly against the path occasionally. Louise gave the chair a nudge, and then they started off again, not mentioning it. She could already tell what was on his mind. The resolve was apparent in Richard's head. He wanted to walk again, and he was willing to do whatever it took. His brow furrowed as he ran into each blocker. That would be determination enough to help him walk again. Welcome. Louise glanced up as the door opened. A short Creole woman waved her arms, dressed in all white with her hair done up in braids. She was missing her two front teeth in her cheerful grin. Hello, Louise volunteered in response to the contagious smile. Richard shot her a glance as she stepped past him to greet the woman. This is Mr. Seary's Lodge, the woman announced. 
He's sleeping in the back. I knew we'd get a few new folks in today. Come in, come in. Call me Ray. I help run things when Mr. Siri isn't around or when he's just lazy. Aren't you a charming couple? Louise held the door open for Richard, who gingerly wheeled himself in. It was a spacious place, mostly bare besides some sparse furniture and some beads pinned around the ceiling. There was a comfortable feel to the place, and Louise shrugged when Richard shot her a curious look. I'm Richard Hansen, he offered to Ray. This is Louise Moreau. We're looking for two rooms. Ray hummed as she inched around the large crooked desk to start looking through the big book left on top. Mm, mm-hmm, how long, my children? Two rooms starting tonight, Louise volunteered, but we're not clear for how long. She turned to Richard for confirmation and he nodded. Louise turned back to Ray. The woman bent over the book so much that her nose was nearly touching it. Only then did Louise worry there wasn't space for them. Her gaze turned back towards the front door they had just walked through. Their ride with Malcolm was gone. If they didn't stay here, then she wasn't certain where else they could go. What if the next place was full as well? She thought again of her parents, but knew Richard had already tossed that idea aside. Perhaps, she wondered, if he could find one room, then Richard could have it and she could return to her parents. But the idea brought a queasy feeling to her stomach. We have three rooms available, Ray announced proudly to Louise. Then she made a face and turned to Richard. But I'm afraid they're all on the next floor up. Louise's mouth turned dry. She thought she'd felt the dread filling up in her stomach. Though she had tried to ignore it, it had come for a reason. Thank you, she managed slowly. But I don't think that will do. We'll have to try somewhere else. No. She glanced at Richard, who was shaking his head. No? Richard, this room would work after your healing, but not now. I can do it, he insisted. I'll crawl or something. We're here. You said this place was close to the clinic, right? Louise licked her lips. Yes, it's around the corner, but I don't know. I can't carry my chair, Richard sighed. But if someone can do that for me, then I'll get myself up and down those stairs. We're not going to keep looking all over the city for a place that has enough rooms on the first floor. We could be out all night, I'm sure. He had a point. When they first started considering their options for coming to Louisiana, she and Luann had talked about how different the city could be and how busy it was with all the people so close to each other. Richard had taken the arrival with ease and already seemed to accept the inevitable. With that, Louise knew any more arguments were futile. Richard had made up his mind, and if he thought this was manageable, then she wasn't going to argue. He wanted to climb the stairs himself, so he would. All right, Louise nodded as she gave Ray a smile. Two rooms, please. Chapter 31 The house felt quiet. Jacob stood in the doorway after taking off his winter gear. Now that he was still, he realized he could actually hear his housekeeper, Mrs. Pennyworth, in the kitchen as she hummed to herself. It trickled through the hall down to him, but it felt quiet. His fingers tingled as he stood there and listened. There was something so strange about this emptiness that confused him. The last two nights, since Richard and Louise had left, he had hardly been able to sleep a wink. It made no sense. He shifted uneasily and wondered what was wrong. If he wasn't at peace when he was alone, then when would he ever be at peace? This strange situation only made him frown. Having his brother gone was supposed to be relaxing and refreshing, but something just didn't sit right. Jacob supposed he was going crazy. 
Shaking his head to himself, he pulled off his boots and stomped off to his bedroom. He could feel the snow melting on him, and all he wanted now were dry clothes. The quiet and emptiness of the house could be ignored for a little longer. He made his way to his bedroom and changed. Then he sat there for a few minutes until he decided to assist Mrs. Pennyworth in the kitchen. I'm back, he volunteered with a hesitant smile in the doorway. The older woman glanced up. She had been taking care of him and his brother for as long as he could remember. Jacob wasn't certain he could even recall a time when she hadn't been there, especially when their parents passed. Though he distinctly recalled loving his mother and father, those memories were few and far between, especially since they had always been so focused on Richard. But Mrs. Pennyworth had always treated them equally. She had bandaged each of them with their scrapes, sneaked them extra cookies before supper, and always had a smile for Jacob and Richard. He wondered why he hadn't thought about that for a while. With Richard's accident, of course, all the attention reverted back to him. Mrs. Pennyworth offered him a broad smile as she ushered him in all the way. I was wondering if you were going to freeze out there, she said. Warm yourself by the fire, dear. Then you can help me prepare the supper table for the three of us. Three? She gave him a look. Luann. He blinked before turning away. Luann was still there. He'd been so focused on handling all the work alone on the ranch that he'd taken his meals with him. It was only tonight he had finished at a reasonable time, meaning he could eat his food hot. With everything else on his mind, he had forgotten about Luann. She had blonde hair and big green eyes. The young woman always wore a pout and had something to say. It wasn't always kind. In fact, if he recalled correctly, her words usually weren't very nice, but it had made him grin once or twice, and he recalled the attention she had given him upon her arrival. Taking a seat by the fire, Jacob rubbed the warmth back into his hands as he considered the young woman. She had decided to stay without her sister around, even when she could have simply gone back home to a place she would clearly prefer. It had been stated several times how much she wasn't interested in living in Oklahoma. There was no reason for her to be there. Jacob wondered what might be on her mind. He was still thinking about her when she arrived in the kitchen, sniffed the roast beef, and then took her seat. Luann was dressed neatly in a blue dress that brought out the color in her eyes. She had pinned her hair back and skimmed a glance at him before returning to the plate set before her. Mrs. Pennyworth came around and took her seat as well. He offered grace and they dug in. It was a quiet meal, but he hardly noticed. His thoughts were buzzing the entire time. Though he ate, Jacob couldn't imagine what the food really tasted like. Though he supposed it was decent, he wasn't paying attention. Finally, it was done. Scratching his head, he handed off his plate to Mrs. Pennyworth. He caught Luann slipping out of the kitchen from the corner of his eye. Immediately, he followed after her. Pursing his lips, he asked himself again all the questions running through his mind. There was only one person who could answer them. You could have left. Luann had one hand on the doorknob, but she stopped and turned to look at him over her shoulder. Her eyes met his, a piercing shade of blue, before she glanced him over. She dropped her hand from the door. Here? Yes, she agreed. Then she shrugged a shoulder at him. I could have. I still can. There was something in her eyes that drew him closer. He couldn't tell what it was. A glimmer of light or darkness? Jacob wasn't certain but he took another step forward to get a better look. You're the one who told them to leave. He made his way over to the young woman until they were standing eye to eye. 
You stayed and encouraged them to leave. His eyes trailed over her as he wondered if she was as bored as he was, as tired of this quiet house as himself. He knew he was of average height, but she was fairly tall for a woman. She lifted her chin and suddenly appeared taller than him. His eyes fell to her lips. That's when he could finally feel his heart beating again. She had stayed for a reason, hadn't she? He felt pretty certain he knew just why. But as he leaned in, Luann took a step back. Jacob frowned. I didn't tell them to leave so we could be alone, Luann told him pointedly with her hands on her hips. They didn't leave for our benefit. Cocking his head, he considered her words. He thought of how Louise looked at Richard, but that wasn't how Luan looked at him. This realization made him hesitate. He stood there before the young woman and wondered if she didn't want to kiss him after all, just one harmless kiss. They had nothing else to do in this house. No, he allowed, but it was convenient. Why else are you still here? She flipped her hair over her shoulder. Because my sister loves your brother, for some ridiculous reason, and I saw what you were trying to do. You, sir, were trying to get in the way of all that. Jacob hesitated. Frowning, he studied her and wondered if she had been more observant than she let on. She eyed him sternly, her jaw set. Richard didn't want her, he pointed out. He was weak. Don't you think your sister deserves better? Luann took another step back as she shrugged at him. Oh, she certainly deserves better. Better than Richard, and certainly better than yourself. Jealous, he noted. Her eyes narrowed. Who wouldn't be? But I'm no fool. The best way to help my sister was to get her away from you, one way or another. He risked another step forward to close the gap between them. Luann didn't budge from her spot where her shoulder brushed the wall. He offered a small grin, wondering if this was some sort of game. She was being silly, after all. Louise was not at risk of any trouble around him. So, you stayed behind to keep me company. It was more of a statement than a question. She opened her mouth and then she closed it. He grinned, hovering beside her, but then she suddenly scoffed an inch back a little further. I know a rat when I smell one, she announced primly as she set her nose in the air. Jacob scoffed, but didn't have a chance to say anything in his defense when Luann continued talking. I shall admit that I fancied you upon my arrival but after seeing your mannerisms around my sister and Richard, I have learned my lesson and shall not repeat it. Now she was just insulting him. His hands balled into fists as he glared at her, but she hardly noticed his frustration as she eyed him warily. You still chose to stay here, he pointed out. I wouldn't dream of fancying you any more, even in my nightmares. She flipped her hair again. I cannot stand your company. I shall continue to keep to myself, and you had best do the same. That way, when my sister and your brother return, which they will, then we don't need to worry about anything. Understood? Luann whipped around and stalked her way down the hall to her bedroom before Jacob could formulate a response. His eyes followed her every move, from the swishing of her skirts to the tumbling of her hair over her shoulders. The young woman never glanced back at him. His chest tightened over the conflict inside his mind. He thought of how he had treated Richard and Luann, embarrassed for himself. But he didn't appreciate Luann's blunt honesty. All he had wanted was some time with her, maybe a kiss or two. What else were they supposed to do together in the house? Jacob took a step back as he scratched his head and tried to think. He didn't know what else to do with his time. He didn't want to spend it with Mrs. Pennyworth. Luann made sense. 
but now her words threw him off and he wasn't certain what to do, while she made valid points. It still didn't explain why she had chosen to remain here with him. She could have gone anywhere. She could have returned home, but she had stayed. Slowly, Jacob turned around. He wasn't going to inflict himself on someone who clearly had no interest in talking to him. She had called him a rat. That had definitely bothered him, but he didn't know what to do about that. It didn't feel like there was anything he could do but prove her wrong. Confused and annoyed, he headed out of the house. A ride in the open air would do him good. There was still some light out, and he could even take his brother's horse, since no one else was here to ride the creature. That made him grin. Maybe he couldn't have everything his brother had, but he could have a few things, and he could worry about the rest later. Chapter 32 The night passed slowly. It might have been the strange room, it might have been the humid weather, or it might have been the noise from people carousing out in the streets for the entirety of the night. Richard wasn't certain what exactly had kept him awake, but he stared at the ceiling all night with his hands clasped firmly over his chest. It was a small room, perhaps half the size of his back on the ranch. There was a small door and a large window. He had a fireplace, but could not bring himself to crawl over to tend the dying flames. So it dwindled into nothing. He stared at the ceiling a little bit longer. He couldn't recall ever leaving Oklahoma. While he remembered the small house before his parents bought the ranch, there were few memories of the life before the sprawling territory that his family had grown. Oklahoma had been his entire world. This was Louisiana. Though Louise had attempted to explain the area to him during their train ride, he hadn't exactly been listening. There had been a few words that caught his ear, certainly, but he couldn't imagine any place different from his home. Yet, he had been wrong from the moment they arrived in Gramercy. Even the folks spoke differently, with certain mannerisms that confused him. There were different food and people everywhere. He had experienced that on Sundays in town when everyone came together. Even at parties and dances, they were fairly crowded. His town was nothing like Louisiana. If he listened carefully, he could hear his neighbor to the left snoring away. People pounded away on the ground level, and people sang loudly in the streets all through the night. It didn't make sense to him, and he wondered how anyone lived in this manner. The moment he felt certain that the skies were beginning to brighten, he sat up. Richard was done biding his time. He grabbed his clothes and, once dressed, he washed his face in the cold water found on his nightstand. With a deep breath, he pulled himself off the bed and down onto the ground. He fell with a soft thud and paused to see if anyone was nearby. He tugged his body over to the door and peeked out. No one was in the hall. Already the heat was climbing up his neck to his cheeks. He could feel it. He hated it. But he couldn't do anything about this trouble. Not yet, at least. Richard forced himself to swallow his pride. And then he crawled out the door. He locked it behind him and, after setting his legs in front, slowly moved himself down the stairs. I thought I heard you on the stairs. Ray came around the corner of the stairs with a toothy grin and her wheelchair. He hadn't thought he was loud. It was too early for most folks to be awake, and so he wondered what she had been doing. He paused, eyeing her warily before nodding. The older woman chuckled. Get yourself in. I'm not judging and I'm not listening, honeybee. Old Ray here doesn't sleep. Get, get. Where's your sweetheart? He hesitated after pulling himself awkwardly into the chair. The process never seemed to get easier. Still asleep, I'm sure. It's early. He cleared his throat. 
I didn't want to bother her. Part of him wanted to tell the woman that Louise wasn't his sweetheart, but then he wasn't certain what Ray would think of the two of them. So he swallowed and decided not to bring it up. I have to go. She told me about the treatment, Ray hummed lightly. Of course, I knew that the moment I saw you. We're awful close to it, she pointed out when he jerked his head up at her. You aren't the first, and you aren't the last one to stay here for such a reason. Now hold on a moment, so we get some food in that belly of yours. She ran off for a moment, leaving him by the stairs. Richard considered leaving right then and there, but that's when he realized who she reminded him of. Though Ray was louder and a little odder, she had the sweet nature of Mrs. Pennyworth. Richard had just finished situating himself more comfortably in the chair when Ray tossed something in his lap. It doesn't smell good, she warned as his eyes widened. But it'll taste just right. Now get and move to the left-hand side of the street. That has a smoother path. He obeyed, soon out on the street. It was still terribly dark outside, but not as dark as it had been a short while ago. Richard was used to rising early, and the clinic had let him know that they had their doors open to him during all hours. Breathing carefully through his mouth, he kept moving. The path on the street was narrow and rocky, but by keeping to the left, Richard found it a little easier to push himself along. There were calluses already forming on his hands in a way that he'd never experienced them. He couldn't help but think back to all those years of farming. Would they have all been for nothing? Shaking his head to get out of his thoughts, Richard continued on his way until he reached the building. They had stopped by the other day to start setting up times for his appointments. But this was the day when he could finally talk with a doctor and discuss treatment plans. Staying with Ray H.M.? The woman looked over the desk and grinned at him. He glanced down and nodded as she said, That woman is a character. That means she cares deeply for you. Now come on. It's early, but you're lucky. You're working with Carmichael, yes? The man is already in. I'll take you to him. The facility was perhaps twice the size of his ranch house, but that felt small to Richard. From the halls to the small waiting room, he wondered how they managed to work with over 20 patients every day. People came from all over the neighboring territories to seek relief at this very clinic. He would take what he could, but he still wondered. Good morning, Richard. He looked up to find himself back in Dr. Carmichael's office. The older man had white hair standing in every direction, a white goatee and large blue eyes. His smile was wide, and his long fingers were always clasped together whether he stood or sat. Richard nodded. Good morning. I hope I'm not too early, but I'd like to get started. He could do this. He had to do this. They had discussed a few possibilities the other day, but this was the day they would decide for certain if he had any hope of walking again. His heart hammered in his chest as the two men sat and talked in the office. This was going to happen. He could feel it in the rushing blood throughout his body. He had already managed to pull himself down the stairs and get himself all the way to the clinic. It wasn't very far, but that was proof that he could do something all on his own, and if he could do that, then certainly he could figure out how to walk again. After a few warnings were provided that Dr. Carmichael could not provide miracles and human bodies were capable of working or not working on their own time, it was at that point that the tests needed to occur. It's going to be uncomfortable, Dr. Carmichael explained but not overtly painful. We have to test exactly what sensations your legs can feel to see what nerves are working, where they are working, and how they are working. This will include a few utensils, including needles. Richard didn't like needles. He gritted his teeth 
but forced himself to nod. Sounds like a plan, he offered. I'm ready when you are, the doctor beamed. Right this way, he instructed. Then the two of them headed down another hall. The man talked as he walked, explaining his history with the clinic and the improvements he had seen in the lives of those who came here and worked hard to improve their bodies. It's hard work, Dr. Carmichael sighed. I've had a fortunate life where I haven't suffered much myself in the way of physical ailments. But I have seen children dance again and seen others find peace with where they are at. As long as people leave here happy, I consider this a success. Richard hesitated. But I will be able to walk again? If he could, then everything in his life would be better. He knew what it was like to walk and wanted desperately to experience that again. The lesson had been learned, and he would never take for granted the ability to use snowshoes and run through the grass. He changed his clothes as requested. Then Carmichael brought another doctor, one in training, to join the pain and sensitivity test. The statement about it causing no pain was a lie, but Richard gritted his teeth through it. Any feeling was a good thing. The numbness was continuing to wear off. Do you feel that? Carmichael asked repeatedly. On a scale of one to five, how would you rate it? Three. Richard forced himself to breathe. Then he inhaled sharply. Maybe a four. The doctor laughed. That's good to hear. It shouldn't hurt that much, he added after a moment, still wearing a smile. But it is to be expected. The nerves in your body are clearly relearning how to act. They are extra sensitive right now and should eventually begin to wear down to their normal state. When did you say you could feel your legs again? Richard watched his doctor and the young man beside him clean and put away the kit. There was a droplet of blood running down his calf, but no one seemed to mind. He sighed and rubbed his head, trying to focus. They had poked and prodded him like he was only a cow. Hopefully, this was the first and last time. Three weeks ago, he explained. To the day, I was getting some help sitting in my chair and realized I could feel the cold hands through the socks. Carmichael made a note on his desk. Ah, and what were you doing when that happened? Sitting, Richard shrugged. Before then. Had anything happened just before you felt that? His mind flashed back to that wolf. He could feel the weight of the animal on him again. His hand slipped over to his arm that was healing nicely. Richard nodded slowly. There was, well, I jumped out of my chair, onto the ground. There was a wolf trying to attack us, he added, when the doctor in training raised his eyebrow. The young man had no name at the moment and hadn't said a word, but Richard could feel the judgment from across the room. A fall. Carmichael rubbed his chin. You took a fall where you were paralyzed, then another fall. It could do with the alignment of your spine. We can study the vertebrae. If only we had more equipment to really know. Ah, but we'll work with what we have. You... Take this back to the front desk. The nameless doctor in training accepted the tray and left. Richard watched him go before turning back to Dr. Carmichael. Well, he asked, trying not to sound too hopeful. What do you think? Will I walk again? Taking a seat, Carmichael shrugged. Yes, no, perhaps. The damage is not as severe as I had been worried it was. Your spine looks to be in place for the most part, and all that feeling in your legs is certainly promising. If things go just right, there is a chance you won't need the chair anymore. Perhaps a cane. I would think you could be walking in about a year or two. His heart stopped. Two years? That's a long time. Just because the accident happened in a moment does not mean that is how long the healing process takes, his doctor reminded him gently. 
Your body needs to relearn itself and understand what it means to walk. 20 years ago, and no one would even try to help you walk again. But with my methods, I believe that you will eventually be able to stand and walk again. Is that enough for you? Richard inhaled deeply as he considered the man's words. They weren't exactly what he had been hoping to hear. After all, he hadn't expected to stay beyond a few weeks, perhaps a month. But a year was impossible to imagine. But he could feel that itch in his soul. He wanted to walk again. He needed to be able to walk again. Richard thought of Jacob and the ranch, of Mrs. Pennyworth and of Louise. Nodding, he accepted his fate. Then let's get started, he announced. Chapter 33 The blankets were rough. They were threadbare and tickled her cheek. That's what woke Louise up from her dreams. Upon opening her eyes, she realized she had slept late. Startled, she sat up to stare at the window. What time is it? she asked. There was no one to answer. Louise frowned and looked around in confusion. The morning sleepiness stretched for her from the back of her head, but she gave her head a shake and forced herself to focus. They were going to be late to his appointment. Louise gasped, starting again. This time, she jumped out of the bed, untangling herself from the sheets. She hurried about to wash her face and brush her hair. Every couple of seconds, she ran to the window to check on the rising sun. An hour late, she supposed. Though she wanted to go next door to rouse Richard, she needed to look decent before stepping out into the hall and before talking to him. She was focused as she finished dressing for the day ahead of them. It was going to be nerve-wracking, she supposed, the appointment they had set up with his doctor. Louise braided her hair and tied it off at the end with a ribbon bow. She wanted to look decent for Richard and for the town. One last deep breath, and then she felt she was ready. She just hoped Richard felt the same way. Though they had already met with the clinic to set up the appointment and discuss his situation, this was the day they would decide on what might happen next. The regimen for his health and seeing about getting him to walk again. It would be a long day, but a good one, she prayed. Louise slipped on her shoes before stepping into the hall. She could hear voices down below and the sweet smell of Cajun spices floated all around. It brought back pleasant memories of her childhood, and she couldn't help but smile. Though she knew Louisiana wasn't where she was meant to be all her life, there were still pleasant things about the people and the cities there. She shook her head to clear her mind and focus on the task at hand. If she had slept in, then Richard might have as well. They were supposed to go together, and she worried that she had made them late. Rapping on his door, she listened for movement. She knocked five times and then paused. There wasn't a sound. Richard, she called softly, not wanting to disturb anyone else in the building. Richard, it's morning and we're going to be late. Are you awake? When she didn't hear any response, Louise frowned and knocked again but there was nothing on the other side. It took her a minute to gather her courage, and then she wrapped her hand around the doorknob and opened the door. The room looked similar to her own, a bed, a small table with a basin of water, a chair, and a fireplace. But there was no one in the room. Richard was gone. Her heart skipped a beat. Inhaling sharply, Louise swallowed. Where could he be? Frowning, she shook her head and tried to think. Just because he wasn't in his room didn't mean anything bad had happened. That he was hurt or in danger? Perhaps he was just around the corner. Richard could even be waiting downstairs for her. She swallowed the nerves inside before closing the door. She glanced further down the hall before turning to the stairs. 
Her hand took the railing to use it for support on her way down. The heat in the building worked better up the stairs. As she went down, she could feel the cold creeping into her bones. It didn't snow much there, but somehow the icy chill crept in the further she went. A shiver ran down her spine as she reached the final step. Louise looked around expectantly, her fingers leaving the railing on the wall. If Richard wasn't in his room, then he might have wanted to come down without having her watch him crawl down the stairs. That's how it had gone the night before. But as she searched the quiet hall and the large sitting room with coffee tables nearby, Louise couldn't find Richard's familiar head of blonde hair. Even the chair they left down in the corner was gone. Her mouth dropped open, no longer able to deny the obvious. He wasn't in the building. Your gentleman already left for the clinic. Louise jumped, putting a hand over her heart. She whirled around to find Ray sitting in the back corner, holding a cup of tea. The dark drink left purple stains on the woman's lips as she offered her beaming smile. It appeared to be the only kind she had. I beg your pardon, Louise asked, wondering if she had heard right. Ray nodded and gestured to the door. You know where he is, sweet thing. Go on, then. Not needing to be told again, Louise turned to the door and hurried out. The cold wind whipped at her face as she hastened down the street. Her thoughts scrambled to keep up with her. Had he really left her that morning on purpose? What if he had tried to wake her, but she wouldn't wake up? Louise didn't think she was a deep sleeper, but people could change. She wondered what had happened, unable to stop worrying for him until she saw him again. Upon her arrival, she was directed down the hall to the third room on the left. Louise hastily fiddled with her hair as she headed in that direction. But before she ever reached the door, it opened and she saw those familiar boots. They rested on the footstool as Richard wheeled himself out of the room. She pulled up short in surprise. Louise swallowed, clutching her skirt as her eyes darted across Richard to make sure he was well. His shirt was hardly wrinkled, and he didn't appear upset. If anything, his lightly parted lips showed a ghost of a smile. He glanced back at Dr. Gregory Carmichael, who stood in the doorway. Louise. Richard nodded to her as he pulled up. What are you doing here? A strand of hair fell into her face. Louise clumsily pushed it back as she turned her gaze back down to him. I, well, I could ask the same thing. Don't you have your first appointment today? Richard glanced at the doctor behind him and waved. Dr. Carmichael waved back and disappeared behind his door. She bit her tongue as she turned back to Richard. I did, he answered her. You didn't need to come. She stepped aside as he started to wheel himself down the hall. For a moment, she reached out to help him, but he kept moving. A moment later, and he was too far away. Louise hesitated before hurrying after him. Confused, she tried to think of the day before. Hadn't they said they would do this together? That's why she was there with him. But Richard, Louise said as she hurried after him, I was going to support you. I'm afraid I slept in, but, but you're more than welcome to wake me early. I like mornings and I wanted to be here for you. I wanted to be here for your appointment. He sighed as they reached the front door. But I don't. You don't have to stay here by my side. I was thinking about it, Louise. If you want to, you can go on home. You're near your parents' home, aren't you? Awful close. It looked like he was going to say more, but she cut him off. She shook her head. No, she told him determinedly. I came here to be with you, Richard. That's what I wanted, not them, you. She opened the door for them and returned into the sunlight. Louise glanced around, squinting in the brightness, 
before turning to Richard as he cleared his throat. She noticed absently he hadn't shaved, but there was color in his cheeks. Are you certain? he asked her. Though she didn't mean to be rude, Louise cut Richard off from the path to make sure he looked at her. Then she nodded adamantly. I came to support you. I want to be by your side every step of the way. If, if you'll let me. Her strength started to fade as she wondered if she would agree to leave if he demanded it. What if he truly didn't want her there? She knew everything between them wasn't perfect. She knew how much he was struggling and how this might hurt his pride. But she knew there was a good man within Richard and that he was close. Besides, he needed support, and she didn't want to go home. It seemed like a lifetime ago with people she loved, but who no longer needed her in their lives. Louise was ready for something new. All she needed was Richard to realize this, to wake up and consider what they could have if they tried together. Her eyes flitted back up to him as he glanced around, no longer looking her in the eye. He ruffled his hair and then began to nod. All right, all right, she repeated faintly. He licked his lips and danced his fingers on top of the armrests. All right, I talked to Carmichael and he said there's promise. It might take about a year, but he thinks there's hope. A year, she asked as her eyes widened. Richard froze as she grinned. That's hardly any time at all. It's not a lifetime. Why, I think that's wonderful. She would do anything to support the good man who wrote those letters to her. Already Louise was thinking about the life in Louisiana she could show him. While it was definitely no Oklahoma, at least they would have time to relax. And by the time he was healed and walking, they would be more than ready to return to the wild open space on his ranch. Her heart soared as everything felt just right. Really? His eyebrow raised high. There would be letters to write to explain the news. Letters to her family and letters to Jacob and Mrs. Pennyworth. Louise wondered what Luann would want to do. Perhaps they could visit in a few months if Richard felt up for the adventure. It didn't matter if he was or was not so long as he still wanted her by his side. She hadn't liked that morning, feeling lost and forgotten. She prayed quickly for it to never happen again. Louise nodded as she pushed her hair back over her shoulders. Of course, we should do something to celebrate. I believe there's a river nearby with the prettiest ducks. Shall we go find them? It's cold out here, but it's a lovely day. His eyes probed hers for a moment, before he slowly decided to acquiesce. I suppose. I can tell you on the way what Dr. Carmichael said. She grinned. Yes, I would like that. After Louise inhaled deeply, she looked around and gestured down the next lane. That's where they would go next. After that, she wasn't certain. But so long as she was beside Richard, all would be well. Chapter 34 For the last ten or so years of his life, Richard had worked within a satisfying rhythm. There was a pattern to the way he lived and worked. He would rise early to dress and milk the cows. The chickens would be fed and then he'd check on the cattle in the valley before returning to the house to eat. After that, he would work some more. Move the cattle, clear the land. There was always something to do out there in the valley that would fill his day. Even with help from the occasional ranch hand, there was plenty of work to be done. The afternoon would come together until the sun had passed overhead. Soon, it would be time for supper. He'd round up his tasks and head on in for the evening. Sometimes he'd do some light reading or talk with Mrs. Pennyworth and Jacob. Now, that was a world away. Richard woke up every morning still expecting the dry air of Oklahoma in his lungs. 
but the humidity of Louisiana would wrap him in a damp hug to tell him otherwise. He would dress and then pull himself down the stairs in the lodge to eat a light meal with Louise. Often Ray would join, regaling them with wild stories that might be true and about the gossip around town that Louise knew quite a lot about. Afterward, they would head on down to the clinic for his exercises. It included a lot of silly work, like rubbing his legs for an hour, then stretching his entire body over and over again. Some of them required help from a nurse or even from Louise. In a few other exercises, like the stretches, she often joined in and claimed to compete with who could stretch the most. The stretching took all morning. They'd break for a short meal and return to the exercises. Dr. Carmichael only prescribed a couple of hours, but Richard and Louise had decided to add to his regimen to fill more time as long as he felt up to the activity. And when they decided they were done, they would leave. This gave them time to take walks around town, explore the northern markets, and spend quiet evenings at the lodge. They listened to musicians who passed through, waved to children, and talked to strangers about their stories. It was a new rhythm, but Richard didn't mind. Though the days at the clinic were long and frustrating, there was something refreshing about the recent change of pace and Louise had continued to shine in a way that he couldn't ignore. Her enthusiasm had annoyed him at first, but there was something refreshing about it that he couldn't set aside, especially since Dr. Carmichael shared her hope about his possible improvements. There were no promises, only hope. Louise, with her bright eyes and cheerful smile, was enough to make him work hard every day. I don't know about this, Richard said, staring at the bars ahead of him as he shook his head. Dr. Carmichael touched the parallel bars that were set up rather tall, most likely to his armpits that he could use to rest on. The doctor explained that he could start practicing moving his legs in the walking motion again. You'll eventually go down to the smaller set, he gestured across the room. But... These should help hold you up. Your body needs to retain muscle memory of how to walk, and this will be the best way to manage that. Louise inspected the bars carefully, walking around them. She was very studious in learning everything she could and making sure everything worked out right with the best of the tools and care. Her eyes studied the structure before testing her own grip on one of the bars. On the other side, Richard glanced up at them. He would have to reach from his chair to heft himself up. Already, his body ached after some difficult stretches that morning. It was hard work, tiring work. February was nearly over, and he was beginning to doubt his abilities. What if he never walked again? It'll be hard on his shoulders, Louise noted. The doctor nodded. At first, yes, but eventually his legs will learn to take his weight again. This is to ensure that when he can walk, his legs are ready to carry the rest of his body. The legs are no use if they cannot manage the weight. I suppose she accepted his answer before lifting her gaze to Richard from across the bars. It couldn't be more than ten feet. Are you ready, Richard? Now they look twenty feet apart. He glanced back at his doctor, who gave him a grin before stepping back to check in with a nurse who had stepped up to catch his attention for a moment. Richard turned back to Louise. Her eyes were bright with hope, possibly too much hope. He blinked and focused on the bars. They could hardly be more than an inch thick. What if they didn't hold him? What if they broke? He didn't like the idea of falling any more than he had to. There were bruises all over his body to prove that happened too often. But Louise was there. A tightness enveloped his chest. He couldn't disappoint her. 
Over their time together, he'd begun to realize his mistake with how he had treated her. Louise was a special woman whom he didn't deserve. She was too clever and too kind. Though he had offered to send her off several times, she refused. It had bothered him at first. He was ashamed of his weakness. But over and over, she proved that she didn't mind. Not only that, but she cared for him. Every day, she offered him a smile and the possibility of a bright day. There was a lot he had to do to make up for his unkindness toward her. That gave him the courage he needed to roll his chair forward to the parallel bars. Richard moved his legs off the footrest of his chair, and after taking a deep breath, he reached up for the bars. Wonderful, Louise beamed. Are you comfortable? He adjusted to tuck the beams under his arms as much as possible. It kept him from using all his energy in his arms and instead spread it through his shoulders and back. Then he gave her a pointed look because she never asked that question at an appropriate time. Right. She bit her lip through a smile as she remembered. What I mean is, you did wonderfully, and I hope you are ready to move along the bar, right this way to me. When he glanced at the floor, Richard wondered why it looked so far away. That's how he had lived since growing that tall. Now that's how far he would fall if he wasn't careful. Richard shook his head and turned back to Louise. She was prettier to look at than the floor. I don't know, he swallowed. I'm just supposed to what, pull myself across? She opened her mouth, but Dr. Carmichael was still busy. She turned back to Richard. Yes, she offered, as though she were the doctor. You will pull yourself across while you are moving your legs. Can you do that? One after the other? You mean walking, he pointed out shortly. On occasion, he couldn't help himself but Louise didn't seem to notice. Richard cleared his throat as he scolded himself. Whatever you want to call it, Louise said instead, simply do it. Come right this way over to me. The instructions sounded simple, but already Richard could feel the tightness in his chest building. He gripped the bars carefully and looked back down. It would be a long way to fall, he was tired of falling. But then, Louise called his name again and he looked up. His heart pounded in his chest as she smiled at him, waving and urging him over. She had left her hair loose that day. It looked like warm honey slipping over her shoulders. Any irritation he'd felt toward her lately disappeared. All she wanted was to help him achieve his wish to walk again. Louise had put aside her life with her friends and family in order to be there with him. She didn't complain, merely asked that she wasn't ignored. And there she went, smiling and cheering him up any moment he appeared to struggle. If he couldn't do this for himself, Richard decided, he could at least do this for her. You better not leave, he warned her with a smile of his own, trying to keep the mood light. Of course not, Louise assured him adamantly. Not until you make your way right here in front of me. He felt a bead of sweat trickle down his back. All the way? I thought just a few steps. Or whatever might happen, he added. Only then did he realize that he should have remained sitting until they were finished talking. Swallowing, he listened to Louise urge him on. After another deep breath, Richard realized he had to move forward or hope he fell back into his chair. He shook a strand of hair out of his face and then glanced at the lower half of his body. It was mostly wiggling his hips around. That was most of what he could do. His feet dragged behind him as he moved his weight around. It was like crawling in thin air. Richard had never thought himself a heavy man especially since Mrs. Pennyworth always claimed he was too thin. But now he could feel himself 
starting to droop. Halfway there, Louise pointed out to him. You're so close, Richard. You're nearly finished. Just a few more steps. Lift your feet. Your legs will remember. Right. He had hardly moved them so far. They were still dragging behind him. Richard brought his hips forward, and after some struggling, he managed to set a foot down properly on the ground. He froze in the moment. Louise gasped. Yes. Just like that, Richard. Can you do it again? Though he wasn't certain of the answer, he nodded furiously. He wanted to do it. He had to be able to do it. He could feel it in his body that this was right. His legs still knew how to walk, even if he couldn't put his weight on them yet. Working through that familiar motion felt like a fresh summer breeze. It took him a moment, but soon he maneuvered his left foot to do the same. Louise squealed, clapping lightly. That's perfect. He gathered the courage and strength for another step. But as he raised his head to look at her, the brightness in her eyes caught his attention, just as he tried to lift his right leg. It wasn't enough, causing him to stumble. That caused his weight to shift, and before he knew it, he was falling. There wasn't enough time to cry out before collapsing on the hard floor. Richard, Louise yelped loudly. When he opened his eyes, she was already by his side. She took his arm as she hovered over him with concern written across her face. I'm fine, he assured her before she could say anything. Or at least I will be, he added, seeing as he was still lying on the floor. He made a silly face that made her giggle. Help me up? She nodded scooting back on her knees. Of course, of course, yes. It took a moment of wrestling and balance and chuckles before he was sitting up again. Louise stretched to the side to fix his leg so he would be more comfortable. He hadn't asked her, but she already knew. She always knew just what to do. Wishing he could do that as well, Richard found his heart hammering in his chest as he said her name. Louise? The young woman glanced up. While he was planning to simply thank her, he found himself reaching out to take her face in his free hand. She came willingly. Her hand covered his on her cheek. In the next moment, her lips were on his. Louise was soft and sweet, though even better than he had imagined. She fit his lips in a way that he didn't know was possible. The world melted away in a heartbeat. The moment reminded him of the first letter she had sent and the way it had made him feel. Richard, someone cleared their throat. It was Louise who pulled away first. Her eyes were wide as she looked up. He reluctantly followed, not wanting to forget what had just happened. Dr. Carmichael stood before them with the nurse he had been talking to a moment ago. They had brought over his wheelchair to him and were poorly suppressing amused smiles. But Richard found that, for a minute, he didn't care about anything, not after that kiss. Chapter 35 Springtime was in the air. Louise could hardly believe how quickly time was flying by. Easter had recently ended, and the flowers were in full bloom in Gramercy. Walking through the market, that was more than clear to see. She lifted a hand, smiling, to brush against the bundles of flowers for sale. They were yellow and purple and white and pink. She could even smell it in the air. Louise inhaled deeply, wondering how she had grown so fortunate. Her life was falling into a rhythm again, and she could hardly believe it. This wasn't Oklahoma but she didn't let that disappoint her. Louisiana was still very much her home, and there was comfort around the familiarity of such a place. The weather, the streets, the people, all of it. Richard was learning to embrace the world there as well. He didn't like the crowds. He didn't like the noise. But he was trying hard, both to heal and enjoy the world around him. There were difficult days, of course. 
after a few hard falls and bruises, after straining his muscles when he tried too fast, there were hiccups in the road to recovery. Dr. Carmichael said those were to be expected, especially after a rough morning. He'd woken up in a lot of pain, and after she talked to his doctor, they said to give it a few days. That only frustrated Richard more. Because he couldn't find the strength to leave his bed, she thought it best to give him time to rest. And if she could find him a treat to enjoy, hopefully that would brighten his mood. Louise considered her options. He might enjoy some fresh fruit, something rare that one hardly found in Oklahoma, or a sweet treat. She wandered the shops, eyeing items as she went. This was the only market in Gramercy, one she didn't visit often. After all, the New Orleans markets were the best in the area. Everyone knew that. But it was probably better, she supposed. New Orleans was further away. And besides, she was close enough to home that every day she ran the risk of running into her family. Not that it would be a terrible thing to do, she told herself. It would only be confusing since they still believed her to be in Oklahoma. That's what she and Luann had written to tell them. They were safe in the West, having a lovely time with the gentleman. No guaranteed return date yet. But surely her parents wouldn't mind. The two of them had plenty of projects and clubs and work to focus their attentions on. Lorelei, on the other hand, was sorely missed. Pausing by a bread shop, Louise noticed the cinnamon rolls. Lorelei's favorite. She sighed and wondered again if she should visit home. Or she could just find a way to talk to her sister. For a minute, she wondered if that would be possible. To reach out to her younger sister and hug her again. Tell her everything that had happened since they had last seen one another. A lump formed in her throat. Louise hurried inside and went to the counter. Two cinnamon rolls, please she requested, exchanging the money in return for the treats. On her way out, she ducked her head and inhaled the sweet scent. It was delightful. Louise Mercedes Soleil Moreau? Eyes wide, she jerked her head up. No one had said her full name in a long time, not since her father had been upset with the last book she had brought home. A cold shiver ran down her spine in dismay. It couldn't be. There wasn't a chance in all the world that either of her parents would be there, but that didn't stop the thumping in her heart. Her eyes darted around the marketplace, through the foods and baskets and ribbons. It had to be her imagination. That was the only logical reason. As she told herself this over and over, she prepared to hurry off back the way she had come except it was too late. Louise yelped as she felt a familiar hand grab her elbow. It reminded her of too many moments in her childhood when she was being pulled back to the house, back in the room, back into order when all she wanted to do was run free or read. She whirled back around with wide eyes, shocked to find her mother standing before her. Mother, Louise couldn't find any other words. Mrs. Lacey Moreau looked as lovely as usual in her fine dress and decked out in lace that softened her sharp figure. Her hair was perfectly coiffed, and even her nails shone in the sunlight. The fine lady stood with her shoulders back, standing as straight as a statue. Instantly, Louise felt recalled back to her youth. She moved her own shoulders back and stuck her chin out as though ready for a scolding. Her stomach tightened as well, but that didn't help much. It only made it harder for her to breathe. What, pray tell, are you doing here in town? Mrs. Moreau asked. Her brow furrowed, and by the jaw lock, she was angry. A woman could never be upset out in public. Louise felt her mother's nails dig into her arm so she couldn't move. Her heart was still hammering loudly in her chest. She tried to think, but the thumping was just so loud. I, 
She tried to smile. It's good to see you, mother. Of course it is, her mother responded sharply. It's always wonderful to see family, but usually that is through an expected arrival. How long have you been here? I don't see your bags. Yesterday? Last week? What if someone saw you and told me? If I didn't know my own daughter had returned to town, who are you even with? Louise, if you're staying with the Wrens, I swear. She shook her head at the memory of Jeremy Wrens, known well throughout the area for his spoiled and selfish ways. Though her family kept close connections with the otherwise kind and popular family, Jeremy was unavoidable. Louise had hardly thought of them or anyone else since reaching Louisiana. You raised me better than that, she assured her mother. And I didn't do it on purpose, Mother We, Louise hesitated to say too much. Richard's story was his own. She swallowed and glanced around to see who was nearby. That reminded her mother as well that they were out in public. The tight grip on her arm loosened. Her mother inhaled deeply before taking a step closer to slip her arm in so they were beside one another. Let's walk, the woman advised as they pulled themselves together. She sniffed politely, pulled her parasol up to shade them both from the bright sun, and started them down the trail. Mrs. Moreau was well known throughout the entire town. People cleared the way for her as they walked. It made Louise uncomfortable, not looking for attention. She liked being anonymous in a crowd, lost to all but herself. But she had grown up with the woman as her mother. Louise accepted the inevitable. Her mother had wanted her to go to Oklahoma, after all. Louise had left with her mother's blessing. If she hadn't given it, Louise wasn't certain if she really would have had the courage to leave her home. They walked down the lane and took a turn before either of them could find the right words. The shock faded, and the anger softened into frustration. Her mother took her hand and rubbed it softly, as though to remember the touch. I missed you, Louise offered softly. But there's been so much happening. You're not alone? Her mother asked her sternly. Hurriedly, she shook her head. No, no, not at all. Well, right now, yes. But no, I traveled with Richard Hansen. Yes, the gentleman I went to visit out west. Did you wed? Of course Louise knew that would be the next question. She inhaled to prepare herself for her mother's anticipated response. No, not yet. Mrs. Moreau's entire body stiffened tightening her grip on Louise. And why ever not? She asked through gritted teeth. If people know you've been traveling unescorted, where are you even staying? Louise, this is nonsense. Mother, Louise pleaded. Please listen to me. Please stop worrying about all the people you may or may not know. Everything has been just fine. I mean it, honestly. We took the train, and that was decent. Then we've had our separate rooms at Mr. Seary's lodge. Her mother stewed for a minute. A lodge? For travelers? Oh, if anyone hears my daughter has been in town and not been with me, to stay in a lodge mere streets from your home. Any decent person would assume you were hiding something. This makes no sense. I can't understand what you must have been thinking. It's quite unreasonable for such a smart girl like yourself. You know I would welcome you home with open arms. Your father as well. Louise sighed. Only minutes after a family reunion with her mother and she was being scolded. The hand on hers lightened its grip, however, and she leaned into the other woman. It was annoying, but it was expected and she couldn't help admitting that there was something comforting about having her mother beside her again. It's complicated, Louise articulated carefully. We're here because of the healing clinic. 
Mrs. Moreau stopped to give her a good look. You don't mean McCoy's clinic, do you? Where Lorelei visits every summer, whatever for. What's wrong with you? She licked her lips. It's not me, she admitted. It's Richard. There was an accident. We came for his health so that he might learn to walk again. The doctor has high hopes, Louise added hurriedly. He is making progress, and I'm very proud of him. Grudgingly, she explained what had happened to Richard and why they had not come to visit. Though her mother appeared to understand at first, she soon requested that they come to the house for supper. I can't have my potential son-in-law in town and not meet him, her mother reminded her sternly. Louise hesitated. I don't know, she mumbled. I don't think Richard would like this idea. He doesn't want to meet you until he has greatly improved. I think that's understandable, don't you? Her mother shot her a look. It would be if the two of you were simply passing through town. How long will you two be here? You clearly don't have a timeline for when he will be healed. No, I won't accept any more nonsense. You know I'll be telling your father everything tonight. I insist that you both join us for Sunday supper. I'll try, Louise reluctantly promised, as she recalled Richard's words upon their arrival in Louisiana. But I don't know about Richard. He wasn't going to like her news. Dropping her gaze to the cinnamon rolls in their paper bag, she wondered if she could persuade him to change his mind. She would find out one way or another. Chapter 36 It was humid. Even inside with open windows, it felt like he had climbed out of a tub and put his clothes on while wet. And it was hardly summer. Richard wiped his brow before taking another drink. This was his second glass, and it wasn't even noon. He sighed and shook his head. Can I refill that for you? Louise picked herself up from her seat, setting her book down. With their day spent at the McCoy Clinic, he didn't want her boring herself, especially when he was doing the same thing over and over. When she wasn't stretching with him or cheering him on, she was reading. Some days she read aloud or described the stories, or she sat quietly in her own little world. Though he liked listening to Louise root for him, Richard worried that he bored her. Through his time at the clinic, even as he improved, he found himself thinking about her more. Whether they were together or not, he couldn't get Louise off his mind. He wondered if this was what it meant to love someone, to always think about them, worry about them, and want the best for them. It was taking him a long time to understand. But as he spent every day with Louise, he found himself eager for more time together. Richard couldn't get enough time with Louise. He didn't want to scare her. He knew he hadn't been the easiest person to be around. As his body grew stronger and healed, he knew he could have been kinder to her. Though he wanted to have her around all the time, Richard didn't want to suffocate her with attention. And no matter what he did, she stayed by his side. Thank you, he nodded as he handed her his glass. Is it really always this warm? She chuckled. I told you, Richard, that's just how Louisiana is. I should take you to see some real swampland if you think this is extreme. Chuckling, he shook his head at her. I think I prefer the snow. It's much nicer, colder, but I'd take that over this weather. Louise tucked a strand of hair behind her ear. I like the snow, too, she agreed. Now get back to the parallel bars. By the time you finish, I should have returned with a fresh glass of cold water. That sounds wonderful. Richard dropped his gaze from her eyes to her lips. He still remembered how she tasted that day on the floor. It still felt like yesterday, and every time he saw her, there was that surge of white-hot desire to kiss her again. 
It made him feel alive in a way he had never known. Everything had changed for him when Louise came into his life. Richard was still thinking that as he watched her exit the room. There was a swing to her hips as she cheerfully walked around the corner to the clinic kitchen. She was happy. He found himself learning more about her, and it amazed him. She amazed him. Louise was bright and clever and kind. Nothing made her happier than to read a book or have a cheerful conversation. The only things that she didn't like or smile at were difficult conversations, such as several ones they'd had shortly after his accident or lunches out with her parents. He had learned that she adored her younger sister and cautiously believed her parents loved her. Apparently, it was a complicated relationship. That was one of the reasons she had wanted a life out west with a man who liked a smart woman. Every time she visited with her parents, Louise returned much quieter and more subdued. It was clear that she would speak more carefully to check her words and correct every little action. Though it made her appear more refined, he could see the confused frustration in her eyes. Well, Richard glanced up to see one of the nurses, Miss Taylor, with her hands on her hips. Right. He shifted in his chair and tugged himself back to the bars. I just needed a break. The woman laughed. Of course you did when your girl was here. Take the time without her now to actually get some work done. Use your feet this time. But what about my arms, he asked her innocently. Miss Taylor rolled her eyes as they got down to business. He was on the small parallel bars now, using only part of his weight to shift around as he walked. May brought the humidity and rain, as well as an improvement in his healing process. Everyone had told him repeatedly that he was making great progress and he was beginning to feel it. His eyes darted about the gym, seeing other people in their own disabled conditions, working with nurses and doctors to stretch and heal. There were groans and the occasional tears, but overall it was a cheerful place filled with hope. Richard returned his focus to his bars. Pulling himself up to them, he inhaled deeply as he set his legs on the ground. It was much easier lately to imagine himself walking again, maybe even running. Both hands on the bars set by his side, he tried to relax his body. For good luck, he wiggled his toes. Then he put one foot forward. It shook lightly from all the exertion he had already put forth that day. He tightened his grip on the bars and moved forward. Richard? He answered the unsaid question. I'm fine. Another deep breath and another step. It was hard, but he was determined. Just a week ago, he had talked to Louise to brighten her up after her last luncheon with her parents. He had promised that if everything went well, he would dance with her next year. It was all he wanted. Louise would twirl in his arms, a smile on her face, and that sweet light in her eyes. He wanted to do that for her. He wanted to be that man for her. He wanted to be able to provide and protect like a man should. All he had to do was learn to walk again. Miss Taylor cheered him on as he took one step after another. Sweat dripped down his forehead. He could feel his palms growing clammy with effort. But the parallel bars only lasted so long, and soon he had reached the end. Chest heaving, he looked up with a proud grin. Miss Taylor nodded with a short clap. That was when his doctor showed up with two long staffs in his hands. Crutches, Dr. Carmichael announced as he held them up. You've been improving, and I think your legs are ready for some extra work. I'd recommend the use of these for a couple of hours a day, but not too long since we don't want to damage any progress we've made. Richard stared. Though his doctor believed 
that his legs were strong enough to support him, he wasn't sure he did. There was a tickle on his nose, but while his arms were keeping him up, there was nothing he could do about it. He stared down the crutches before glancing back up at his audience. All right, he swallowed and gave a short nod. Bring them over. They had to at least be worth a try. It took some work to fix his balance to switch from the parallel bars over to one crutch at a time, but Miss Taylor and Dr. Carmichael were there to keep him standing when he wavered. He had learned to swallow his pride and soon found himself standing with the support of the crutches. How does it feel? his doctor asked as he took a step back. The man crossed his arms and grinned. They were padded in his armpits with a solid grip for his hands. Richard glanced down as he had to think again how he would use them. Though he managed to balance them decently while not putting any weight on his feet, he would have to move them to step forward. He gave it a try. Sweat continued to trickle down his forehead as he shifted his weight and brought the right hand crutch forward. He moved his feet, his legs shaking with effort. Then the other crutch came forward, where he was able to bring himself completely into a new spot. Oh, Louise arrived from down the hall. Though yards away, he could see her surprised smile. Hurrying over with her two cups of water, she grinned at him. Look at you. Look at me, he nodded in return. As she arrived, the nurse and doctor took a step back to give them a moment. Louise set the glasses down and clasped her hands together. You look wonderful. What do you think? Are those crutches comfortable? Richard shrugged, wavering slightly as he stood. He managed to chuckle before responding. More comfortable than sitting in a chair every hour of the day. Giggling, she took another step forward. Shyly, she reached forward and touched them, then his shoulder. You're so tall when you stand straight. You look so strong. I mean, I mean, you already did. I know you were, but... Why, you look like you could almost go dancing right now. His eyes met hers. A surge of light hope flooded his chest. I almost could. Overjoyed, she giggled again and covered her mouth with her hands. This is wonderful. You're making such good progress. To think it's only been a few months. I knew you could do anything you wanted. This is so exciting. There's a lot more I can do in crutches now, he allowed, hoping the heat he felt on his face didn't show. Louise nodded. Yes, we can go to the market, to the shows. Oh, you can meet my parents now, Richard. Right, I can. What? She nodded. You said once you were standing again, you would be comfortable meeting them. Now you can stand. I told you my mother wants so dearly to meet you. Why, we could visit them on Sunday. What do you think? Dropping his gaze from hers, Richard hesitated. The surge of excitement faded as he fiddled with the crutches. I'm not sure about that, Louise. I'm not fully recovered yet, he said. I don't, I don't want to disappoint them, or you, he added hurriedly when he saw the smile fade. But it was too late. Louise dropped her hands and bit her lip. I just thought she started but didn't finish. Richard hurriedly explained. It's only that I meant when I'm much better, not when I'm barely standing. They would expect more, wouldn't they? At this point, I can't even shake hands. I... Except his excuses did nothing to lessen the clear disappointment across Louise's face. She wrapped her arms around herself as she shrugged. Right, I... I didn't think about... Dr. Carmichael stepped forward. Miss Louise, why don't you take a seat? It's a warm day and I need to speak to Richard privately. She wouldn't look up. Sighing, she nodded and went back to her seat. Richard watched Louise go, a new weight settling on his shoulders. That was all his fault. 
He fiddled with the crutches as his doctor walked over. Louise Moreau is a wonderful woman, the doctor told him quietly. To be quite frank, her family has quite a golden reputation in town for their charity. Louise is nothing less. You found a good woman, Richard. If I were you, I shouldn't risk losing her. With a sigh, Richard nodded. It took all his courage to raise his head to meet his doctor's gaze before looking over to Louise. Trust me, he sighed. I'm learning my mistakes as I make them. The other man stepped back to stretch his arms out. Then, perhaps you should make it right and test out those crutches as you go. Richard prevented himself from rolling his eyes as he turned toward Louise. His doctor was right once again. He didn't know what he had been thinking. This entire trip was about his wellness, and she had yet to complain. The least he could do was support her as she wished. Even if this meant spending time with parents who made her anxious and would most likely not approve of him, Richard licked his lips as he slowly made his way over to Louise. The walk gave him time to build an apology and propose a date in the future to meet her parents. He wasn't thrilled at the possibility, but perhaps it was time. After all, Louise had been with him long enough, and he knew he didn't want to lose her. He had done enough to hurt her, more than enough, and it was important that he show that he cared for her. It was time he stopped caring about himself. The one thing he knew with all his heart was that he wanted to be dancing with Louise Moreau by the next year, and to do that, he would need her parents. Chapter 37 A month after Richard started testing the crutches, he accepted the formal invitation from her parents to attend supper. The week leading up to the event kept Louise's stomach in knots. She wasn't officially courting Richard, or rather, he wasn't officially courting her. Either way, she wasn't certain. They hadn't talked about it. Though they had held hands in the park a few times, there had been no more kisses. Louise didn't know what they were to each other, only that she was very anxious about Richard Hansen finally meeting her parents. As they reached the family courtyard, she could tell he was growing nervous as well. Thank you, Louise nodded to Stefan, the family coachman, as he brought them around to the front doors. My pleasure. The older gentleman gave her a short bow as he helped her down. He had been working for her family since before she was born, and it was nice to see some things hadn't changed. As he helped Richard, Louise took the opportunity to turn back to her house and look at it frankly. It was beautiful, with soft colored stones and intricately made iron gates leading up to the door. The balcony overlooked the nearby streets and parks, having been one of her favorite places to sit when she couldn't read a book. The French influences upon the large family house and courtyard were undeniable. It was beautiful, and many people often paused before the gate to get a better look and appreciate the home. Everyone knew the Moreau home and often used it as a landmark for passersby. But now it looked different. Louise couldn't place her finger on it exactly. Though as lovely as she remembered, it left her feeling mildly uncomfortable, almost as though it were no longer her home and she was only a guest. As Richard joined her up the seven steps to the door, she hesitated. Though often she could walk right in, now she found herself too hesitant to turn the doorknob. It was Richard who reached up and knocked. He balanced carefully on his crutches as he turned to her. Louise managed a smile though her cheeks flushed. In return, he gave her a wink, and they listened to the scurrying footsteps from behind the door. Louise! She shrieked in delight, as well as her sister Lorelei, as she threw her arms around her. They clung to each other, giggling. 
Lorelai had a busy schedule, so in the last two months of her family knowing she was in town, Louise had only seen her once. About time, Lorelai groaned. She squeezed her one more time before stepping back. She had the prettiest, softest hair Louise had ever seen that she tossed over her shoulder. Just seeing her again eased the stress in her shoulders as Louise beamed. Turning back to Richard, she offered a sheepish smile for having been so discourteous. Richard, this is my sister, Lorelai, Louise said. Lorelai, this is Richard Hansen. It's about time, her sister winked. Though Louise had already told Richard much about her family of late, including her younger sister's dwarfism, she had still been worried that he wouldn't know what to do when he met her sister. Many folks were still awkward about it and usually couldn't hide their frowns or disgust. It made her sick to her stomach that people didn't understand or care, but Richard surprised her again as he managed a shaky bow. I was just thinking the same thing. It's about time Louise stopped keeping us apart. You're even lovelier than she mentioned. Lorelai started to blush. It took all of Louise's effort not to chuckle. You're too kind, her sister muttered. There's no need to butter me up so quickly. Then she cleared her throat. Come along. Mother and father are just sitting down. She felt the blood fade from her face. We're late? Her sister waved a hand as she stepped back inside. Father insists on eating a little earlier every year. You know how he is, but I reminded them that Stefan can't clear the streets. Come in, then. Any coats? Hats? Louise shook her head, guiding the way. Richard followed, shuffling after her. They talked quietly after closing the door and making their way through the grand hall. The inside of their home was similar to the outside, with whitewashed halls and flowers everywhere. Extravagant chandeliers hung above their heads. Each time she glanced back at Richard, he was looking at something new with curiosity. She could still feel the heat on her face as they reached the dining room. There was the scraping of seats as her parents stood up upon her arrival. Lorelai made her way to her designated seat, as though she were leaving Louise alone to deal with her parents. All she had to do was remember that she had Richard beside her. Good evening, Louise announced hesitantly as she glanced up at her parents. She tried to smile for them. Mother, father, I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Richard Hansen. Richard, please meet my lovely parents, Mrs. Lacey Moreau and Mr. Lowell Moreau. It was her mother who welcomed Richard first. After kissing Louise's forehead, Mrs. Moreau stretched forth her hand to Richard with a large smile. She was wearing her pink pearl earrings, so she wanted to make a good impression. Well, well, Mrs. Moreau chuckled. If it isn't the cowboy who stole our daughter's heart, it's a pleasure to finally meet you, Richard. May I call you Richard? A lump formed in her throat. Her mother never tried to reach a first-name basis with anyone this early upon meeting them. But Louise didn't know what this meant. She hardly heard Richard's reply as she glanced at her father. Her father was tall with a head of silver hair and a fine mustache. Dressed in a vest, clearly chosen by his wife, he stepped forward and opened his arms. Louise hesitated before accepting the hug. Hello, father. It's good to see you again. Likewise, he replied before moving to offer a hand to Richard. And to you, young man, you look light on your feet. Come take a seat next to me. She shrugged when Richard glanced at her, and then they were seated to enjoy supper. Her father's favorite meal of beef tenderloin, potatoes dauphine, and croissants. She could even smell a chocolate souffle being prepared in the nearby kitchen. You're a farmer, Richard? Her mother asked. Richard cleared his throat. Actually, I'm a rancher, he volunteered. 
meaning I handle some farming and mostly cattle. My parents built on the land when my brother and I were children. We've had some good years and we're currently looking to grow. The West is full of space and we're really enjoying the opportunities before us. Space? Her father glanced up. Whatever do you need with space? We've lived here for years. We have plenty of space. Louise bit her tongue, wishing she could tell her parents to behave. No matter what she tried, Louise found her parents seeking to learn more about Richard. They wanted to learn, but they were overly critical of him, no matter what he said. As the evening wore on, she worried Richard was being worn down as well. That brings in enough to make a living? Her father asked with a raised eyebrow. Louise glanced at Richard, whose fingers danced lightly on the table. Her heart skipped a beat as she wondered if her parents were going to frighten him away. It does, he answered. But like I said, it's another world. It's a simple life. Even if there's a winter where we lose cattle, we might do all right with enough potatoes. You'd live off potatoes? Her mother repeated. It certainly is a different world. But it's a good one, Louise swallowed as she looked up. Honestly, it's lovely. I think you two would be amazed, and you'd be impressed by Richard's ranch. Her father scoffed lightly, but was silenced as their housemaid and cook, Marie, brought out the chocolate souffle. Everyone was distracted as they enjoyed dessert. As Marie returned to start clearing the table, her father raised a hand. Bring out some warm milk for the ladies, Marie, he instructed her. And brandy in the study. The gentlemen need to step out for a conversation. Louise straightened up. What? What conversation? Her eyes skittered over to Richard. It was hard to tell what he was thinking. Then she turned to her father, but the man showed nothing. Standing, her father looked to Richard. Shall we? Father, Louise started, but he shook his head at her. Well? Right, yes, Richard shifted hastily. The chair creaked loudly as he grabbed his crutches and started to stand at the same time. Soon he was standing, moving over to her father. They left quietly, and Louise stared after them. Then she turned to her mother. What was that about, she cried out. Her mother picked up her spoon. It's your father. What do you expect? They're men, Lorelai added. Perhaps father wants to talk business possibilities. Louise, what if he's going to ask for your hand in marriage? Flustered, Louise didn't know what to think. She shook her head as she stared at the half-eaten souffle. That's silly she replied. Her mother sat up straight. Never mind your father. I want you to tell me about that ranch. Is it as filthy as it sounds? Louise sighed. Though she tried to offer polite conversation, her eyes kept turning towards the doors. She hoped Richard was all right. Part of her wondered about what Lorelai had said. They hadn't talked about marriage. They had talked about dancing but that was all. Life had been going well for them lately, but she didn't want to put pressure on Richard, not while he was still healing. She had already accepted that she would need to wait for him. Louise hoped that he felt the same about her. Chapter 38 Richard eyed the man warily as he accepted the tall leather chair. Though Louise had been honest about her family's wealth, he hadn't taken it into consideration until that night. He'd never seen such a splendid house and garden. And now he was seated in Mr. Moreau's study with a large fireplace and shelves covered in hundreds of books. It brought his mind back to the ad he had sent about wanting an intelligent woman. But Richard would have never thought such a request would have brought him there. He had never planned to leave home, let alone visit Louise Moreau's family estate. 
the crutches fell, and he winced at the clatter. I'm sorry about that, he started before reaching for them. What are your intentions with Louise? Mr. Moreau's question made Richard stop. Closing his fist, he straightened up. He had been wondering if that's what this would be about. Marie stepped inside with the requested drinks. Neither man budged. The older man was tall, with thick shoulders and hands. He was clearly refined from the sharp twist of his mustache and his fine clothes. Part of Richard knew that the evening had been spent preparing to intimidate him. The other part of him refused to be cowed. I'd like to marry your daughter, sir. The words came out as confident as he could muster. And I'd like to have your permission, he added, to be courteous. The older gentleman drummed his fingers against the desk. You wish to take my daughter far away. How can I expect you to take good care of her when your livelihood depends upon the weather? It had been a while since anyone addressed him in this manner. While he respected Mr. Moreau for wanting to protect his daughter, Richard recalled how Louise had mentioned that it was her father who thought that women shouldn't read. One could consider that everyone's livelihoods depend on the weather. In storms, one can't travel to town to practice law. Shops can't open if people can't leave their homes. No job is perfect, and there are always limitations, Richard allowed. But there are ways to work around it. I always have cattle on the move where they can grow while nourishing the land. They support my crops that I can both sell in town and eat to survive. I've been running my ranch for over 10 years, and no matter the weather, we find a way to come out on top. The man quizzed him, asking about his church attendance and how he intended to treat Louise. Richard wanted to express his desire for intelligent conversations with Louise, but found himself wavering. He didn't want to upset the man, and he didn't want to do anything to upset Louise. Leaning back in his seat, Mr. Moreau rubbed his forehead with two fingers as he stared at Richard. Louise had the same eyes, though they usually looked softer. You might be able to handle a ranch with your brother, Mr. Moreau articulated carefully, but how do you intend to support a wife when you can't even walk? You said so yourself, that the West is dangerous. Richard tried to rub his sweaty hands on his pants without the man noticing. I understand. He tried to think quickly. I know right now I don't look strong. Only a few weeks ago, I couldn't move my toes. But I'll be walking again soon. Like an old man or someone who can be a proper husband to my Louise? Walking like a man for Louise. I can do it, Mr. Moreau. You just have to give me an opportunity to prove myself. Now you're asking for things? His heart thumped in his chest. As Richard realized, he should have been more delicate in his phrasing. He thought fast and hard. No, I want a fair chance. If, if I can walk across the room without my crutches, will you agree that I can have Louise's hand in marriage? Mr. Moreau stared at him long and hard. I'll consider it. Richard decided that was the best answer he was probably going to get. Louise's parents had spent the evening testing him, and they would until he was gone. He knew he could merely turn away, but he found himself unable to do so. Richard wanted to prove his worth. Perhaps then, Louise would know he was worth something and he would know it for himself. If he could prove to the Moreau family that he was a good man, then maybe he would believe it himself. All right, Richard swallowed hard. He grabbed the arms of his chair and turned. His crutches scratched noisily against the floor. Wiping his forearm across his brow, he glanced over to the chaise. It wasn't far, only about three yards from his chair but as he pulled himself shakily onto his legs, Richard wasn't certain about the distance. He balled his hands into fists on his first step. 
There was no time for weakness, not before Mr. Moreau, and not before himself. Another deep breath before he managed to move his left foot. Already his legs were shaking, his knees were stiff, and his spine ached. That day, he'd spent a long time stretching and working at the clinic. He hadn't thought he'd have to spend more than a couple of minutes at a time using those crutches. And he had yet to walk on his own. Richard supposed any time was as good as then, especially if it was for Louise. He stared hard at the chaise and imagined her there. She had taught him just weeks ago that a chaise was a fancy bench. It was only a few steps. Sweat dripped down his brow and he wavered but picturing her there helped him find the energy to keep moving, keep walking. Three steps to go. Forcing himself not to reach out too soon, he managed the last couple of steps slowly and painfully before landing heavily onto the bench. Richard inhaled deeply as he wiped his brow. Ah. Picking up the crutches, Mr. Moreau strolled over. A man willing to try that hard must be worthy of my Louise. Richard's eyes widened as he met the older man's gaze of acceptance. A surge of relief flooded through him so strong that he had to suppress a smile. He accepted the crutches as Louise's father gave him a deliberate nod. Thank you, Richard responded. The man rubbed his hands to take a seat beside him. There are not many men who have attempted to attract Louise's attention. What makes you different, H.M.? Rubbing his neck, Richard glanced around as though there might be an answer hiding somewhere. Then he turned back to Louise's father. What do you mean? She is pretty, yes? Pretty and wise and fast on her feet. A good cook. But anyone who came to the door, she did not look at. For a minute, he thought about what Mr. Moreau must have had on his mind. Three daughters and no husbands. It must have weighed on the man. Even with his work and his beautiful home, a man had to care for his family. You're right. Richard thought through his words carefully. Rubbing his damp hands, he nodded and turned to the man he hoped would still be his father-in-law after this. Louise is pretty. She's clever and always eager to help. And she's smart, very smart. At the end of the day, after all our hard work, it's nice to sit down and just talk with Louise. She knows everything, sir. Mr. Moreau had a perfectly trim mustache that he stroked thoughtfully. My family is a good one. They are blessed, but books are not important for women. Isn't knowledge important? Richard forced a smile. When there was no answer, he expounded on several of the conversations he'd had with Louise. There was the weather and food and hope and joy. They had an entire world just waiting to be understood. Soon the conversation took one turn and then another. While Richard wasn't certain he had convinced the man to change his mind, Mr. Moreau made certain allowances as they discussed the changing world and the responsibilities of families. Take care of her. The man patted Richard's shoulder as they stood up. Of course, sir. The door was open for him and he slowly made his way out. Richard tried not to think about his shaking legs. His feet would hardly support him as he forced himself to head back down the hall, though he felt satisfied enough with the conversation, his body ached. All he wanted to do was sit down for the rest of the evening. Then he glanced up as they entered the parlor. The lighting was soft as the sun set outside the windows. It was a beautiful evening, a beautiful room, but all he saw was one beautiful woman. He forgot the exhaustion. She sat on a large seat beside her sister. There was a hopeful smile on her face as she talked. He could see a sparkle in her eyes, and the rest of the world was forgotten. He couldn't help it. The word spilled out, Louise, will you marry me?
Chapter 39 When her mother couldn't comprehend the joys of living the harder life out in the open skies, Louise was grateful when Lorelai changed the subject. Lorelai was being tutored in song and dance by a very polite Frenchman, but he had never tutored someone with dwarfism. The physical exercises were more limited, and the man was polite, but there were awkward situations that Lorelai helped her sister and mother to laugh about as they moved to the parlor. I wish I was there for that, Louise said, shaking her head with a chuckle. All her life, she had wanted to protect her little sister, but Lorelai proved herself over and over again to be lighthearted, cheerful, and humorous. Their mother scoffed. Pierre is a wonderful dancer, but you complicate the situation by one inch and he falls apart. Try a few feet, Lorelai muttered pointedly. Louise looked over at her sister and they started to giggle. The stress from earlier had faded, and she found herself caught up in the moment. She had forgotten how pleasant things were with Lorelai. Mrs. Moreau gaped at them. That isn't what I meant, she explained hurriedly. The girls raised their hands to chorus. We know. And they giggled some more. The conversation soon turned to other recent actions taken by the family for their new garden clubs and charities. Louise didn't care for the details so much, but was glad everyone was still doing well. She had put her nerves away about her father and Richard until she heard the familiar thud of the crutches. She hadn't even had a chance to look up when she heard Richard's voice. Louise, will you marry me? Jerking her head up, her lips parted as she tried to understand what was going on. Richard stood in the doorway with her father hovering nearby. Richard stared right into her soul. His back was straight, even as he used the crutches to keep standing. Dressed in his nicest clothes, she remembered his hesitance to come meet her parents. As she blinked, she registered what he had just said. Louise flew up to her feet as she turned to him. She could feel her heart pounding as a smile spread across her face. Yes, Richard. He leaned back as an ear-splitting grin spread across his cheeks. Louise wasn't certain if he had ever looked more handsome than in that very moment. Richard really meant it. He wanted her. Louise could feel herself shaking. All this time, she had worried for his health and wondered if he would ever want her. She had dearly wanted those afternoon strolls and quiet conversations to mean something. That kiss had meant the world to her. And now she had the proof that he felt the same. Though Louise wanted to find something more to say, she couldn't. She could feel her heart pounding in her chest. Everything felt so light and bright. Lorelai squealed beside her. It was enough to move Louise into action. She inhaled and ran to Richard. Somehow his grin widened, and he dropped a crutch to wrap an arm around her as she reached him. He held her tight, kissing her head, then her forehead. When she turned her face to him, both of them still smiling, he kissed her lips. He tasted salty and sweet all at once. You mean it? he asked her softly. I do. Do you mean it? His eyes met hers. With all my heart. Behind them, Lorelai squealed loudly again and clapped her hands. This is wonderful. It's about time. Lorelai, Louise rolled her eyes as she glanced back at her family. Richard didn't let go, and she didn't mind. Being in his arms felt so right that she didn't want to ever move. Scooting to his side, she put her shoulder under his armpit to help him stay standing and so that she could look at her family. There was a blush on her face. She could feel it warm on her cheeks. Every part of her body felt warm as well, hardly able to understand what was happening. Richard wanted her. 
He wanted to spend his life with her. He wanted them to have a life together. Her heart pounded in her chest as she tried to remember a time when she had felt so happy. When she passed a glance at her father as he stepped into the room, he gave her a nod. He wasn't right about everything, but he was giving her this, and with Richard, she could have all she ever wanted. This is wonderful. Mrs. Moreau took a deep breath. Why, there is so much to do. We must start planning the wedding immediately. Louise felt another flush spread across her face. Mother! Give them a moment, Lorelai chuckled, and then let her plan her wedding. What? Her mother scoffed. She's never planned a wedding before. How would she know what to do? Nonsense. No, she'll need her mother for this. Why, the wedding shall be here right in this very house. Her father will give her away. Lorelai, you'll be her bridesmaid. Luan will need to come home for this. She's been gone much too long. It would be best if we waited until spring, of course. Let's see, what else? No, Louise announced. It will be a winter wedding. Richard will need his brother and Mrs. Pennyworth. Luan will come with them. Winter? Lorelai cheered. That would be beautiful. That's only months away, their mother said before muttering something in French. Her mother always spoke French when she was concerned. She watched her father step closer, and the two of them conversed. Though she spoke French as well, Louise tuned them out as she turned back to Richard. He was still grinning at her. Is this all right? she asked hurriedly. We could have the wedding back at your ranch if you want. I could always bring my family there. I only meant that. Shaking his head, he kissed her nose. I don't care. As long as I marry you, then anything else can happen. Louise and Richard didn't stop holding each other until they had to pull apart for her to hug her family farewell. Everyone hugged Richard except for Mr. Moreau, who gave him a stern nod that seemed to say something that Louise didn't understand. But she didn't mind. Richard was happy, and she was happy. Looking out the window of the carriage, she sighed at the moonlight. Her heart was still thumping like horses galloping inside her chest. She swallowed and then glanced up at Richard. What is it? he asked before she could open her mouth. I feel like I'm going to wake up, she admitted slowly that in the morning, none of this happened. It feels too good to be true. I mean, I hoped, I prayed for this, but do you mean it, truly? His eyes searched hers before nodding. Yes. Her lips curved upward. Promise? Richard smiled before taking her hand. Louise, I knew before we came tonight that I would be asking your father to marry you. Though I meant to ask you differently, I couldn't wait. A chuckle escaped her lips. It was rather surprising, she admitted. I was afraid my parents would scare you off. They're not always very nice. That is, they mean well, but... Cattle are good, but they have horns, Richard shrugged. I can do whatever it takes when it comes to keeping you in my life. I... I've had a lot of time to consider that he added after a pause. She shifted upon hearing his serious tone. What do you mean? Licking his lips, Richard took her hand in both of his to run his thumbs over her palm. I mean, that after everything that happened to me, after everything that I've done, you're still here. I don't deserve you, and I hardly deserved your kindness, let alone your love. Another blush was flooding to her cheeks. Louise worried if she blushed too much that it would never leave her face. Oh, Richard, I mean it, he insisted. After the accident, after my anger and frustration, you were there. You came here with me. You've reminded me what it means to enjoy life and to love. I'm sorry for all those moments I didn't appreciate you. 
She shook her head. You don't need to worry about that. Not anymore, he corrected her. Pulling up her hand, he kissed her knuckles delicately. I'm going to spend the rest of our lives making up for it. Her breath caught. Louise could see the truth in his eyes. There Richard Hansen was, the wonderful man who had written her all of those playful and sweet letters. Speechless, she leaned over and kissed Richard. There were no words to explain the swelling within her chest. He still tasted sweet. There was something comforting and thrilling about the way he held her in his arms. It brought forth feelings she had never experienced. They rode off to the lodge and stood in the hallway between their rooms for several minutes to whisper sweet nothings to each other. It made her heart ache to part from Richard, but she retired for the night, knowing that soon they would never need to be parted. Epilogue The train whistled. Jacob didn't like the high-pitched, obnoxious noise. The only good thing about it was that the loud noise jerked Mrs. Pennyworth awake from her nap. His housekeeper jumped to her feet. Beside her, Luann primly stood and brushed her hair back over her shoulders. Though he wasn't entirely certain how she had accomplished this, Luann had slowly grown prettier as they neared Louisiana. We're here, she announced needlessly. I'm sure the carriage is waiting for us. Carriage? Mrs. Pennyworth opened her eyes wide as she followed Luann. He followed behind, reluctantly making his way out into the new town. The sun was still shining, and while not frozen over like home, there was a soft chill. Indeed, there was a carriage. A carriage with a coachman who led them through a crowded town into what looked like a small castle. It had beautiful gates and flowers and stones. Jacob had never seen anything like it. Though he could tell that the Moreau sisters had dressed prettily, he had merely assumed that was a fashion considered acceptable in the nearby territory. He hadn't supposed that it implied wealth. But over the next couple of hours, he found himself dizzy in the beautiful Moreau house. Luann gave them a tour as he was introduced to Mrs. Moreau. The father was still running errands with Richard, though the tailor was to stop by for his suit fitting. Jacob had supposed he would wear what he had brought, but apparently the Moreaus had another idea in mind. Just enjoy it, Mrs. Pennyworth told him before she trailed off to the kitchen. She was curious about their cooking and wanted to study their recipes. For her part, she didn't have any other responsibilities for the wedding. As for Jacob, he wasn't certain what else to do. Richard had requested him to be his best man. That role had been accepted, but there had been limited communication since, and even that letter had gone between Richard to Mrs. Pennyworth and back. He wasn't certain what he was more nervous about attending a fine wedding he did not know how to be a part of, or seeing Richard again. They had left things on a sour and uncomfortable note. Jacob could still feel the tension in his shoulders and shifted uneasily. He didn't belong there, and he wasn't certain he belonged near his brother. Perhaps, Jacob wondered, he didn't belong anywhere. Oh, you know you're happy to see me. He turned to hear Louise just down the hall. He heard her giggle as she grabbed Luann in a tight hug. The older girl grunted, but wrapped her arms around as well. It's not a complete sister's hug without me, another cheerful voice laughed from the parlor. Jacob watched a short girl, too far off to see too well, with beautiful long hair hurry into the hug. There was laughter in the reunion and he hurriedly turned away so he wouldn't interrupt. With nowhere else to turn, he grudgingly trailed off to his room, a guest bedroom with sweet-scented candles and fresh flowers beside a basin of water. Jacob sat down on the edge of the bed. 
this was not his home. He could see in the eyes of Mrs. Moreau that he didn't belong. Luann had hardly given him a glance upon her return, and Louise hadn't noticed him. He drummed his fingers on his knees and considered leaving. Richard wouldn't notice, let alone care. There was a knock at his door. He jerked around. After a moment of hesitation, he climbed to his feet and went to the door. It was probably someone telling him he was in the wrong room. Louise smiled hopefully at him when he peeked his head out. What is it? He asked her cautiously. It's good to see you again, Jacob, she offered kindly. There was a light in her eyes and a softness to her lips. She twirled her skirts as she asked. Do you have a minute? Richard is in the study and he would like to talk to you. He hesitated. Now? She nodded. The wedding is first thing in the morning and he said that he wished to work out some final details with you. I can take you to him, Louise added when he didn't say anything. For a minute, he considered not going. He'd had nearly a year to plan on what he would say to his brother when they saw each other again. But now, he wasn't so certain. A lump formed in his throat as he grudgingly stepped out of the room. Wonderful, Louise allowed. She gestured down the hall and led the way. We're glad you could make it, Jacob. I know that our relationship has been complicated but I look forward to getting to know you better and supporting the ranch. We'll be taking the train back with you next week, so long as the weather is good. Thank you for coming out for the wedding. It really does mean a lot. To myself and to Richard, this year has been complicated to say the least, and we're glad that it shall end on a hopeful note. Have you met all of my family yet? He shrugged when she finally quieted for a minute. No, I suppose not. As she talked, Jacob glanced at her again. She was practically another person. It had been a long year without Richard's help, but the ranch had continued to thrive. Luann grew quieter and more cheerful as she made friends with folks in town. Mrs. Pennyworth had stayed the way she always was. Jacob wondered if he looked any different. Here we are, Louise announced before he was ready. The study had a calming, quieting feel to it as Jacob stepped in. He looked around curiously as Louise stayed back. Though the door remained open, she was forgotten as his eyes fell upon his brother. Richard had looked grumpy, thin, and weary when they parted. But now there was something about him that made Jacob stop short. His brother looked up from the papers on the desk. It looked like he was about to smile, but he didn't. Jacob felt his heart hammer in his chest. Hello, he managed as his throat grew dry. Putting his hands in his pockets so Richard wouldn't notice them sweating, he tried to breathe. It's been a while. Leaning back, his older brother nodded. A year, Jacob. You're looking tired. He started to scoff, but forced himself to stop. Then he nodded. I suppose. Had to run the ranch on my own after all. I know. Richard drummed his hands on top of the desk for a minute. I'm sorry about that. Thank you for taking on that responsibility. Jacob jerked his head back up to meet his brother's gaze. There was an apology and gratitude all at the same time. He hesitated, wondering if this was a trick. I mean it. Richard said sternly. I do. Swallowing, Jacob slowly nodded. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's the least I could do. I just wanted to make sure I really did apologize for all that I said before. Richard cut him off. You did. I just didn't accept it. So I wanted to let you know I have since accepted it and I'm grateful. There's been a lot of time on my hands to think about, well, everything like our parents. They meant well, I think, but everything doesn't belong to me. Richard scooted a piece of paper across the desk. That ranch is as much yours as it is mine. Maybe more so right now, 
but we can worry about that later. For now, I want to sign over half of it to you. Then it would be yours by right. Jacob met his brother's gaze in disbelief, but his older brother wasn't done talking. I forgive you, Jacob, and I'm sorry for everything. Slowly stepping forward, Jacob took a glance at the paper on the desk. His eyes skimmed the words as he saw his name, his brother's name, and details about the ranch. You mean this? he asked. But already the relief was spreading through his shoulders. It ran down to his fingertips and down his thighs to his toes. Looking up, he noticed the pen that Richard held up. I do, Richard nodded. Then he put his hands on the table and carefully leveraged himself up. Jacob took a step back. They hadn't discussed his health, and Richard had only written in his letters that things were moving along. Only in that first letter had it been stated that Richard would need a year to heal. It hadn't been a full year yet, but that didn't stop Richard from inhaling sharply as he slowly and purposefully walked around the desk to offer Jacob his hand. The last time they had seen each other, Richard hadn't felt anything beyond his hips and couldn't move a toe. Now he was walking. Jacob stared in amazement as he slowly managed to put out a hand of his own. They shook on it. From the doorframe, there was a squeal and clapping. It's a Christmas miracle, Louise announced. She clasped her hands below her chin and beamed at them. The pretty young lady had a point. After that, Jacob found himself caught up in a whirlwind of activity. There were final wedding preparations to finish and a suit to be properly outfitted. The wedding was the next day on Christmas Eve, but Mrs. Moreau assured him that it would be finished by then. He found himself following Louise or Richard around without knowing what else to do. Louise knew the house inside and out, helping everyone along as they went. Her eyes only grew brighter, and her smile grew wider as they went around. Though Richard was still using his crutches, there were a few occasions where he found the strength to take a few steps unassisted. The support helped, he explained and he wanted to save his energy to enjoy a first dance with his wife. Pretty faces flew in and out with laughter and joy. Luann disappeared on several errands. Jacob was told of another sister, Lorelei, but only caught flashes of a short girl with pretty hair who had plenty to do on her own. And before he knew it, Jacob was in the courtyard of the Moreau estate wearing a flower pinned to his new brown suit. His brother stood before him as they watched Louise all dressed up walk down the aisle with her father. Jacob had never attended a wedding before, he realized, and could tell why. It required a lot of effort for just a couple of minutes, but seeing how happy it made Richard and Louise, he supposed it was worthwhile enough for them. He smiled as well, relieved with how everything had come together. The resentment that he'd built up towards Richard for so many years had faded away to leave hope for the future. It was a sunny day, and there was so much potential before them, especially for Louise and Richard. As much as he didn't want to, he listened to them talk about everything and nothing during the wedding. The two of them were so in love that it was almost annoying but he decided to give them a couple of days before telling them to behave themselves. His eyes roamed the hall where everyone gathered to enjoy the wedding festivities after the ceremony. He didn't know anyone but a few faces. After picking up some strange food, Jacob grudgingly went to stand by Luann. She glanced up as she clapped to one of the dances. Oh, you again. Me again, he agreed before glancing around the room. I guess this is it then, isn't it? Luann flipped her hair over her shoulder and flashed him her charming smile. It is. I'll never have to see you again. Strange, isn't it? 
Louise already talked about us coming out to visit someday, but I might have had my fill of the West. Lorelei, on the other hand, couldn't be happier. The other sister, he asked for clarification. The young woman nodded before gesturing out to the dance floor. The graceful one. For her size, anyway. Oh, dear. Mr. Turner tripped again. Well, I know I won't be dancing with him tonight. She paused and glanced at him. You can't dance, can you? Jacob grinned at her, relieved that not everything would change. No, and I'm not going to ask you to dance. She gave him a smile in return. Good. She stuck her nose in the air teasingly. I wouldn't accept if you had. Don't forget to try the chocolate while you're here. Mother had it specially imported. I, on the other hand, have duties to attend to. Farewell, Jacob. And then she was gone. Jacob watched her disappear into the crowd before glancing around the room again. He was a stranger in a strange place, but slowly the apprehension faded as he found himself enjoying the music. Though he decided against dancing, Jacob cheered on Richard and Louise when they danced once more for the evening and found himself enjoying his short stay in Gramercy, Louisiana. As for his return home with his brother, his brother's bride, and Mrs. Pennyworth, Jacob decided not to worry. They still had a few days. Something told him that everything would turn out all right no matter what happened. Read or listen the next story now. Save more with our bundles. Scan the QR code or click on the link in the description to read the next book in the series. Share this video with your friend or watch on of the following videos. Subscribe to our channel, like this video and hit the notification bell to not miss any new audiobooks. Thank you for watching.